Cindy McCoop. I'm going to be on a city council. We are live from River Valley Room. Yes, good morning. George Slipple here. Can you hear me? They didn't help you answer. No. I don't want to close this to read that, but go. Sorry, is I is IT here to help? Good morning and welcome to the October 31st, 2023 Urban Planning Committee meeting. I'm delighted to be gathering with you all today. I'll do a quick roll call. I'll do a land acknowledgement first, actually. Um, so we're located in Treaty 6 territory. From time immemorial, diverse Indigenous nations have stewarded these lands, including the Nehiwak, Nehiwiniwak, Nakota Iska, Denis Salina, and Nititsapi. Many more First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples have gathered, traded, and celebrated on this land for generations. This place also forms part of the Métis homeland and it is in Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. The signing of Treaty 6 in 1886-87 created a foundation of good relations, welcoming peoples to this area from around the world. Today, Edmonton carries on this tradition of welcoming peoples from many nations as we continue to live into the spirit and intent of treaty. I'll go now to a roll call of my committee colleagues. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Mayor Sohi. Good morning. And Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Uh, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? I'm happy to move to adopt the agenda for today, October 31st, Urban Planning Committee meeting. Thank you. Please vote. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford and Cartmel. Carmel? Yes. And just waiting on one vote. I'm a yes. Okay. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Uh, and I was also remiss uh, in not acknowledging some colleagues online. We are joined by Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Good morning. And that's everyone. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go to approval of the minutes. I'm happy to move that we approve the minutes from October 11th, 2023 Urban Planning Committee. Thank you. Please vote.
I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. I'm a yes as well. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Should they're not, yeah, yeah, I'm noticing that the mayor's vote isn't being counted. I think it should be five. We just logged them in. We do have five for this last one. Okay, perfect. Great. We'll select some items for debate now. Colleagues, if you want to click in. Councillor Tang. Sure, I will select um, 7.3 and 7.4, and I'll leave the others. Thank you, and I will select 7.1 and 7.2. So that is all of our business. Okay. Uh, request to speak, Councillor Tang. Great. <clears throat> I move that Urban Planning Committee hear from the following speakers and panels when appropriate. For both 7.1 and 7.2, which are cross-referenced, um, we have Raka jo uh, Josen in person, Anand Pai from NAOP uh, in person, George Schlusso remote, Chris Fillmore from Phil Phipps McKinnon Project in person, Kaylin Anderson UDI in person, Mike Saunders, Henry Egger, Tim Freeman, Alice Hershu, Haritsu, sorry, <laughs> Downtown Recovery Coalition, I think in person. Uh, Mike Sasha in person. Annette Trimby from McEwen University in person. Adam Shamchak to answer questions only in person. Jerry Campbell in person. Pranita McBrien, uh, DBA in person. Uh, and Ken Tace in person. Thank you. Please vote from hearing from these speakers. I'm um, yes, but I'm not getting the, uh, the the vote here. Thank you, Mayor. So we will look into that. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Thank you. Um, we don't have any time specifics on the agenda, which puts us into our first items, uh, seven one and seven two. So we'll start with a presentation from administration and then move to our public speakers. Thank you. Great. Good morning. I am Alyssa LaLiberty, Branch Manager for Economic Investment Services. I'm here with Travis Pollock, Acting Branch Manager of Development Services, Crystal Kajenner, Director of Affordable Housing and Homelessness, and Brett Latchford, Director of Strategy and Emerging Economy. We've cross-referenced the Office Tower Conversion Report and the Downtown Revitalization Levy Financial Incentive Funding Program Report to provide one presentation which covers both. Investing in Edmonton's downtown is essential for Edmonton's economy. Inclusive core areas that are vibrant and livable contribute to the economic resilience of a city. Edmonton has diverse offerings downtown such as museums, galleries, post-secondary institutes, retail, tourist and food services, entertainment, and so much more. Residential growth in our downtown has the potential to unlock economic benefits for a variety of these businesses and organizations that are key to our downtown's vibrancy. Businesses located downtown recovered from the pandemic much more quickly in cities where there was a healthy amount of residential population downtown versus cities that predominantly had cores made up of office towers. Through the development of these reports, administration approached industry leaders to gather advice on incentives to stimulate residential growth downtown. We spoke with representatives from eight industry organizations, 17 companies involved in development, finance and real estate, and we spoke to post-secondary schools. We spoke to the City of Calgary about their office conversion program. We also participated in a tour of converted offices in Edmonton, hosted by several local developers. We would like to thank all of those involved for their valuable time, insights, optimism, and commitment to creating a vibrant downtown. Some common themes emerged from our engagement. Construction costs have increased. We heard that projects that were viable four years ago may not be viable today, and there are several reasons for this. Rising interest rates have made borrowing more expensive. Compared to elsewhere in the city, downtown sites are often more complex and challenging. Land values are higher. 
We heard that there is no current demand for hotel space and that the condo market downtown is expected to remain challenging for at least five more years. This graph shows how over the past five years, construction costs shown in blue have increased by nearly 30% while rents in red have only increased by a few percent yet. We have heard that vacancy rates for rentals have declined in the past nine months. We heard from developers that residential rental rates have not increased significantly in downtown Edmonton, particularly compared to other cities, but that rent is generally on the rise. We also learned that the average one bedroom in Edmonton rents for about $450 less than similar units in Calgary, although construction costs are about the same in each city. We heard that working from home may encourage people to live further away from the core, making downtown less attractive to renters. And finally, that safety concerns and a perceived lack of amenities may contribute to lower rents downtown. Slide. Next slide, please. So downtown projections. So what does the future look like? Administration collected data from city development permits and CMHC research to produce this graph. Average rents in downtown Edmonton have grown slowly at an average rate of 1.2% per year from 2014 to 2022. However, CMHC forecasts rental vacancy citywide will fall below 1.5% over the next two years and that average rents could rise by as much as 23% by 2025. There are currently 1,138 residential units under construction downtown, all of which have been receiving the 2021 Edmonton Economic Recovery Construction Grant. This has been a higher than average amount of residential construction over the past 10 years. Based on how long it takes to develop a residential building downtown, we expect that there will be a lull in development activity once these units are completed. That's not out of the ordinary. Downtown residential development is cyclical. Note that all the projects under construction today are intended as purpose-built rentals. That's the residential story. Now we'll look at office space. Slide, please. Edmonton's office vacancy rate is between 21 and 24 percent and has been elevated since 2016. A balanced or healthy market has a vacancy rate of 5 to 10 percent. There is approximately 3.7 million square feet of vacant office space in downtown Edmonton. The market would need to absorb or remove 1.8 million to 2.3 million square feet of office space to achieve that balanced or healthy market. As shown in the chart, the assessment of older downtown office buildings has fallen by 3 billion, or roughly half of their value from the peak in 2014. This has been offset in part by 900 million in new construction, like Edmonton Tower, but there has been nonetheless been a significant drop. The city should be prepared for office assessments to potentially decrease even further. Working from home and hybrid work seems to be reducing the need for office space. If this trend continues, as leases expire, we may see businesses reducing the amount of space they require downtown. There has also been a flight to quality. Buildings are classified based on their building condition of location and desirability. As lease rates have come down, tenants in Class B or Class C buildings have relocated to Class A buildings, leaving vacant space behind. Slide, please. Office conversions. Edmonton has converted, Edmonton already has many converted buildings. Since the late 1990s, 21 commercial buildings have been converted. Of these, one was converted to a hotel. The rest were converted to residential, providing about 1,700 units. Of those, seven conversions, seven conversions were supported by a city-funded incentive program that offered $4,500 per new residential unit. Of note, four conversions have taken place since 2017, with one currently under construction. There is also a current development permit application for another partial conversion. Conversions offer other benefits when compared to new construction because they reuse an existing structure of the building, which is more sustainable from an environmental perspective. They can often be delivered more quickly than new construction. However, typically rents in converted buildings are less expensive than new construction. This is not guaranteed, it's very project specific. On the other hand, the property tax uplift from conversions is significantly less than a new building. Slide, please. Tax implications for office conversions. Administration has looked at historical assessment and taxation for converted buildings, as well as several hypothetical conversions of office buildings. On an individual building level, the building assessment increases significantly, but the switch from commercial to residential tax rates results in only a modest increase in municipal taxes give or take $1,000 per unit created. The displayed example is based on a hypothetical, hypothetical conversion of a representative building. Even assuming the building value falls 35% from today, the tax lift is 
less than tax uplift is less than 100,000 per year. Slide, please. Non-residential tax distribution. We have heard concerns that further de decreases in the valuation of downtown properties will result in a reduced tax revenue for the city of Edmonton. This is not true. The total amount of property tax collected is established at budget. The assessments of individual properties affect the distribution of the amount between different property owners. So if downtown office valuations fall further, further, there is no loss in property tax revenue. Rather, the effect would be an increase on property taxes for commercial properties outside of the downtown office market. In Calgary, when their downtown valuations started to fall, this effect was a major cause for concern. Edmonton's market today is meaningfully different than Calgary's market was in 2015 and 2016. Downtown offices represented 32% of Calgary's non-residential tax base. In Edmonton, downtown offices represent less than 10%. So we can provide some high-level numbers for what the effect on commercial property owners would be. For every 10% that downtown offices decrease in value, you'd see tax bills outside of the downtown office market go up by a little under 1%. This, however, is a simplified model that assumes no other changes across inventory groups. In theory, removing vacant office space can bolster the assessment of those B and C class properties that remain offices. However, the amount of office space that would need to be removed in order to have a notable effect would be substantial, and the impacts would take time to be reflected in the property assessment values. This would not result in additional revenue for the city. It would only affect the distribution of taxes among commercial properties. Slide, please office space in Calgary and Edmonton. The City of Calgary is offering an incentive program, which is currently paused, to encourage conversion of office space into residential and other uses. In 2021, Calgary's downtown was in dire circumstances. They found themselves with a comparatively huge surplus of office space built by the market as a result of a boom. And when the boom ended, the Calgary market had a 34% vacancy rate and 14 million square feet of empty office space. This amount of empty office space is close to the total office space in downtown Edmonton, as visualized on the right-hand side of this slide. The assessed value of offices in Calgary's downtown area had decreased by $16 billion, resulting in sharp increases in property taxes for commercial properties outside their downtown. In their own words, they needed to stop the bleeding or their downtown would be devastated. Calgary created a long-term downtown plan that would make it more resilient in the future. They hope to achieve this by diversifying the downtown to include more residential buildings and more amenities. And they also established a goal to remove 6 million square feet of office space. The business case for Calgary was less about return on investment and more about the acknowledgement that their downtown was failing. This was a way to leverage private capital to help tackle the issue. Calgary's program does not consider incentivizing new residential buildings. They are also not mandating affordable units or a certain number of bedrooms. They have elected to let the market be responsive to providing what is desired. Because they have a strong rubric for what they want out of office conversions, decisions are primarily made by administration, and only applications requiring more than 15 million, more than the 15 million incentive cap are taken back to City Council. Just a note on Calgary's pause. They've recently paused their program, and it is understood that during this pause, they are reviewing some of the program criteria. Uh, slide, please. Calgary's downtown incentive. So Calgary's program offered, at the time, before the pause, $75 per square foot for office to residential, $60 per square foot for hotels, $50 per square foot for post-secondaries or performing arts space. They even offered $15 per square foot for office demolition. In total, $100 million is expected to be spent on office conversions and another $10 million on the staffing of the administration of Calgary's downtown plan. Calgary landed on an amount of $75 per square foot after engaging with, real with a real estate committee created by the Calgary Economic Development Corp. They chose this number because it was, at the time, half of the $150 per square foot construction costs for office conversions. Construction costs have increased since this number was chosen. The grant is paid upon completion and there are milestones that must be met. Applications are judged by how well they match the criteria set out in the program guide. The downtown team vets the projects, assesses the applicant's ability to be successful and to, manage, and to help manage the development and improve the applications. Slide 10, please. Calgary's downtown incentives results so far. Calgary initially identified 30 buildings that would be suitable for office conversion. They have announced funding agreements with 10 buildings amounting to 1.15 million square feet that will be converted into approximately 1,237 new residential units. 
That's about 2.5% of their total downtown office in inventory. Calgary is investing 86 million in these 10, build in 10 buildings, which is joined by an estimated 189 million in private investment. Two buildings in Calgary are also receiving funding separate from this program for an additional 200,000 square feet. Conversions take time, so most of these have not yet been completed. As mentioned, Calgary recently announced that it's paused accepting new applications, as approved conversions and additional conversions currently under review have exceeded their funding threshold. Uh, I'll now pass it to Crystal to talk about mixed market housing. Good morning. <clears throat> Incentivizing mixed market housing refers to projects that include both market housing and affordable housing. Affordable housing consists of a spectrum from near market housing to supportive housing. The City of Edmonton currently offers the Affordable Housing Incentive Program, or AHIP, to incent the development of affordable housing units. AHIP covers up to 25% of the capital cost of affordable units, which works out to an average of 61,000 per door for new builds. The rent must be capped at 80% of average market rates, and at least 25% of new units in the building must be affordable. And this must be maintained for a minimum of 25 years. It has created, since its inception, it has created 1,106 affordable units in 16 projects across the city. To provide consistency and to help address the need for affordable housing in Edmonton, it's recommended that any downtown specific mixed market incentive program should use the same affordability and threshold criteria as the AHIP program. Most people we spoke to indicated that the higher construction costs downtown mean that the AHIP incentive is not attractive to most developers in the downtown context. Simply, incenting 25% of capital costs isn't enough. Couple, coupled with the fact that developers do not see the market component of the mixed market development as viable in the current economic context, this makes incentives for mixed market housing downtown very challenging. <clears throat> that being said, that view is not shared by all, and we do have a report at exec committee tomorrow recommending funding through an AHIP grant for Williams Hall, which is located downtown. That project, if approved, will provide 90 new units of affordable housing. Several options are available that could make the AHIP program more successful in the downtown context. Any of these options would require changes to the existing AHIP program and would require significant additional funding or would change expected units developed through the available existing funds. Council could establish a dedicated fund for AHIP applicants located in the downtown area using existing program eligibility criteria. However, this is unlikely to be sufficient incentive in many cases. Council could increase the percentage of construction costs of affordable units that is covered by the grant program, or council could establish a grant program that incentivizes the market component of the mixed market development that could be stacked on top of the AHIP grants. If the goal is to create the greatest number of affordable units in the city, please note that these options provide fewer affordable units per dollar when spent downtown than in other areas of the city. If changes are contemplated to AHIP for this purpose, administration recommends further consideration and a fulsome analysis of impacts, mitigating actions, and funding required before a final decision is made. Mixed market incentives for downtown Edmonton. Should council wish to create an incentive for mixed market or even just market housing, an amount would need to be determined. In our interviews with stakeholders, many developers told us that $75 per square foot would be a meaningful incentive. However, it has recently been reported and administration has been advised by some stakeholders that $100 per square foot is an amount that would overcome the current challenges of increased construction costs and relatively stagnant rental rates. At $100 per square foot, 1,000 units would cost $84 million. That would be the equivalent of five 200 unit buildings or a 10% increase in the number of units downtown. Incentive dollars have an opportunity cost and future tax revenue isn't used to pay back an investment. It's intended to provide services to the people who live in these new developments. Slide please. The CRL is a funding source. Are we on the right slide? Thank you. Uh, the downtown CRL plan includes a downtown incentive program as a catalyst project, which allows CRL funding to be used. The description of the downtown incentive program in the plan is open-ended, stating that the incentive could be tailored to the market need or council priorities at any given time. Administration has some concerns about using the CRL as a funding source for the following reasons. Any large incentive, and we've seen it probably needs to be large, would deplete the CRL's ability to fund any of the other catalyst projects, those that spur development and improve vibrancy for the long term. Incentive payments would be operating expenses, which cannot be funded by borrowing. 
It would therefore result in a deeper CRL reserve deficit, which would ultimately delay the CRL's repayment. There are limited sites within the CRL's boundary that would be eligible for conversion to residential. In the medium revenue scenario provided in March 20 of 2023, administration projected that there will be sufficient revenue over 20 years of the CRL to cover the cost of all currently funded projects, but not enough to fund all the eligible catalyst projects listed in the CRL plan, including the downtown incentive program. Slide, please. Cat so as a catalyst approach, stakeholders were clear that the city's continued efforts to increase safety vibrancy and, high, and provide high quality amenities are critical to the long-term success of downtown. Council's direction currently uses CRL funds to invest in catalyst projects and downtown vibrancy. Since the Capital City Downtown CRL began in 2015, the City of Edmonton has invested or committed to more than 30 major projects and initiatives in the downtown area, including funds leveraged from partner funding organizations. The commitment amounts to 1.4 billion in capital projects, incentive grants, vibrancy and events. Of this amount, 351 million is partner funding. High quality amenities that offer a distinctive urban lifestyle, coupled with administration's continued efforts to improve safety and security will attract people to live downtown. Stronger demand for living downtown will ultimately make building apartments more attractive to investors. Warehouse Park is an example of this. One residential development is already under construction immediately adjacent to the park. As such, the Catalyst projects are their own incentive program that will have an enduring and long-term impact. Next slide, please. Ultimately, the cost of developing housing has increased significantly. Across the city, housing starts have slowed. At the same time, we are seeing record-breaking rates of population growth. This is a national challenge. A financial incentive could encourage residential development downtown, convert empty office space to more productive units, or increase the supply of affordable housing. All of these outcomes would help build a thriving downtown and build our economy. Administration stands ready to work with other orders of government on any program or incentive that increases housing stock and affordability or improves downtown vibrancy. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'll now have you step back uh, and we're going to hear from our uh, speakers in two panels just to manage the space that we have in the room. Oh, and, uh, and we just have an additional speaker that we will move to add to our list of speakers. Councillor Tang? Sure, yeah, I'll move that we hear from Bradley LaFortune from Public Interest Alberta. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Just waiting on one vote. Thank you for the reminder, yes. We have all the votes. Uh, please display the vote. And that's carried. So I'll call up our first eight speakers. Um, uh, when I call your name, you can come and take a seat at the front here. So start with Raka, uh, Rocky Josen, uh, Anan Pai, George uh, Schussel. I think you're joining us remotely. Are you there? George, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can Thank you, you. Great, thanks. Uh, Chris Fillmore, Kaylin Anderson, Mike Saunders, Henry Edgar, and Tim Friedman. Um, so I see some familiar faces, but also some new faces. So I'll just do a quick um, review of the public speaking process. So we're hearing from you in panels today. You'll have five minutes to present. Uh, the lights that are available there, green will be for the first four minutes, yellow will be for the fifth minute, and red will be when your time is up. Recognizing that we have quite a few speakers, I'll be uh, pretty strict on that timing. Um, please don't go anywhere after you've presented. Once we've heard from your full panel, uh, members of council will have an opportunity to ask questions of you, so please, please stick around of, uh, from that. Um, uh, for those participating virtually, please just remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking and refrain from using the raise hand function. If you're having any technical issues, you can reach out to uh, city.clerk at edmonton.ca. Um, for those in person in event of emergency, uh, just follow the clerk's direction to evacuate. 
And with that, I will go to our uh, first speaker, uh, Mr. Josen. Oh, and apologies. Councillor Stevenson, we're just sorting through a technical uh, error. Can we maybe start with speaker number two and come back number one? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, Mr. Pai, over to you. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, uh, members of Urban Planning Committee and City Council. My name is Anand Pai. I'm the CEO of NAOP Edmonton. We're a commercial real estate development association. With the third highest vacancy in Canada, what we heard there uh, was that we have office occupancy that's unlikely to fully recover. And the assessed value of downtown office buildings, existing buildings, have lost three billion in assessed value, or approximately half of their total value. Now, uh, administration said that it may not seem like very much, but at 0.8% uh, per 10% decrease, we've lost half of our assessed value of existing buildings downtown. So 4% shift of taxes. Uh, to, to other residents, and it'll continue to lead to a tax shift uh, with residents paying more than the average tax increase this year. I think we have to agree on the fact that this is a problem. We heard from administration there that Calgary's program uh, was a recognition that their downtown was dying, that it wasn't just about uh, a tax uplift or just about having residents come back, but that it was about an overall rethinking of how downtowns uh, can thrive in, in a post-COVID era. The presence of people makes a place desirable, and people are attracted to places that are already doing well. But that's a catch-22, and so we feel that, that we need a really big intervention here. So if you agree that losing half of the assessed value of our downtown offices is a major problem, uh, and I, I believe uh, personally that this is one of the defining problems of this council's time, uh, then we have to get to work on a solution. What NAOP's been doing over the, last, uh, over the last year here is conducting financial, macroeconomic modeling, working with developers, lenders, uh, who are specialized both inside and outside of downtown. We also interviewed folks in Calgary and beyond, and, and this is the overview of what, what we've kind of heard. First off, we feel that we need a very ambitious goal, and the council needs to agree on, on a, a goal that's focused and, and ambitious so that we can promote this to other levels of government. For, for us, we would focus on increasing the residential population. We feel we could increase the residential population by a further 10% and stop the decline in downtown assessments in the next four to five years. This would re represent a systemic shift in the way that downtown is perceived. We need a plan for how to get there. I think administration's uh, report outlines well that a per square foot residential incentive for office conversion uh, and uh, is a preferred alternative for a lot of the development industry. Uh, and we would add that new construction be added to that and in an agnostic way so that those, are, those two types of development are on a level playing field. And then, we need a, and then we need an overall budget. Through our consultations and jurisdictional review, we believe that, this, uh, that increasing the downtown residential population would take a $100 million investment. If incented at $100 a square foot, that would lead to one million square feet of new residential created in downtown uh, at about 750 square feet a person. But it won't cost the city of Edmonton $100 million. Not if we're bold and smart about what we're asking for from the provincial and federal government. Now I've been in consultations, uh, preliminary consultations with, uh, with some of these folks and just wanted to outline some of the opportunities that we have here. We see that Calgary was able to achieve a $300 million uh, investment from the provincial government, essentially for their downtown arena. But this was in the form of infrastructure grants, with the Premier saying at the time that she was open to specific downtown infrastructure funding requests from the City of Edmonton. Right now, we fund those uh, kinds of off-site infrastructure through our CRL, and it puts us at a disadvantage as we ask for the province, but I believe that we could ask more directly for CRL top-ups. What we're hearing is that we can't afford to do what the CRL had originally intended to do with these incentives. The federal government's also explicitly dedicated $300 million to office conversions through their 2021 federal budget. And then there's the federal housing accelerator of twenty dollars to $35,000 per new unit created over the next three years to help alleviate the housing crisis. From that fund, Hamilton got $9.93 million. Uh, in the last month, London got 74 million, Brampton got 114 million. They gave that money uh, to their municipal bureaucracies to essentially help uh, largely spent on fixing their zoning bylaws. 
I would say that we are miles ahead on doing the actual work, but miles behind on creating a bold and compelling vision of what's next and getting buy-in from our partners. Uh, so we've got a pretty clear idea of, of how this could work, uh, and I feel that this council, council cannot afford to be complacent or divided on a vision here. Edmonton needs a clear council-supported plan to start lobbying hard for and take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. Are we ready to go to our first speaker? Excellent. I'll turn, turn it over to you. I'm just waiting. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Raka Jolson. I'm the president of Jolson Properties, family-owned and Edmonton-based developer. I'm um, here to talk to you about why the city of Edmonton should offer a per square foot conversion incentive. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the first reason is that this incentive aligns perfectly with City of Edmonton's stated objectives. Um, the oft-repeated objective of promoting vibrancy in our downtown is well attained by this conversion incentive. Um, in order to bring vibrancy back to downtown, we essentially need people living in, working in, and visiting downtown. This incentive is going to put boots on the ground in downtown, people playing, eating, drinking, working, and living in downtown. So it... Um, aligns with uh, this objective quite well. Next slide, please. Uh, so how many uh, people are we talking in terms of residents? So um, through some third-party research, we've seen that the average conversion candidate in the downtown core in Edmonton is between about 100,000 and 200,000 square feet. So if we take an average of 150,000 square foot building, um, that's going to bring approximately 207 residents to the downtown core. We're talking about permanent residents that are, uh, again, living, working, playing in downtown. Um, I've highlighted, we, we ran three scenarios there, so $50, $75, and $100 square foot incentives. And I've highlighted the middle one there just because, um, you know, as um, my colleagues have already stated, that's, we, we know that model works. Our neighbors to the south have used $75 a square foot to convert 10 buildings already, and uh, from what I know, they've, they have about 13 or 14 additional applications. Um, that's going to put a, a budget constraint of about $100 million or just over $100 million on the City of Edmonton budget, um, which is about 3% of the 2026 budget. But it will bring 2,000 residents into the downtown core. So I'll talk about how that uh, $100 million on the next slide, please. How we're going to offset that um, in the city of Edmonton. The council report did allude to um, assessment values for office buildings increasing as office buildings filled up um, from vacancy in these conversions. But they didn't really talk about um, how comparable properties also um, factor into property tax assessments. So um, this, this incentive is going to increase property tax values for the whole downtown core, and that'll put less stress on other commercial and residential property tax assessments. Um, the added occupancy will also increase traffic to retailers. So we're talking about shops, restaurants, um, you know, cafes, bars. That again is gonna increase the property tax base as those businesses uh, increase in revenues and profitability. And lastly, um, you know, the added occupancy and vibrancy to downtown that these additional residents are gonna bring is gonna encourage further conversions and further new developments. Next slide, please. Um, some ancillary benefits that, that aren't really talked about a whole lot, um, affordability, uh, it's, a, it's another key goal of the city of Edmonton. The increased supply, this is just a supply and demand equation, increased supply in the downtown core will increase affordability. Um, safety and security, additional boots on the ground again, that's where we kind of lost the safety and security of downtown as we know during the COVID years. Having additional residents in the downtown core will help us alleviate that issue. And lastly, the urban, uh, urban sprawl that we've experienced in Edmonton over the last few decades, um, we need to build up and not out, and that's going to provide some relief, again, to the city budget. Next slide, please. So can, can conversions happen without a grant from the city of Edmonton? Um, my belief is no, they won't. Uh, if, we, if the city of Edmonton doesn't come to the table uh, with at least a $50 per square foot grant, uh, I don't think any buildings in, a, in the downtown court will get converted. And again, that's uh, repeating some of the items stated by the city staff. It, it's due to the increased construction costs, higher interest rates, and the unavailability of funding from banks 
um, to finance these buildings, even if they're stated for office to multifamily conversions. Um, my last point there is um, just that we need a per square foot grant, not a property tax abatement or a lift abatement, as has been talked about a little bit by City Council. That just won't move the needle for, for developers. And last slide, please. So uh, not to rehash all of that, but just at the bottom there, I just want to reiterate that I, I sincerely believe as a developer that we will not be able to convert any buildings in the downtown core um, without a per square foot grant from the City of Edmonton. Thank you for uh, the time. Great. Thank you. Thanks for being here this morning. We'll go next online uh, to George Schlussel. George, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good morning, to Urban Planning Committee and uh, Council. Thank you very much for this time. Uh, I'll start. Uh, I'm the owner of Procura Real Estate Services. We've been involved in the city of Edmonton for 45 years. So I've seen all the up, many of the ups and downs through the through the decades. We were one of the first to do a major, uh, and I won't go through all the statistics because I think we all will agree with this 3.5 million or 3.9 million feet of saleable space and so forth. But I'm going to go back. We did one of the very first conversions of an office building in downtown Edmonton with Park Square. That was done in the year 2000 to 2001 where we took a, an empty office building. But I wanna make a point that when we bought that building, we bought that building for $11 a square foot and our total development costs were about $65,000 a suite. And uh, we had the built leased up and, and we had it sold to a pension fund on completion. And um, in 2015, uh, we were published by an article by Bill Ma in the journal I believe at the time. And we projected if the city doesn't carry on with it, with a, a repurposing program, older buildings to residential, that that we're forecasting Edmonton's going to have a vacancy of two and a half million square feet, and that's exactly where we are today because the city did not carry on with a program of repurposing, in my opinion, uh, in a sustainable way over the next decade. We we sold that building. Uh, we in the meantime we did. Uh, the Mayfair itself. We did work on a grant with the city and the province and the federal government. And we did a, a 226 unit uh, affordable housing project that was a former funeral home site. Could have only happened uh, at that time when Mayor Mandel led the charge. And uh, with the city's cooperation support, that got that project up and running and completed. And uh, it was a win win for everybody involved. To my earlier point, when you get your costs down, like we could do uh, 20 some years ago, you know, you can maybe be looking at the $75 foot grant program. The the purpose thing for $100 a foot request is because we have looked at cost of construction, even the capital cost for some of these buildings now, is five to six times of what, what I paid then, which is far lower than what it is Today, uh, the uh, we, we paid eleven dollars a foot. You'd be hard pressed to look around town now to buy empty buildings or repurpose B and C class buildings for fifty to seventy-five dollars a foot. So I think that um, in the cost of construction, the soft cost, interest cost, carrying costs have all gone up substantially in twenty years. So we have to look take that into consideration. If we wait. Another five or 10 years, I think the values of the buildings may even just come back down to that 10 or $11 a foot where it was when I bought Park Square. So delaying the process is, is not going to create more office, office space, it will not create more residential space. It will only happen through luck that interest rates come back down to the one or 2% that there is an affordable program through a lower cost of finance that may, may, may not happen, but we own half a million square feet downtown in the 109th Street area. And uh, we don't, we're running right now about 60% vacant in our building. We don't forecast any change happening in the office market, only that it will get worse. And uh, if it gets worse, the values will drop further. Uh, investors uh, nationally are looking at the office market as Edmonton 
as a, as a, as a derelict industry. They do not want to invest in it. Uh, they want to see very clean, clear program of cooperation between the orders of government and that it's, an, it's a fairly easy process. There's a, a, a grant given and that's fine if you make it a, approved on completion, that's something that's financeable. It has to be, if it's not financeable, it's not developable. It's just that simple. The, um, so I think that uh, what we're doing in our 109th Street area, uh, we think that we're uh, firm believers in the repurposing of buildings. We have the two main buildings are the intact building, which we created the first gold lead building in 2008. And uh, so we, we, we did a lease with Northwest College. Thank you. 1,600 students in there, and Grant McEwen's going to bring another 7,500 students to the area. So there's Thank a you, George. Sorry, that's, that's your time. appreciate your presentation. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we'll go next to Chris Fillmore. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, <clears throat> I'm here because Fillmore Construction, Fillmore family alongside with uh, Rocky Josan here, have a PSA in place to purchase the Phipps McKinnon building. And I wanted to discuss some of the pieces that we're seeing as we try to go through this process to see if we can convert this to a rental project. Uh, my, my presentation is going to focus on the financial side of how one of these developments happen. Uh, these projects are based on a lot of pieces. They're based on cost, the amount of equity you need to put in, your equity timing, your income, your quality of the asset you have in place at the start, where it's going to go, your financial terms, financial rates, tenant interest, a lot of different factors. Um, Edmonton's affordable housing market is a huge boon to the population of Edmonton. We have by far the cheapest housing of any city in Canada, any major city in Canada. But it actually makes things really difficult for developers because we're sitting here with the same construction costs as Calgary, but we're making two thirds as much on rent. So that's, why, that's a big part of why you're seeing so much happen in Calgary and so little in Edmonton. Developers can barely if at all, just make the numbers work right now on a traditional project. And that's, that's if you assume no uh, requirements for reduced rates as are discussed in some of the other past programs, uh, discussed rental rates. Right now, the banking world despises off the word office. If you mention the word office to them, they just turn around and walk away. For this project, we have talked to 30 banks, sorry, our broker has talked to 30 banks. Two came back with an offer to finance the purchase of the building. The building, <clears throat> if you were to rebuild the Phipps and Kinnon building, it would cost, by the time you paid for the land, development, building, all that, it would cost you $100 million to rebuild. And our PSA is in place for a very small fraction of that amount. And that's really what our office buildings in Edmonton have turned into. They're worth effectively nothing. But even with that catastrophically low value, the banks were only willing to give us, sorry, the two banks, the best offer out of 30 banks was we could get 68% financing. So the reason that matters, if you go and build a new purpose-built rental building using a CMHC financing model, you can get 95% bank debt. That means you can build a 200 unit building that would cost you 55, 60 million dollars for three million dollars in equity. You need to have a lot of capacity to be able to guarantee those monies, but when you're building one of these, you need to come into the project with 12 to 15 million dollars in equity for the same scale of project. Ultimately, the value works. Long term, the numbers work. The problem is the amount of equity you need at the start because the, the, world, the banking world despises offices, even if you're going in planning on converting those. Um, I, I agree that these projects need some sort of incentive. 
Because if you don't, then why would any developer build a new office building, or sorry, why would any developer convert an office building where they need 12 to $15 million worth of debt to develop 200 units where they can go and get a financing model with the government, CMHC model, and come in with $3 million in equity? So <clears throat> the Phipps McKinnon project in specific, as we've got it laid out, it's got 206 units in it. That's removing 200,000 square feet of office space. That's removing 200 out of 3.7 million square feet of empty space sitting in Edmonton right now. That's a very significant portion of the property. And that's adding 206 doors. What is that, 500 people in downtown? And, but like looking through the financing, we started this process without really understanding what the financing was going to bring. And it's become quite clear, unless there's some sort of incentive something to help with that equity problem of this type of project, these conversions just don't work. If you need to, you could start, like, start with a little bit smaller number and work your way up to 100 bucks as you get to harder and harder buildings, but I would think you gotta do something. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, over to Kaylin Anderson. Good morning, members of Urban Planning Committee and City Council. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to address the reports before you today on downtown financial incentives and office conversions. My name is Kaylin Anderson and I'm the Executive Director of the Urban Development Institute for the Edmonton Metro Region. It's no secret that our downtown is currently struggling. In large part, this is due to increasing commercial vacancy rates coupled by a lack of private sector financial viability to support new residential development. The last major development permit issued for downtown Edmonton was in 2021. This is a worrisome investment gap, particularly as our whole city is growing. A major concern to note is that without taking concrete action, we will continue to see ongoing significant devaluation in our commercial real estate market. This will erode our tax values for the entire city. Steady tax revenue from a, from, a, from a vibrant downtown core protects the city at large from massive shifts in tax rates. However, property values in the downtown core have been steadily declining with almost a quarter of the offices downtown sitting vacant. This continued devaluation in our assets uh, will erode the revenues for the entire city and this will inevitably place increased pressure on the rest of the city to cover that burden. In other words, to speak very plainly, no matter which part of the city you live in, work in or represent, your taxes increase when things go wrong downtown. These issues, however, may be rectified through the attraction of more people living and working downtown. To realistically achieve this, additional housing units will need to be built this can be supported by a targeted system of strategic incentives that catalyze the building of much needed residential units in our downtown core. Edmonton has in place a clear council approved plan and now is the time to execute on it. One of the stated policy goals in the capital city downtown plan is to double the residential population. The current population downtown is about 14,000 people. The 20 year goal of the capital city downtown plan was to achieve 24,000 residents by 2030. This would mean that we need to add another 10,000 people living downtown within the, within the next six years. At 1,800 people per year, this would equate to adding three to five major tower projects every year for six years running. To reiterate, the last two years have seen zero projects. So we're not close to achieving this population growth or currently on track to meet council's goal, but we do have the opportunity to lean in to implement not only the objectives in the capital city downtown plan, but also the city plan itself. Our approved policy sets the expectations to achieve and gives us the path forward. To take practical action, the implementation strategy in the Capital City Downtown Plan provides useful policy guidance in this regard. The first stated catalyst project to drive the vision forward was to implement a housing incentives program for new units downtown. We have successfully done this in the past and we're gonna have to do so in the future. Now is the right time to get started. In 2021, the City of Calgary made the strategic move to approve funding for downtown housing incentives, and just this past month, they reached their $153 million funding threshold due to tremendous success. Through this work and partnership, the, Calgary, the City of Calgary has approved 13 projects with four more uh, under review. Calgary estimates that these projects will have replaced 2.3 million square feet of obsolete office space, created 2,300 more housing units, and leveraged $567 million in private investment. This represents an absolutely massive contribution to their city core in just two years. 
This means more people, more efficient real estate, more productive municipal taxation, and a more vibrant downtown. Edmonton can and should do the same, and we in fact have it at our disposal, a, an approved capital city downtown plan that already envisioned this, and the strategy uh, that we would need, uh, which we're talking about today, it outlines those steps uh, very clearly, and that was done over a decade ago. To sum up, this is game-changing policy. It offers practical and timely solutions to our housing crisis, rejuvenates our city centre, and safeguards the property values and property tax rates for the entire community. The downtown affects all of us. We will end up paying for declining asset values and associated taxation increases whether we want to or not. The $3 billion asset erosion already realized since 2014 should spur us to action together on this today. Now is the time. The real estate development community is extremely invested in the success of our downtown. Moving forward, we would be happy to work together with City Council and Administration on this important initiative, including leveraging investments from other orders of government to prioritize funding for such a program. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. Over to Mike Saunders. Great, thank you very much. And good morning, members of Urban Planning Committee and the City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Mike Saunders. I'm the Senior Vice President with Qualico Properties. I also currently sit as a board director with the Urban Development Institute, Edmonton Metropolitan Region, and sit on the executive committee with the Downtown Recovery Coalition. We've seen a lot of change over the last five years uh, leading up to COVID. There's a lot of vitality and, and um, positive signals within our downtown. With ICE District being completed, there was also office buildings that were being completed and purpose-built rental projects being completed as well. Since then, as we transitioned into COVID, there's been a lot of change. The only people that were walking our streets were people experiencing homelessness or sleeping rough. Our public perception of safety uh, within our core has deteriorated. There has been a lot of work since then, albeit small adjustments and incremental change. But we always talk about the vitality of our office buildings and our retail um, offerings as well downtown. And I, I'm often asked when this will return. And my, my answer is always that, well, when our population increases by approximately 10,000 people, that's probably a time where major retailers uh, will signal uh, momentum and wanting to come back to, to downtown. We've seen a uh, return to work strategy um, extremely hampered by, again, that public safety and security in that sense that it's not safe to return to work. And all these problems are exacerbating uh, the potential structural risk that we see on the devaluation of our office buildings. These will have negative impacts, as we've all heard today, on citywide uh, taxation, and that affects everybody living in our city. We've heard today that Edmonton continues to have the second worst uh, office vacancy in all of Canada, second to Calgary's, and additionally, there's a shortage of residential units that are required to attract people coming to Edmonton, or to Edmonton and live in our downtown core. My observations of Calgary are extremely different. I spend a lot of time there working. I was just recently at the real estate forum. The public perception of safety and, and the journey that they're on in their recovery is significantly different and quite positive, quite honestly. Um, there's an, as we've heard today, there's a, a very active office conversion program. There's a lot of uh, positive signals that their economy is in their recovery out of COVID is significantly different than ours. They're attracting 35 to 40% increase in asking rental rates for purpose-built rental, something that all of us in Edmonton wish that we had. For the past five months, we've worked collaborative, collaboratively with different industry stakeholders, and we've all come to the same conclusions. Market conditions have drastically changed. Rental rates have declined. Capitalization rates have increased, which negatively impacts valuations of our buildings, and construction costs have increased by approximately 30%. Given these challenges, it will take meaningful investments from all orders of government to address the spectrum of housing that we have in our city, in particular high density housing in our central business district. Protecting the valuable land assets and tax base is extremely important to the city's economic vitality. To achieve this, I am supportive of incentives that would accelerate the construction of all residential buildings in downtown. This would lead to a rise in housing supply and a fall in office vacancies. 
both which are fundamental to the financial sustainability of our city's core and by extension to the whole tax base. We kindly ask that you consider the following uh, motions in direct administration to accept this information, um, the report for information, and also direct administration to develop a housing investment program that initiates all forms of housing within the capital city downtown ARP boundary, including conversion, but also including new purpose-built rental. That will have input from stakeholders like UDI Edmonton, NAOP Edmonton, the Downtown Recovery Coalition, and private industry stakeholders. This should include recommendations on all sources of potential municipal funding sources, including the re recommended incentive amount. We also ask that the mayor, on behalf of council, write to the provincial and federal governments to request funding prioritization of such a housing initiative with intergovernmental follow-up. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you this morning, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Uh, uh, over to Henry Ecker. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor and members of the committee. Oh, sorry. Thanks for the opportunity to um, address the reports before you today. My name is Henry Edgar. I'm the president of Autograph, a local real estate development company. I'm also a board director with the Edmonton Downtown Business Association, vice chair of the Urban Development Institute, and I also sit on the steering committee of the Downtown Recovery Coalition. I'm a passionate city builder and an advocate for downtown, and like many here today, I've spent countless hours contemplating and collaborating on how to solve the issues we currently face in our core. And the reality is there isn't one answer. But I can say with certainty that the number one key ingredient is people. I believe people create eyes on the street, safety in numbers. They're the customers for struggling retail, restaurants and cafes. They create vibrancy for events and festivals. And all of this combined creates a more attractive environment for residents and office tenants to locate downtown. Without people, we simply cannot expect an easy road to recovery. Our challenges are not unique to Edmonton. Many cities across the country are grappling with these same issues and struggling to find answers. In addition to this, housing affordability remains a top priority for all levels of government. Fortunately, our province is seeing record immigration, and we have an opportunity to capitalize on being one of the most affordable major cities in Canada. But we need to act now, or we'll continue to see the majority of those new migrants decide to settle with their neighbors to the south. I believe there is a recipe for success in downtown Edmonton, but we're currently facing major challenges one of which is a lack of investment momentum and private sector financial viability for new residential projects. Shovel-ready developments do exist, and developers are prepared to begin construction. You've heard that from Chris and Rocky, and you'll hear it from me. Uh, however, these developments are not economically viable without meaningful and strategic incentives that can spur development and produce thousands of residential units built in our core. Our company is one of those developers. We have a site on the corner of uh, 106th Street and 102nd Avenue. We rezoned it in 2018 for 780 units um, at a time when downtown was awesome and everyone could feel its potential. Our decision to acquire the site was spurred by the promise of a train stop on 102 Avenue and a beautiful and much needed warehouse park across 106th Street in addition to new sidewalks, roadways, bike lanes and trees all paid for by the city. Unfortunately, the world changed very rapidly and we're faced with our current situation, or if we were to proceed with this development today, our returns would be negative. So I ask you, if not here, with all of the infrastructure and renewal provided by the city, then where? I also think it's critical that these incentives cannot and should not be viewed as dollars to developers, but rather as an accelerator to unlock growth. We've run the numbers, and I agree with my colleagues that a $100 per square foot incentive applied over a multi-year period would be a realistic solution to potentially bring thousands of new residential units to market. Furthermore, it's important to state that capital is mobile. Projects will get built, but they may not get built in Edmonton. This is a competitive market, and we can't afford for Edmonton's downtown to lose. And I also appreciate that the city is under fiscal stress and budgets are tight. But I would just suggest to you that we're your partners, and I would encourage you to mobilize us. Leverage us to lobby the province and the federal governments to share the burden of these incentives. Fiscal policy has already been created in the form of the Federal Housing Accelerator Fund. 
However, we cannot unlock these dollars in, unless we increase our housing baseline significantly over the next three years. We're here and we're eager to build, but it will take partnership. We can do this work together, but we need administration to create a program to administer potential funds in a targeted zone with a near-term timeline. This is a proven policy, as you've heard today, and we're watching it unfold across North America from downtowns like Washington and Chicago to our neighbor Calgary, which is turning away applications due to the tremendous success they've seen. A housing incentive program densifies the heartbeat of our city, offers a timely solution to the housing crisis, and protects property values for the entire city. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you for being here this morning. And our uh, final speaker on our first panel, Tim Freeman. Are you with us? Oh. Okay, well we will, we can, uh, if, if Tim is able to join us later, we can accommodate him on panel two. So with that, I will open up the floor to questions of our panelists from my colleagues. Mayor Sohi. Well, well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Also, thank you so much for your commitment to downtown. I think uh, it is shared by this council. It's shared by previous councils. Uh, collectively, we had invested, uh, we have invested close to $1.4 billion uh, for downtown over the last number of years. Uh, but I wanna bust this myth and perception right away that Calgary is doing more and Edmonton is doing less. Uh, when I look at the construction incentive grants, those are creating 2,341 uh, 2, units, residential units in downtown. And Calgary's incentive is creating the same. I think uh, we need to put that in context and, uh, and perspective. That does not mean that we should not do more. So I'll start my question with uh, Anand. Uh, I'm really intrigued by your idea of uh, shifting some of the CRL, like the underground infrastructure that we're building through CRL, and is there a way to engage with provincial government that, they, that we use grant money to fund that under, underground infrastructure, because it's public infrastructure, and free up that money in the CRL? If I understood you correctly, that's your idea, right? Okay. Yes. Okay, yeah, I think that is a very intriguing um, idea to, uh, to, uh, to explore because there might be other things that we're doing in the public domain that could be funded through the province through that $330 million that they owe us in uh, lieu of what they funded in Calgary. Uh, so okay, I think that's a good question that I will pose to, uh, to administration. Uh, on either to Rocky or uh, your partner, Rocky, uh, uh, George, right? Chris, Chris sorry. Uh, the, what stage are you at now when you, in, in your uh, conversations? Because uh, um, creating a policy such as this and creating grant funding such as this is a process to follow, it takes time, right? Uh, is it too late for you? Is there other process available for you? For example, accessing affordable housing investment program that City of Edmonton has currently has in place. Just want to know the your timelines. Sure, I can speak to that, uh, Mayor Soy. Thank you. Uh, we're well along the process, so uh, we've been under contract on that building for a few months now. Um, we're we're past the due diligence phase. We're in financing. And that's where this becomes so important. As Chris mentioned, banks are just running from office buildings. Uh, as soon as you say the word office, uh, they mm -hmm. shut the door. So regardless of the fact that we're converting all of that office to multifamily, uh, they, uh, conventional banks won't lend on that type of product. So we're having to go to the MES market, um, higher interest rates, private lending. What will help us is a grant from the city of Edmonton that we can count towards our equity. Because as Chris mentioned, 68% is kind of the best we've done in terms of a loan to cost. Um, whereas newer projects with the MLI Select program from CMHC can do up to 95%. Mm -hmm. So if we were able to get, um, I mentioned $50 a square foot, our project works at $50 a square foot. I'm not speaking for any other developers or any other 
projects in the pipeline from anyone else. Um, if we got a $50 per square foot grant from the City of Edmonton, we would be able to commence construction on that project Look, in Q1. Yeah, because the, the, what I'm trying to understand is that, you know, you may not be able to sustain yourself for another, like, this, these kind of programs takes six months, one year longer to put in place, right? And uh, you can't wait that long. So that's why I'm suggesting that there might be other options for you to work with city uh, or through, I don't, know if the const I don't know if the construction grants are still available or not, uh, but the uh, affordable housing investment program is definitely available. We, we'd hope that um, whatever decision this committee comes to would be, um, you know, would still be available to us retroactively, even if we started construction okay. in 2024. We would actually wouldn't need the funds until completion, which is likely 2020, late 2025, early 2026, which is, I think, most projects that are being considered right now for conversion have a similar timeline. We, we probably wouldn't need the funds until 2026. So the retroactivity would be important to you? Yes, okay, very important. It. Okay, got it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Sorry, could I add one little piece to that? Uh, just in 15 seconds. No, no, you go ahead, just uh, okay. quickly. Uh, sorry, so the banks are willing to lend based on equity that wouldn't be available through the program for a couple years. Like if the, bank, if the city said that the money was only available upon completion, as long as we have a signed letter saying the money is available upon completion, the banks will lend to us okay. and we'll be able to basically take a line of credit, calling that equity that will pay back the line of credit later. Great, thank you. But without you. it, it doesn't work. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. Councillor Cartmel. Great, thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I appreciate the uh, input and feedback. Um, I'll, I'll go first of all to Mr. Josen. Am I, am I saying your name right, sir? Yeah, okay. So you said, so there was a program that council approved a couple of years ago that was essentially a property tax deferral program for a new construction. And you said that that is, would not work here. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, my understanding of that program um, is that it would um, hold the property tax valuation of a property to the base level before conversion or before renovation. Um, so it just doesn't add enough dollars to the pot. It, it's a long-term repayment for a developer over 25, 30 years for that to really make the same type of impact that a per square foot grant would make immediately. So it, it depending on what the baseline is that's established, it works or it doesn't work. F fair? Because I, I believe it was on new construction last time, so when you're taking the value from raw land up to an improved piece of property, there's a pretty big delta in value that's created. That's correct, but on the financing side, it doesn't really help. So on the financing side is, is what we're encountering with our project is there's an additional equity component that's required because it's an office to multifamily you conversion can't specific it as equity. Okay. Correct. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, does, does it help the pro forma depending on the, where the baseline is? So maybe it doesn't help your financing, but on your overall pro forma, it might help your bottom line. Definitely. It helps the NOI, which helps valuation in the long term. It, yeah. it, it helps in the long term for sure, and it definitely is a benefit. It's just not the impact. Uh, I, I just don't think a lot of projects will get off the ground with that incentive versus a per square foot. Doesn't help pay. Doesn't actually help pay for the construction. Correct. Yeah. So I'm, this is likely a, a better question for administration, but um, I guess an end because you're the, the leader, <laughs> kind of, sort of. Um, what happens to our CRL? Like my understanding of the CRL, and again, this should be confirmed, is that effectively we established that back as part of the arena district and all of the other improvements that came with that downtown. And that loan is paid back through the tax lift of the buildings downtown. If there's no longer a lift to that baseline, which was established eight or 10 years ago, what happens to the CRL? That is a good question for administration, but I guess yeah. I registered first, so I'll, I could yeah. take a stab at it. Yeah. I think that I think that one of the challenges with the CRL is that it imagined that it would that it would always replenish itself. So if we invest in a park and then we get uh, several developments around the park, 
then that'll then that would pay back the park even though it wasn't the original. Well, that's the notional. The, the idea is that you buy, you pay for the park, uh, and you borrow the money to pay for the park, and you pay back the loan with the tax lift that all the buildings around the park are going to re they're, are going to realize. But if there is no tax lift because all the buildings in downtown are falling in value, how do we pay back the loan? I, it's my opinion that that paying back the loan would be through incentivizing and then building new residential yeah. units. And I think that's the, I think what we've done with the CRL is we've we've done all of the like longer term projects and and those projects uh, haven't moved the needle enough. This was originally contemplated in the CRL. It's the last thing that's left to be done and hasn't been done uh, here. So uh, there are some like there are future improvements under green and walkable, but but this is the one that that hasn't been started. So uh, if there's a shuffling of the priorities of projects, amenity projects that are currently on the, the CRL list, I, we don't have that list in our materials today, but are there, are there projects that we ought delay so that we can fund this instead? I, I would fund this next if it was up to me personally. I think that the, there's no greater return, and I think what you're hearing from all of the panelists is that there's not a, there's not a market. Uh, no, nobody's coming to save this thing. We haven't had a major development permit since 2021. The, the, the CRL will continue to decline unless we, so unless we do something directly. I'm going to pick one example. A pedestrian bridge on 100th Avenue is not helping downtown today. And if we help downtown today through something like this, we might be able to go back to the pedestrian bridge tomorrow. Is, am I summarizing your... Yes. Yeah. And I, because we don't have a list, it's kind of unfair to pick on one, but I, I just wanted to confirm that with you. Uh, I'm out of time. I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Tang? Uh, great, thank you. Um, maybe, Kaylin, do you, I'm wondering if you can kind of comment on that. Um, that was Anand's opinion that if you were to shuffle, you, you know, if we were to look at all the projects, you would prioritize this today over others, other industry thoughts. Yeah, I feel like I'm flying a bit blind with all of us because I don't have the list. Um, but this is the time to look at every single thing and scrutinize its return on investment and the impact it will have. So again, not to pick on the one pedestrian bridge, but will that churn out a half billion dollars of private sector investment? Probably not. Uh, so I think you need to just relook at all your priorities relative to what you actually want to deliver for downtown in the short term. Thank you, and maybe I'll come back to you, Anand. Um, and also thank all of you. I know there's many more speakers to come, but thank you for taking the time to have this important conversation. Um, you said we need an um, ambitious goal, we need a plan, we need a budget, a hundred million investment, doesn't have to be all city of Edmonton, uh, that we need to be bolder with our asks to the provincial and federal governments, but, you're, but we're positioning this as city can front the program that will prompt the industry to help with the lobbying effort with other levels of government with funding that will come later. Is that, do you want to elaborate on that approach? Yeah, uh, that's that's correct. That's the, the, that is what I'm trying to say, and and I think that it's important that the that council be united in this, and that it be a clear plan. We don't want to say that we want to fund some uh, some future idea, uh, especially with the federal government. I'm imagining the housing accelerator fund. Uh, Minister Fraser has explicitly said that he would like more uh, ambitious. Uh, goals from municipalities. They've given uh, three out of, I think, six agreements uh, to, uh, to places in Ontario. I listed those ones all around $100 million. Uh, and, and when asked why they hadn't funded other prairie provinces or, or anything west of Ontario at that point, his response was, we haven't seen anything ambitious enough. Because in Ontario, they can just turn the tap on or off. You know, they, they can just approve things they didn't already approve. Whereas, whereas here, we've already done the good work. We've already yeah. done the hard work in my I mean, I'll argue we just did something pretty ambitious for the city, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, you know, I'm aware that there, I think one of you, I can't remember who mentioned the federal program. Oh, yes. Do you know how much, um, say, Calgary access from that? I don't. It would be a question for administration. Sure, yeah, no, to. good point. I, I was going to follow up there. Um, and then, can you talk, or I guess maybe Anon or someone else can kind of chime in. Can you talk about this provincial piece? Because I think I heard a few of you talk about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll take a, a first stab at it. I think, again, ad admin, I was in a meeting with the, with admin last week, and they were telling us about it, so I imagine they'll probably be better served to tell you about it, but I'll, I'll do my best. As I understand, um, there's currently negotiations going on between the city and CMHC as it relates to what our housing baseline is in Edmonton. And so let's just say, for discussion purposes, it's 10,000 units. Um, for us to maximize the dollars that the, the feds would give us, we need to increase that by 30% each year over three years. So in essence, we need to create 9,000 units over the next three years to maximize the dollars. And I'm looking back to Chris, will somebody give me a nod maybe, but I think so, that's in essence what sorry, it is. I, but I guess in the context of this conversation, you see office conversion as kind of that pathway towards It's based it. on building permits. So that would be office conversion if there were hundreds of building permits, I would count towards that number, as I understand. And, I mean, I think intergovernmental came up a lot, but to this point, um, to date, how many of you actually had those conversations or are you kind of waiting for this step to happen? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll pipe in. Um, it's hard to ask without council saying we're officially interested. So sure. if this report is received for information and a motion is, motion is made to pursue some sort of activity and it's in writing, then we can sort of we take that forward sure. concretely. Okay. Um, and then to Mr. Josen, I think you mentioned that in this, um, without some kind of incentive, uh, conversion would just simply not happen. But you mean in this climate, in this economic climate, because there have been conversions that happened that has been viable without any kind of government subsidy, right? Correct. Uh, I don't think those any conversions have really happened since the interest rate increases sure. and the construction cost increases. Those are really the two major factors. And then the third one would be the, the financing challenges these days with office, yeah. particularly. Okay, thank you. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, I've got quite a few questions, um, so I'll go a bit rapid fire just to get some clarity. So with the, um, the Phillips project, have you, are you not eligible for the MLI Select? MLI Select, CMHC will not even talk about being part of the project until every single office tenant that would have to move out to complete the residential conversion until we have a legal signed agreement that every single tenant is going to move out. So basically, we have to take a quarter million square foot building and strip it to the bone, kick everyone out, go through that long process before they will even talk to us about financing, which just isn't an option because as an office building, it's bleeding money. Without tenants, it'll bleed even more. Sure. Okay. But but in terms of, you know, again, <coughs> just, just so I understand, if, if you were able to overcome that hurdle, then you'd be able to access or that 95%. It, in the long run, CMHC will take on the project, but they will not. CMHC is split, split, split into two parts, construction yeah. financing and long-term financing. Yeah. And most developers of multifamily right now, rentals, are doing it with the construction financing. We don't have access to that unless we just destroy right. the building completely first. Gotcha. Okay, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I guess, you know, a question, I've, I have a few questions just when we're looking at the Calgary model. So my understanding is that it is, uh, and I don't know who to direct this question to, We'll just put Mr. Pai on the spot. Um, but to the best of your knowledge, that's for conversion only. Is that correct? There's no new new build incentive? There's a, they added a, a demotion, but it's separate. So yes, it's it's only for office conversion. So I guess I'm maybe wondering, um, I, a few of our speakers have mentioned the new build. So uh, Mr. Saunders or, or Mr. Edgar, talk me through that. Like I, I think I'm just struggling in terms of recognizing Conversion solve two problems that that addresses our uh, office vacancy issues and and provides more vitality vibrancy in in the core Talk me through why we're looking to include some of the new build as well Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that and I don't want to take away from the conversions because I think they're absolutely critical um, Conversions are very challenging some of these office towers have tenants in place You know for five ten years sometimes and so you have to deal with moving those tenants moving them around it takes time um, a lot of the bare land, the new residential sites, are immediately 
ready to proceed. They've got, they either have development permits or they could get development permits very quickly, building permits quickly. So can I get a bit of clarity on that? Because yeah. I think we also heard um, that there haven't been any new DPs issued. So you mentioned sort of shovel ready projects. Yeah. So could you, so, so there are projects that maybe were issued a development permit or a building permit two years ago, but those are still valid. Yeah, I mean, I won't necessarily speak to the validity, but I will sort of compliment our administration in we can generally get permits quite quickly. You know, within a six month period, you could get a development permit and building permit likely. And so, you know, the reason I think the benefit on new residential is there is, for example, the warehouse park. And I mentioned yeah. our site. Yeah. Massive investment with the LRT, with the train, with roads, sure. et cetera. Um, we currently pay uh, about $120,000 a year in property taxes on that site. On completion of that development, mm -hmm. we would pay $2.8 million in property taxes. And I'm also hearing um, that it's also sort of that speed to market, that the, the right. new build can get moved faster. Okay, that, that's helpful. Yeah. So then maybe moving, uh, maybe to Ms. Anderson. So really appreciated some of your commentaries around the, the tax impacts. I think you're right, we're looking at sort of the local, local vibrancy impacts in the downtown and then also sort of the broader tax implications. So, you know, one thing I'm struggling with Oh, I won't have time for a minute. Um, maybe I'll just ask. So I, I, I believe there's about 2,100 or 3,000 new units that are coming online in the next 18 months or so that were part of earlier incentive. So just wondering if there's been some analysis on the absorption capacity. We've heard that the market is weak downtown. Is there a risk of, of oversupply in the short term? I'll just chime in quickly on that, one of the benefits of the rental market is um, prices are elastic. And so uh, if demand is low, inevitably um, owners will lower their rents to fill their buildings because they're incentivized to do so. And so there is currently and will be a shortage of buildings in Edmonton, uh, just given the immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would tell you a certainty that those buildings will get built up. Rents may come down, supply and demand, okay. more supply, low cost. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll go next to Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, maybe I'll I'll pick up there, but I might go to um, to Speaker Mike Saunders. Uh, just on absorption, you know, I I too have heard on on pretty regular occasion that um, absorption is one of the reasons that we're not seeing more projects developed downtown. Um, so just wondering, you know, would would office conversions be immune to this, um, or you know, would they be displacing? Um, otherwise purpose-built rental developments that would occur without incentives. Looking for some thoughts on that. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, I, I guess just picking on some of the comments that Mr. Edgar had, had mentioned, um, you know, what we're seeing in Calgary with, with 184,000 people coming to Alberta uh, in the last 12 months, most of which are, are arriving in Calgary, um, you know, I believe some of the, the reports that administration had forecasted on vacancy within our downtown core are quite favorable um, for the next couple years. Uh, it's only a question of time until, um, you know, there's a, a housing crisis, quote unquote, in Calgary, and we get our proportionate share of people moving to, to Edmonton. So I do think there's a real opportunity here to keep in step with supplying the appropriate amount of residential apartments. And just uh, further on whether it's office uh, conversion or new purpose-built rental, um, there's risks on both sides. And, and I would probably say there's more cost risk on new purpose-built rental just because the building process is a lot more, there's foundations, there's structural concrete, there's everything, shoring. And um, I, I think the ultimate goal uh, you know, and s uh, keeping in alignment with the city plan is, is creating housing options in our downtown core. So I think we need to let the market respond on whether that's purpose-built rental um, or an office conversion. Okay, maybe maybe on that, um, can stick with uh, with Mike Saunders or happy to have uh, Ms. Anderson answer as well. Like why, why not directly invest in, in housing or purpose-built rentals as opposed to conversions then? I think both will work. Um, I think that you'll get a quicker uptake, faster buildings um, if you're doing, you know, surface parking lot to new tower. 
um, but there are benefits to the office conversion, such as uh, taking all of the excess uh, commercial space out of the supply, uh, and also um, I think generally what is found is that office conversions uh, command a lower rent, so that helps add to that overall picture of housing diversity downtown. So uh, we're, we're really not on team office conversion or new, new construction here, we're just on team get housing built downtown. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and not not sure who to direct this one to, uh, so I might go to to our first speaker, um, to Speaker Pai. You know, I'm grappling with the vacancy rate question. Um, in periods of very high vacancy, I guess what is stopping private property investors from reducing their commercial uh, rents in a number of the buildings that we're talking about today? For for office rents, for yes, new, uh, yes. I might, I might talk to Mike. Uh, well, we're, there's significant risk on refinancing office buildings. So when we're seeing a rent roll decreasing and there's a quote unquote race to the bottom, um, you're gonna see a lot of uh, office buildings probably become insolvent. Um, the, the way that an office is valued, as, as I'm sure we're all aware, is a capitalized rental stream. And cap rates have, have increased probably 50 to 100 basis points over the last two years. And we've also seen a, uh, a decline in rental rates. So you mix those two together and, and there's probably within the next two to four years, there'll be some buildings that will become insolvent. Okay, and then I'll just sneak in one more question. Um, in attachment to administration uh, calculated the um, IRR for uh, a number of the different scenarios. And uh, to be honest, I found the the numbers quite uh quite alarming um ranging from negative eight to negative 12 percent internal rate of return thoughts on that piece um maybe to to uh speaker pie might be more uh, henry and uh, well i'll i'll, I'll hit sure. this one first I, sure. I mean there's tangible rates of return and there's intangible rates of return i think if you look at the pure financial aspects of it that's one part of the the solution but creating vibrancy, creating a, a vibrant festival city, all the things that Mr. Edgar mentioned in his speech, I think are, are things that you can't put prices on. So um, I just ask that council look at this as holistically as possible. And vibrancy is not something that is just pure dollars and cents on a balance sheet. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Salvador. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, I just want to follow up either, um, you know, maybe I'll start with um, uh, on the, uh, New, new new construction uh, the the program that we had in place new construction grant program unlocked you know more than 2000 units so why would that program not be effective for new construction if we were to carry on maybe with more flexibility and maybe enhanced grant funding within that option yeah i'll i'll chime in on that um Look, we utilize that yeah. um, off of 124th Street. Um, a number of other developers utilized it. I and I think it was valuable um, and made a difference. I would suggest to you that um, that program uh, is challenging when it comes to larger projects uh, that have a longer time horizon. It is challenging because the amount is lower. Well, because or? it takes so much longer to build these buildings. Okay. Right. If a building takes three, three and a half, four years to build. You've only got a year of that tax break, for example, in the five years. The other thing that I would say on that is that was diluted, and diluted in mm -hmm. the sense that it was spread across a much larger land mass. Okay, got it. And I think what's required right now is a targeted, very tight net approach. But, but to that, our that is, wouldn't that grant funding allow us to do that, tighten the geographical area, and expand the eligibility or, this, or the amount? Because what I'm struggling with is the upfront cost, right? Yeah. And money is very tight. We are already looking at 7.03 tax levy. And at your request, and rightfully so, yeah. we up the police budget. And two-thirds of the additional cost is going to our policing, right, to improve safety downtown, right? So, and, and the city, right? So, uh, so what I'm struggling with, like, if we can modify that grant program, because the it allows us to use that uplift and the 
and the property taxes to pay for some of that. There's no upfront cost. So if we can do that, then free up money for office conversions, a form that would require some upgrade, uh, sorry, upfront cost. That's what I'm trying to understand, if there's a way to uh, segregate two, appro uh, two options and, uh, uh, and any thoughts, maybe Mike? I'm trying to hit my button here. It's like, uh, um, I think at the time in 2020 and 2021, that high impact tax grant did have significant benefit. As we've seen, the, the dollar, the amount of projects per the amount invested by the city w was great. We were a recipient of that as well. Uh, I guess it just reinforces the the different cost environment that we're in, the different interest rate right environment that we're in, the the, the increase in operating costs that we're seeing and the increase in, in cap rates. So I do think there is a, a mechanism where that works. It's just a very different environment that we're living in. So my understanding of that grant equated to about a $14 per square foot, uh, if you equated that to a capital injection. Um, on the operating side, reducing our net operating income, it's just challenging to finance projects based on a grant rather than a capital injection. And the other piece as well is that um, Mr. Uh, Pai's comments made that if there is availability to free up CRL, there's that education tax that's saved within the CRL, so it doesn't have a net a negative effect on mill rates for the balance of the city. So that's something that would be really great to explore. I'm going to ask those questions to administration because that's a very, I think, worthwhile exploring uh, on, on, on that. Uh, last question to, to Anand. Uh, you said the the three billion dollar drop in value in commercial properties downtown has shifted about four percent tax levy burden onto other uh, properties not resident uh, sorry, commercial properties outside of downtown Am I, did i hear you correctly yeah that was my quick math on uh, on administration saying that a 10% drop was 0.8% uh, tax shift. So okay. I just uh, did that five five. But so yeah. in order to, what I understand from administration, in order to close that $3 billion gap of downtown, you probably need $9 billion of additional residential in the downtown to generate the same amount of taxes because commercial properties pay three times more than the residential. Yes, roughly, yeah. But keep, keep in mind. Can I yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I was, was just going to say, um, it'll all also increase the commercial tax assessments in downtown. That's, that's I think, yeah. what uh, office conversions really do is it's not just the residential tax base that increases. So you, you need $9 billion more in residential or you need $3 billion in office and um, that, will, that will cover it all. Okay, got it. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah. okay thank you. Um, yeah, just a few few final questions. So, uh, Mr. Pai, you spoke about sort of there's no greater return right now that we could use our, our CRL for. So we'll get some further clarification from administration, but my understanding right now is that we have about 42, we're, we're up $42 million in the CRL. If we were to cancel Vision Jasper Ave, the 100th Street Bridge, 107th Street Streetscapes, um, and 103rd A Avenue Streetscapes. Um, so just, just some thoughts on that in terms of, you know, I, I hear frequently about the state of Jasper Ave, um, the negative perception that that creates for the downtown. Um, you know, this is some pretty significant um, streetscape work in the downtown. So again, just wondering, wondering your thoughts there. Yeah, I'd, I would stand by that. I wanted to just be, uh, just be clear that Warehouse Park is already funded and, and that yeah. would be, that would, would certainly be a top priority. Is, uh, I used to sit on the board of the Downtown Community League. That's a, definitely a top priority for us. But, uh, but after that, I really think that, um, that downtown, in my personal opinion, is looking at, at quick, light touch improvements uh, and, then, and then enhanced you know, cleanliness and maintenance uh, as, as we kind of build towards the park. But we're still probably, you know, we're still probably three years away from, from that kind of, or two years away from that kind of feeling coming back. And I don't think that that, it, my the worst case scenario I believe would be uh, to to make the pedestrian and and experience of getting into downtown worse for a number of years uh, while while it's under construction than 
then oh, hope for saying. then hope for that uplift uh, some period after that construction is done. Okay. That, I think people have had a lot of construction. Great. Yeah, and I mean, I think, um, Ms. Anderson, you spoke about sort of that tax levy impact, and I think what I'm really grappling with is, you know, we even if we can fund some of this through the CRL, we certainly can't fund $100 million. We don't, we don't have that availability. And so, you know, $100 million, uh, which has to be in cash, it can't be debt financed, that's a 5% tax increase. So when we talk about, you know, the devaluation impacting other taxpayers, I mean, so does $100 million. So just wondering how to square that or what your thoughts are there. I'd like to see a really robust kind of analysis undertaken by the uh, finance department here that demonstrates which investments that you decide to make will churn out what return. And I think that if you start to apply that lens to every single decision, these answers will be coming more, more easily than just kind of throwing a dart at a wall and guessing, is this the thing we should fund? Is yeah. that the thing we should fund? And, and I feel that that's the exact lens that we're trying to, to use. And when we, when we do look at the, the rate of return, as Councillor Salvador highlighted, like it's, it's not there for us. I appreciate the intangibles, absolutely, but I think we really are looking at this from a, a financial return model and it's, it's hard to see the numbers add up. But I, but I think that's, uh, that just goes to the previous question that, that you'd asked there, which is, which is which of these projects should we do versus another one, right? And I think if you look at the rate of return on those in talking with developers from all around downtown and outside, those, those projects won't have they won't have a return on investment. They, they'll be only intangibles, really, right? Like they won't have, a developer isn't yep. gonna go or not go because 103rd Street was a little bit nicer, yep. right? It, that's it's just, a, and uh, that's just a, a fact. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. That's a great point, and I think you're right that um, the, the intangible is on the other side of the equation as well, so that's but, a good reminder. But uh, yeah, and I think there's ways to use uh, occupancy uh, to, push it, uh, to push that off a little bit as well as use other funding sources. I just wanted to see those ideas. Sure. So, so a last question is, um, you know, why not AHIP? So I, I'm not quite understanding why that program isn't workable. When I look at the, the funding amounts, um, you know, the Calgary model, if we take what's sort of been funded so far, it, it adds up to about $69,000 per unit. And that's roughly what, what is offered through the AHIP. Like that's what Williams Hall is roughly going to be getting and uh, as for the, the report that was provided. So just wondering what the hesitations are, or the barriers that that program presents. Yeah, maybe we'll take the first, first crack at that. So when I gave my assessment of the $100 per square foot, that already includes CMHC financing, which would require that a portion of the units be kept at 30% of median household income as affordable. So it layers on another element of affordability in an environment that's already extremely challenging. But is it an additional layer, or is there not alignment between the AHIP requirements and MLI select? To be entirely honest, I'd have to dig into AHIP okay. more, but right. I can just tell you we're, we're in an environment where anything that goes backwards is just taking us further into a negative For sure. uh, well, scenario. Yeah, that's great, and we'll, we'll get some more clarity from, from our administration on that. I uh, just want to be, be self-regulating uh, self on my time, so I'll go to Councillor Rutherford next. Yeah, thank you. I've been listening intently. Um, I just really have one more I guess broad question because you know I really do struggle with this one and, and full transparency I didn't support even entertaining this original report coming back to committee um, so you know for me it's a, it's a hard sell but I want to understand where you're coming from because for me I think you know it's concerning when I hear like we're gonna stop investing in public sector infrastructure for office conversions with the CRL Right, for me, you know, I think public sector serves a role, private sector serves a role, and nonprofit sectors serve a role. And together it all works together. But I don't I don't think necessarily us spending public sector dollars on the private sector helps us helps us achieve like how is the best way to use public sector dollars. So I wanted to give an opportunity uh, for the panel. I'll go to Kaylin first uh, you know and I, before before I go to you just also recognizing you know we did the tax subclassing phase out the new zoning bylaw 
right? We did the, uh, I did support the, the pedway for those other residential. We've talked about the parking lots that need to be addressed in the downtown for residential. So with all of that in mind, why, why is this the best use of public dollars? Like, I'm, I want to hear your, I really want to hear your pitch on that. Well, you ask a good question, and it's a deep one to consider. The, there's always a tipping point about speed and when and where. Um, if no action was taken, I think what we're hearing is that there will, we will see very little activity downtown. Um, and maybe we can live with that. Um, maybe we can let that tax base road spread the taxes out into the suburbs and it grow more assertively south of 41st Avenue. That would be fine. The market will do what it can do. Um, but a couple of things, those investors won't hang around waiting for Edmonton to come, come to it. They'll just move their capital. Their capital has to move all the time. Like, so it'll, you know, it'll go to Calgary, it'll go to Chicago, who knows where it's going to go, but it's, it, it, it'll keep moving. So I guess it's the opportunity cost for, as, as stewards of the public good for Edmonton, you have many things to balance. You have to think about what are the tax rates that you can live with, what are the priorities that you want to set for different areas, where do you want to see investment and partnership happen with the private sector, uh, where, and also keep in mind what you've already sunk as costs into the downtown. So you've built the billion dollar LRT line, you're putting in the warehouse park. To Henry's point, you go that far and then you stop five seconds short of the, the finish line. I just encourage you to think about all these things. Mm -hmm. You could certainly make different spending decisions, but what I wouldn't encourage is to have a nice streetscape with no buildings along it. That is not the right order of operation. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, I hear that. I'm just trying to think about a lot of the conversations we've had down, downtown and, and some of, and you know, I, I, again, I kind of take to Mayor Sogi's point, like there has been decisions that this council has made to spur stuff, the, the pedway to, to catalyze residential, the, the tax subclassing phase out, right, for purpose-built rentals. So I'm just- Yeah, like, you I guys have done a lot. It, I just yep. wanna make it clear, because some of the narrative I'm hearing is like that there's no, that we need to do action, we need to start doing action, like there hasn't been any action. So there's, that's, that's right. what I, I take contention with. Right there's now. been no action on the housing incentive piece that's outlined for in the capital for city for downtown plan. Okay. That only on okay. that element. Okay. Okay. You okay. folks that's have taken. Yeah. That's, that's a good clarity. That is the action that's not been taken. Council has taken a ton of proactive actions. You're in a horrible position right now. Um, this downtown is struggling. Um, so we get it. You get it. Um, it's not well, that, like we're saying good, good things that you've done before don't matter. It's just that they're just not enough right now. Based on that target to get to 2030 that's right. with the downtown. Yeah. population. Okay. Uh, I, I might just also add to that just really sure. quickly and, and back to the notion of people. Like when you think about these safety issues that we're struggling with downtown and security and cleanliness, people help that solution. Yeah, right? and I, Thousands I don't, I don't of people disagree. in the core help that solution. I don't disagree. It's yeah. just for me, it's the grappling with is it office conversion that gets us there or is it new, new builds? I think, residential. I think it's a, it's a combination of both because if you have a tower, like look at Phipps as an example, there's not an opportunity to build, well there's actually one down the street that we all know about, but there's not a lot of opportunities to build a brand new tower um, in close proximity to that. So if okay. now at you know 8 p.m. you've got that building full of residents that are coming and going and walking the street, that, that, that saves okay, you I, dollars I'm understanding your vision, yeah. thank you. Thank you for uh, indulging my questions. Thank you, thanks very much. Uh, Mayor Sohi for last question. Yeah, just very, first of all, I do appreciate uh, acknowledgement that city has done a lot, because $1.4 billion investment in downtown, uh, uh, in, in addition to the LRT investments, is a significant, uh, uh, show, uh, the, 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 way, the way Edmontonians have shown up for their downtown. So thank you for that. Uh, last question, you ask us to be united. I'm willing to explore or adjustment to CRL and talking to province about, uh, you know, funding public infrastructure to free up CRL money, but that would also require United Front from the people who represent downtown, live downtown, because if we are start going to start reprioritizing CRL funded projects, right, that's going to cause some friction, right? I, it, I kind of just want you to be aware that there has to be a United Front coming from uh, from from uh, from the community as well, right? Uh, on on reprioritization of uh, what is the most impactful investment can be at this time. 
I think this is a great place where the Downtown Recovery Coalition could really lean into its partnerships with post-secondaries, the Community League, the EDBA, the business community, and we can work with you on that. I think it's time to have a really sober um, and straightforward conversation about the downtown and yeah. what we need to do. And I also want to be very clear at this time, uh, in my mind, there's no room in the tax levy to create an upper front uh, grant funding that will allow us to move forward in conversion. So that's why I'm very, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think we will push hard as much as we can on that option because there's no room at this time in my mind going beyond 7.3. Oh, I mean, that is problematic, right? Uh, uh, to many Edmontonians when they're struggling. Just want to be up very honest and upfront with you. So we will work with you on options that you have identified. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fair. Oh, uh, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Pai, I, I recall uh, in uh, a previous board uh, meeting, you know, Edmonton uh, Chamber and yourself and a lot of other folks coming to council, um, and we were looking at the time at a 2.6%, 2.9% tax increase, and there was like vociferous opposition to that tax increase um, from all of these organizations. And now we're sitting here being asked to contemplate a 5% tax increase on the people of Edmonton. How do we score that? Yeah, I think I would start, yeah, it's a 7% tax increase. So I think it's just proposal of two percent on top of the five percent previously approved oh no i'm talking about with this proposal oh with that's this an proposal by itself five percent so on our base of 4.96 we're talking about a 10 percent tax increase for folks like you i would say two things one i hesitate to say but uh since 2016 when we were having our original conversations about uh about ways to mitigate tax increases through selling municipal owned lands taking a look at, at, uh, at uh, how many managers were in the city of Edmonton, taking a look at, at how much people were getting paid, standards review for, for new uh, buildings, for municipal buildings. Uh, at that time, the city's budget was $2.6 billion. Uh, in 2026, it'll be $3.6 billion. Uh, so that's like, uh, that I think is where we were coming from at that time and we provided specific ways that the city could invest uh, yeah, as okay. well as, so as, well as I, I would call that but, what I'm talking about now, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, go ahead. But, um, what I'm talking about now is how uh, you're making a pitch to council, which is great. But how on earth do you convince the public that they should be bailing out corporations, or maybe it's not bailing out, they should be incentivizing corporations with a 5% tax increase? for the downtown when in their lifetime they are unlikely to see a return on investment? I think the- How are you, how are you pitching the public on this? I think uh, really the CRL, funding this through the CRL, which was an originally an investment that is, that the reason why we're able to have this conversation at all is because it spurred $2 billion of investment, same amount of investment as LA Live had in its first 20 years done in the first five years. That has allowed us this opportunity to take a look at what was originally put in the CRL, the, the things that were originally contemplated in the CRL, and take a look at the order that we're doing them in. And I think that, uh, that the difference now is that the population, the folks that are coming downtown, uh, in terms of the, the office population, is in half. And so, so I feel comfortable making that argument to council and, and to the public, and so it's up to you folks to, to have that. Person. Imagine you're not talking to me right now. You're saying these words to my neighbor across the street at their door. They're not gonna understand a word you said. I, you know, I, I personally don't want to live in a city that has a dead downtown. That's my, that's just for me. Your neighbor might love it, but just for me, I don't wanna do it. And so the answer is that city council gives $100 million, a 5% tax increase from their own property taxes to private developers in order to convert their uh, investment of 
office buildings into residential builds, and this is going to help them in their lifetime. Yeah, I think that's misrepresentation. Here's Kaylin. Councillor, okay, I'd say that if okay. it's a misrepresentation, please correct me because this is what I am hearing, and if I'm hearing it through the lens of the folks that I now have to go talk to. The simplest answer I'd give is kind of the headline would be a dying downtown hits the taxpayers of Edmonton, whether you like it or not. So you might as well get development out of it. Okay. At a 5% cost. Uh, I don't know where that math comes from, factor, sir. On top of the 5% already they're paying. I, I don't know where that math comes from. I can't comment on that. $100 million. Any okay, I'm out of time. Thank you, Councillor Briquet. Councillor Jans? Hi, sorry, just very quickly, um, and, and I thank everybody for coming here today. I, I really appreciate the passion we all have for our downtown and making it vibrant. So just making sure I've got this, um, with the contemplation of the equity investment, let's say it's whatever it is, whether it's a hundred million or whatever, what percentage equity is the city going to be holding then in those, in those buildings or in those units? Zero. Zero. Um, why, why wouldn't we have some sort of an equity stake? Because the incentive isn't, by giving up ownership, you're just negating the incentive. It doesn't, uh, that, that doesn't cause an effect. Um, the, the requirement to have these built require incentive, and that incentive can't be treated as equity in a project. Right. Um, and, and, and just so I understand the math here, it's, if I'm to just starting from scratch, build a new building, I could say do, uh, a, or, or if I do an office conversion, is it like five to one or conversions five times more expensive than building a, a new building from scratch? Like for every 100 doors in a conversion, we could get 500, um, in a new build. Is that, is that about the math? I appreciate the question, but there's so many different variables in that question in what the office tower floor plate looks like, what the mechanical systems look like, what the structure looks like, what the envelope looks like. I wouldn't be able to give you a, a, a valid answer without specifics. But, it, but I'll but let it's Chris not, have an what, answer. Yeah. What I could suggest as far as the Phipps building specifically is <clears throat> the building cost is not dramatically different for that building because it is a very well kept building and because we were able to procure it at a decent price. Um, a decent price because office buildings are worth almost nothing now in the city of Edmonton. But the, the difficulty is not so much the, the cost for this particular project, it's the equity. You can't, as an investor, it's pretty hard to say, I want to spend 12 to $15 million on this project versus $3 million on another building somewhere else with the same number of doors. So like without any sort of incentive, you're simply not going to see any of these but projects go forward. Is there any, like, have we seen any build though that the conversion is cheaper than building from scratch? You're, you're doing really well to basically get the costs in line. Um, you need a really good starting building for the cost to be similar for a conversion as compared right. to a new build. So about it, yeah, and then, then it would be closer to a one-to-one. -one. Um, yeah. Has there been any analysis on, let's say we add um, a thousand new units of uh, conversion from commercial to residential? Have we, has there, how, like, have we looked at what that would do to the rest of the vacancy rate or the residential market downtown? Like, could we be inadvertently creating a third problem, which is we're undercutting the rest of the viability of residential property downtown? Sorry, Councillor, are you asking, would this, would we risk oversupplying the market? Potentially. I'll pass it to the developers. Yeah, I mean, we, we answered this to some degree earlier. I, I don't think we would. I think we've got such a mass of people coming here, and I, I think there will be more people as Calgary becomes more unaffordable. Um, so I think right now we're probably underbuilding the market, and by underbuilding the market, we're inevitably going to increase the pricing of our current housing stock. Uh, right. So, but I guess know, but this is where the typology comes in, where I can get a townhouse in LaGrange for, you know, 200K or whatever, or I could pay 1700 for a converted office, one bedroom or two bedroom downtown, right? Like, like, are we, is it, it's not exactly one for one in terms of 
what they're what they're looking for in terms of choice. Yeah, I, I mean, sure, but I think there's you know there's a reason why there's some people that want to live downtown and some people that want to live elsewhere in the city, that, right? It's just it's a it's a, it's a preference, right it's a balance. Do we know the vacancy rate downtown right now? <sighs> yeah, three and a half. I I actually had a report completed for the FIPS project discussing vacancy rates. Downtown residential vacancy is definitely higher than the rest of the city, but it's uh, the rest of the city in this report was about 3% where Edmund, where downtown was about 6%. So now that's based on published numbers. The thing is six months of Edmonton residential growth, that's probably down to one and 4% now. I okay, anticipate within- I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Great, thank you. I know we're eager to get to our next panel. I, sorry, just looking at who's on this panel versus the next panel, I did just wanna ask, just sort of a bit of a sensitivity analysis too in terms of what, what other factors come into play to make these projects viable. So, you know, the federal government recently had their, announced their GST rebate on purpose-built rental. So again, if you have this gap in your capital stack, how much does the GST rebate fix and then what it, what does a one percent increase like decrease in interest rates? What what are the sensitivities there? So, <clears throat> from the numbers I've looked at on multiple developments, frankly, the city of Edmonton right now, our rental rates are so low compared to how interest rates and construction costs have skyrocketed that the GST reduction just barely made affordable wood frame apartment buildings the least bit viable, just 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 tiny bit. Anything else is completely unviable because our rental rates are too low and our costs are too high. Yeah, and I mean, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, you know, I was trying to think of a good way to give that example. Um, uh, it's not just interest rates, it's, it's bond yields and that's how the CMHC mm -hmm. test rates are not gonna get in the minutia of that, but to your point on a, a single point of movement, on a specific project we were looking at, had the difference of roughly seven million dollars of equity. Okay. So it's meaningful it where is. we're at today. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think the other side of the equation is the other, the other thing that really helps uh, your numbers is if rents drastically increase, and that's that's not something we strategically want to want to see at all. So, okay, appreciate it. I'll ask you to step back. Thank you all so much for being part of the panel. I'll now invite the rest of our speakers up. I just want to note that we are 30 minutes from our, our lunch break. Um, so I don't know that we'll be able to hear from everyone before lunch and, and uh, certainly I don't think we'll be able to get to questions uh, before then, but I will invite up, I don't know if Tim Friedman has, has been able to join us. He withdrew. He withdrew, okay, great. So um, Alex Horitsu, uh, Mike Sacha, Annette Trimby, Adam Shamshuk, Jarrett Campbell, happy birthday, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Panita McBrien, Ken uh, Taves, and Bradley LaFortune. If you need to come around the corner, Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Hurtsu, I'll go to you. Thanks so much. Uh, happy to be here today. So as many of you know, I'm Alex Hurtsu, and I have the privilege of chairing the Downtown Recovery Coalition, a group of uh, both for-profit and not-for-profit business and community leaders dedicated to ensuring our downtown sees sustained economic recovery post-pandemic. Um, and that's a unique aspect of the DRC I want to specifically highlight. Um, from crisis diversion to our main library, from residents to post-secondaries, and from businesses both small and big, the cross-section of this group is significant, and this potential policy is one of our unanimous asks. Over the last two years, we've been in front of you advocating to ensure the heartbeat of our city stays alive, and you have come on that journey with us. And so, as speakers said before, I just want to emphasize that we appreciate the investments you've made. Almost all of the issues though that we're collectively trying to address, like open air drug use, safety and security, petty and violent crime, are symptoms of a hollowed out core. 
And the solution to that is density. When more people are out enjoying the offerings of our downtown, the simple perception of safety significantly increases. Housing accelerator policy in the form of a per square foot incentive is not just an investment in our city's future, it's a smart economic move. You've had the chance to hear from folks today who actually have assets and investment at risk, and they are the right ones to speak to in the, in the impacts of not protecting this massive economic anchor, 1% of the land base and 10% of the tax base. But I'm encouraging you today to do something bold that rejuvenates not only the heart of our city, but the entire economic outlook of our metro region. I'll leave you with one thought. As cities across Canada begin to look at programs like this more critically, and cities across the world start to invest in their core, where will we be? Because this is a proven policy idea that ensures downtown doesn't fail. When we talk about the continuous investments into safety and security, like EPS, we're going to continue to have to pour money into those things unless we fix and solve the density problem. And a housing investment policy is that prudent economic move that safeguards these types of investments going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sacha. And I think I've got a presentation. Looks like that's coming Just getting up. that loaded. Sure. Good morning, Councillor Stevenson, uh, members of the Urban Planning Committee, and members of Council. My name is Mike Sasha, and I'm a member of the Downtown Recovery Coalition on behalf of TrioVest Realty Advisors. TrioVest is a full-service real estate investment management firm, and we represent institutional pension plans that have holdings currently in downtown Edmonton. Next slide, please. I'm speaking to urge this committee to support the recommended motion from the Recovery Coalition, and that is to direct administration to seek out an investment program that stimulates housing downtown, and to also reach out to partners at the provincial and federal government. Next slide, please. As an Edmontonian, and specifically as someone who lives and works in the core with my young family, I believe a strong and vibrant downtown is essential to the health of the city. This is a view I know I share with many folks on council and citizens throughout the city. Next slide, please. As an agent for investor in downtown office properties, I know that the viability of even the premium and top of market downtown office buildings hinge not only on those buildings providing a competitive amenity package, state-of-the-art experience in the workplace, but also on those buildings being positioned in a downtown ecosystem with great energy. Next slide, please. The energy that makes downtowns great, interesting retail, exciting dining experiences, concerts, events, and even the basics such as effectively and efficiently delivered city services is driven largely by the number of people who are downtown. Over the decades that I have lived in downtown Edmonton, it has certainly seemed like we've been incrementally filling up with folks who choose to live, work, study, and play here. This is wonderful. Next slide, please. Uh, my partner told me to point this out. This is a great photo. You can actually see through Enbridge Tower here if you uh, didn't notice that. However, the bulk of weekday population remains to be workers in our office buildings, even after hybrid work measures have irrevocably changed the way companies use their office space. This has resulted in reduced office demand and a general oversupply of these sorts of buildings. The daily downtown population is at present still below the levels required to sustain the vibrancy that makes the entire ecosystem work. Next slide, please. A straightforward method to induce more people downtown is for me more people to simply live in the core. This will support that downtown energy that also supports the new generation of office workers. Next slide, please. In the current environment, due to the relationship, as you've heard, between construction costs and anticipated market rental rates, there are, number, there are numerous projects that are marginal or don't meet investor return expectations. These projects are simply not going to get built until the re rental rates those developments command grow beyond the growth in construction costs. TrioVest has its own potential residential development site downtown that is not viable at current costs and rates. Waiting for market conditions to solve this on their own simply means waiting a generation for these projects to appear. Uh, and while we wait, the uh, momentum of the downtown will continue to erode. Next slide, please. 
oh shoot, I sent you the wrong one. I was supposed to have a picture of, um, just imagine one of the downtown conversions in, in Calgary. It had lots of cool colors and stuff. Is, is just really inspiring and hopeful. So hold that in your head. There is hope. We have seen evidence from the federal GST removal and the Calgary Office Conversion Program referenced in an administration's report that a small investment from governments can tip the scales of marginal projects and provoke transformational projects. Edmonton has an opportunity to join the ranks of cities who've turned the decline of downtowns around with a surgical investment. This is the slide I meant to be on. I urge this committee to accept the recommendations of the Downtown Recovery Coalition to direct administration to devise a housing investment program for our downtown. Profitab profitability simply makes things happen. Without a return, investors are gonna invest their money in other jurisdictions. Further, municipalities are not foreign to programs that incite investments. Uh, we've got an economic development corporation through Edmonton Global. Uh, we've already talked about a bunch of catalyst projects that were certainly not costless for the city. Next slide, please. We're asking for a housing investment program that directly addresses the need to build more housing downtown without waiting for rental rates to increase. This will, increase, this will create more downtown housing within our generation and be a necessary component of, our, of this ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. We'll go next to Ms. Trimby, over to you. Hi there, good oh, morning. Dr. It's Trimby. a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed listening to the presentation so far. I've learned a lot. Uh, one thing that uh, has come up a fair bit is uh, how Calgary and Edmonton are different. And I wanna remind everybody here that uh, the city that Edmonton took great pride in announcing that uh, we were a UNESCO learning city and that unlike Calgary, we have a huge post-secondary presence downtown. So you may have read a lot in the news recently about student housing and how that is affecting um, uh, enrollments of international students and how some cities are really struggling. And what I say here at McEwen is we're not struggling right now, but it is about getting ahead of the curve. So right now, students make up about 10% of Edmonton's population, and these students represent the next generation of skilled talent leaders and entrepreneurs who will continue to drive our city and province forward. McEwen University on its own uh, attracts an average of 20,000 people to the core every day during its fall and winter terms. And we take great pride in our place in Ward O'Damon and our role in adding to the vibrancy and safety of the downtown. So we talked about uh, motion, you talked about keeping up the momentum. McEwen has plans to grow to 30,000 students by 2030. And interestingly, students do care about housing and that does affect their choice. Right now, about 60%, 65% of our students, 60% of our students live with family and relatives and about 32% are renting on and off campus. So if you do the arithmetic, um, and I recall Kaylin talked about 10,000 more units in the city plan going from 14,000 to 24,000, McEwen alone could actually, if those students chose to rent downtown, meet that supply, right? So that's kind of an interesting uh, coincidence. Universities build residences for students on their campuses. That usually works well for first and second year students, but it's not our preferred way of, of providing housing. Our preferred way is to partner and to have our students living in community in the mix per se. We think that gives them a more well-rounded experience. So I, I do want to say that um, university students like to live near campuses, but university students also do work integrated learning and that takes them off campuses, so public transit matters as well. So where will our extra 10,000 students live in 2030? I, I just think now is the time to start exploring these solutions because we've talked about the problem and we see the problem through different lenses and we see the problem through different time scales. I, I appreciate the need to really think long term. I, I heard this morning that housing development in Edmonton is quite cyclical and I heard about the new units coming on. I, I, I think what I, I'm an advocate for is let's not miss one of those cycles because we're, we need to be continuously adding to the stock because not only McEwen has plans to grow, Norquest has plans to grow, and I've heard time and time again for different people in, in the audience today how just getting people downtown you know, has this circular effect and solves a lot of the problems that we've all been talking about. So we wanna collaborate 
what does that collaboration look like? I've spoken to some developers. They just want to know what my aspirations are. They want to know how that fits into their aspirations. I've spoken to other developers that maybe want to do something a little more collaborative because they, they think we're in a better position to help them understand what students are looking for. I personally am not an advocate for isolated student living. I, I prefer multi-generational living. I prefer multi-market type type scenarios because I, I think that will help us produce better citizens, to be honest with you, than insinuating that life is in a residence. I'm looking at this guy. Why do I think he, he had a good time in residence? But, but anyways. <laughs> Anyways, so you know what, I, I, I feel for you, uh, uh, you know, I used to be uh, a Deputy Minister of Treasury Board and I, I know, you know, I used to tell people when they came in and asked for money, tell me what you want us to stop doing. I, I understand that the challenges that you're facing there, but, but I, I do think it's about retaining our competitiveness and remembering who we are and how we are different than Calgary and how proud we are that we are a learning city and thinking about the students that want to come here and providing them the right mix of housing options. So I don't want to weigh in in the per door. I, you know, I can't pretend to possibly answer all of those questions. You never know what will incent people to do what you need them to do. You never know, you know, it's always hard to anticipate unintended consequences. But it does sound like there's a menu of options, you're exploring them all, and that uh, you have some tough decisions to make. But I, I think the more we come together uh, and, and try and get to that 20, 20,000, I, I heard 40,000, if we had actually 40,000 people living downtown, everything would be all resolved. So that's really all, all I want to say, and I'm out of time. Great. Thank you, Dr. Trimby. Appreciate you being here. Uh, Mr. Shamshek, questions only. Okay. Uh, Mr. Campbell. Thank you very much. I do have a, a handout um, that I thought was interesting. Uh, if you want to, I don't know if I want to do a quick... How does it go? Uh, good morning to uh, the Mayor and Urban Planning Committee. My name is Jared Campbell. I'm a Vice President at uh, Avis & Young, one of the major brokerages here in town. I've been a longtime advocate for downtown. I've participated in conversations such as this for over a decade. Uh, despite some of the negativity today, our downtown and our city centre has come a long way since we first started having these conversations. Uh, but it's certainly true that we have lost the momentum that we had pre-pandemic. Uh, through this evolution over the years, uh, one thing has been consistent, and that has been municipal support. Uh, although it would be great if the market alone could create the vibrant, vibrant and attractive downtown we'd all love, unfortunately there are historic and structural factors that strongly push against uh, the development of our downtown. But it's important work to support. A strong and vibrant downtown centers much of its efforts that this and previous councils have done to create a more compact, sustainable, and urban city. An attractive downtown is a key amenity to making our infill more attractive. I was here speaking last week, the zoning bylaw renewal, I said it would be very incremental change. Part of the reason is our century city center neighborhoods are not particularly attractive compared to what you can get in the suburbs. The conversation downtown helps to drive more infill, helps to encourage companies to locate themselves at the nexus of our transit system, helps us become less car dependent. Uh, downtown is a key cycling destination uh, that will support our, our bike plan. And of course, it is the center of our arts, culture, and tourism economy. Um, and at this point, the arc of our downtown, we need to support and build more housing. That's sort of the, the shift that, we, that we've seen and a lot of people are speaking to. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit to the fiscal analysis that keeps comes up and I'm sure I'll have some more questions. I'm really disappointed to see the fiscal analysis that was done. If you're gonna, if administration is going to come together and put together something that they're going to present as an IRR, it's imperative that they include all of the factors included. If you're going to look at a project compared to another project, you need to include everything that's gonna go into that. They took a couple of factors, put it into a spreadsheet, and gave you guys an IRR. That is not reflective of reality. For example, and it was not really spoken to in the report, but it was spoken to a little bit uh, during the presentation, on office conversions, one of the key reasons we would do this is to change the assessment value of the rest of the non-converted office market. We could put a dollar value to that. Uh, the presentation I handed out was from when Calgary looked at this. They made that very clear distinction. They took the number of grants and it showed whatever analysis they did, the, the grant was going to pay for itself by an increase in assessment. Whether or not that's true or not here, there was some, some separation between the two cities and I totally get that, but we should have taken a shot at it. Um, we sort of said this notion, oh, well, you know, we'll just increase property taxes in the rest of the city on non-commercial and that won't have an effect. It may not have an effect on the property taxes we gather, but the, every time we increase property taxes in the rest of the city, it pushes our industrial, especially outside of the city boundaries, so we do need to consider that. 
uh, on new residential, the big missing piece, we seem to say, well, we've got 200 units uh, in downtown or not, but the reality is, is we're a growing city. This is growth management. It's more like, where are those 200 units gonna go? And that's the missing piece. So when we're gonna fit, look at something like IRR, we'll say, okay, well, 200 units downtown isn't a yes or no, it's 200 downtown, or is it 200 in the greenfield? And what is that cost over, over the lifetime of this building? Those folks that live downtown are gonna look, be far more likely to walk and bike. We don't need any new libraries, we don't need any new fire stations, we don't need any new police hall, police stations. Uh, if those units are in the greenfield, that's not the case. And every year after that, you need to plow more roads and build more roads, and so you know a true IRR would have to factor those in. Uh, so I, you know, and again, you're kind of, you're flying a little blind because the math I don't think has been done properly. And I think if we did the math properly, we'd find that there could be a real win-win here. We could find that the, the, the quantitative stuff that a lot of people talked about, a vibrant downtown, an attractive city center, and how that drives investment and how it drives that, but the math also might work as well if we actually dug in and did it. Um, you know, I also kind of just, before we go, I want to talk a little bit about timing. I think that when we talk about office conversions, the timing is really critical. There are a number of office buildings in downtown that are in special uh, servicing, facing bankruptcy. The valuations are dropping pretty rapidly. That would all come into effect next year as assessments are done and appeals are all done next spring uh, on these new values of office buildings. So there's a bit of sort of critical timing, uh, especially on the office conversion grant. And, you know, Finally, uh, on new housing, I think there's a number of creative tools we should look at. I don't think that this is the only one. I think a grant is preferable, but we've got a tight budget, and I think we can look at some other things like property tax abatements. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McBrien. Hello. Thank you. Uh, hello, members of the Urban Planning Committee and Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Thank you for hearing all of us today. Uh, my name is Panita McBrien. I'm the executive director of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association. And I just want to um, just make one point that while developers are certainly one of our key stakeholders, um, I represent all of the businesses downtown. And in Edmonton, as is the case in most of Alberta, we're mostly talking about small to medium sized businesses. I have maybe 20 large corporations on my entire member list. The other, you know, 1,150 are small to medium sized businesses. So that is who I'm speaking for today. Um, I, I wanted to talk a lot about what's at stake today, but I have the benefit and the curse of being at the end of the day. I feel like we've made that point again and again and again. Um, I think you all know what's at stake. I think that's why Council has invested so much, both money and, and other types of resources in our downtown over the last decade. Um, but I do want to take a minute to address some of uh, the questions that were asked to the previous panel and some of the other comments that have been made today. So one, um, I fully understand that this is a really tough pill to swallow for a lot of you, this idea of a program like this and where the money goes and where money could be going. Um, and and Councillor Rutherford, earlier you mentioned the idea of, you know, what's, what's the best use of public dollars and, and Councillor Jan Jans mentioned, you know, we get no equity in these buildings. There are other models in, in the states, and I, I have the privilege in this job of talking to my colleagues all over North America that are grappling with all the same challenges we are. Um, and what they do in a lot of municipalities is take even bigger risks with public dollars. There are some cities, like my colleagues in Memphis, um, they don't have any, or they've turned it around now, but you know, five to 10 years ago, they didn't have any capital willing to solve these challenges. They didn't have any capital willing to build residential and save dilapidated old falling down buildings. So they had to create a, a downtown development corporation and the city took on all of the risk of developing those properties, um, which in the end worked out for them, but it's a really tough pill for, for the public to swallow. It's way more money to spend. It's hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, plus you know the risk of, of taking on that debt. Um, but that's what some other cities have done. So I know we've done a lot uh, and I know this, this incentive program seems like a lot more, but when I'm comparing it to what I've seen other cities do to solve these problems, to get more people into their downtowns, there are bigger dollar amounts than this being spent and even riskier and less ideal models being used, uh, in my opinion. They're, they do exist, I'm happy to chat more at a later date about some of that, but this is a program that recognizes 
that we have willing investors here still today. And, and Kaylin talked about that earlier. Capital can go anywhere, and we're seeing it leave. One of the buildings I was most excited about, one of the development permits I was most excited about in our downtown, I just found out that building, that site is now up for sale because that developer has land and, and buildings going up in Victoria and Vancouver and all over the US, and frankly, it's just higher rental rates and it's a better market, so they're not gonna build here. Um, when we challenge Edmonton Global for, in my opinion, not spending quite as much time as I would like on foreign direct investment attraction for our downtown, we're told our downtown is not investment ready. So there's a reason that a program like this is necessary. We don't, we, we cannot afford to sit back and wait for the private market to do what it's gonna do, and Kaylin made that point. Like, we could just sit back and wait. We've been staring at that lot that um, Mike put into his presentation for many years, and there's nothing that tells me that that building is gonna get built anytime soon without really significant interventions from the public sector. I also just really want to emphasize, we've talked a lot about intergovernmental uh, uh, relationships here. I th I th that can't be understated because we fully understand the really precarious financial position the city is in. We have to go to other orders of government. The White House just announced their whole plan and gigantic fund for funding office conversions across the US. So the White House is doing this directly. Um, I know the federal government will have an appetite for it if we can advocate for it in a smart way. Um, I also think the province will. I participated in the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Economic Recovery Working Group that the province did, that uh, Malcolm Bruce and Lisa Burley chaired, and we put a residential incentive as one of our recommendation, recommendations in that report. I would love to take that report back to the Minister of Jobs, Economy and Trade and say, City Council wants to do this program. You accepted our recommendation to do this program two years ago please give us some money to do this. So we'd love to be your partner on that. I don't think this is something that the city has to pay for uh, in total, and I don't think we can afford to not do it. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your comments. We're, we're just trying to manage agenda um, management. Are both of our last speakers able to come back after lunch? Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, uh, Bradley, are you online? Yes, I'm here. And are you able to come back after lunch? I can, for sure. Okay. Well, then, I think um, we will just stop here, and we'll come back uh, when we can give you both your full five minutes. And um, I hope our other panelists are able to join us as well for questions. Uh, and But if not, we really appreciate your comments that you've been able to provide so far. Thank you. Uh, we're on recess now until 1.30.
Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to Urban Planning Committee. Thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. I'll invite our last panel to come come back. We'll hear from our last two speakers. Um, Ken, I realize, I don't, is your last name Taves or to yes, sir, Taves? Perfect, okay. Uh, well, welcome. Um, I'll give you a moment to get settled, but over to you whenever you're ready. You'll have your five minutes. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Brad LaFortune, and then we will go to questions of our panel. Uh, so whenever, whenever you're ready, Mr. Taves. No pressure. Oh, I should do a roll call. While you're getting set up, I'll do a quick roll call uh, of committee members. Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. And then we are also joined online uh, by our colleagues. Um, uh, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Um, and I see the mayor is on the, the line. I'm not sure if he's able, joining us virtually or uh, I believe he'll be back in person shortly. Okay, great. Well, with that, over to you. Oh, you just need to click your... Oh, sorry. There we go. You usually don't need a mic. Mike, you sound fairly loud. But uh, anyway, I was interested in uh, Mayor Soe's uh, comment about putting $1.4 billion into the downtown. He'll probably enjoy this. I think Calgary put in one point one one billion. So again, it's not just the hockey team that wins. So uh, yeah. So anyway, we're a strategic group. We're a, uh, a, a developer. We're one of the leading developers in, in office conversions, and we've done we completed three already, uh, and we've got another one in the construction uh, process, and we've got another three that are ready to go in for permitting. Uh, and those are subject to, to funding. Um, and yeah, we, we don't have a firm candidate in Edmonton, but we would like to do some in Edmonton. Uh, our, we've, we've done two in Edmonton already, and uh, we like those, and those, that was without a subsidy, uh, but it was different times, because the interest rates were ultra low, and construction costs were 30% less. So, uh, uh, and, uh, like conversions, uh, anybody that hasn't done them, uh, you always run into problems. It, it's a renovation, so uh, the heritage one that we're doing right now in Calgary, it's structural issues, footing issues, it's you name it, it it's there. Uh, so you don't have quite the same problems with a, a typical conversion, uh, but there are problems and lots of unexpected. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're passionate about uh, the city's down, downtown cities in Canada in general, we, we're a big believer in them. We think they're the heart of a city. If you don't have a, a great downtown, you're, you'll never really get there. Um, the, uh, and I guess, I, guess um, I, I agree with most of the economics that people talked about today, so I won't get into those, uh, but uh, a lot of our passion for conversions is, is not so much the economic side, it's, it's more what it does for downtowns and, you know, the vibrancy, we've talked about vibrancy already, so I uh, won't talk any more about that. Safety, we've talked about, that That doesn't really have to be talked about. Uh, environmental, we've touched on, but it's significant. And uh, in the four conversions, uh, we're gonna uh, save about 17,000 tons of CO2 uh, versus tearing it down and, and building a new one. And of the four conversions, we're gonna save 56,000 tons of building materials going to the dump. So it's, it's significant. It, it's, uh, uh, maybe there's some environmental money to go after for conversions, because it, it, uh, it is very significant. Uh, just to put the uh, 17,000 tons of CO2 emissions, that would be the equivalent of taking 3,500 cars off the road in one year. So it's, 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 a, it's a big number. Um, the other thing is, is, there was talk about affordable rents, uh, and that's, that's an important uh, piece uh, of a downtown, anywhere actually, doesn't matter whether it's downtown or sub suburbs. Uh, conversions are better that way too as well, because the rents that you get on a conversion are lower than a brand new building, and that just makes, makes sense. So, um, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. 
our conversions, any of the ones that we do, are CMHC finance, and we use the MLI select program. So 25% of the units are, are affordable. Uh, so that's 30%. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, 30% lower than what the uh, uh, the uh, average uh, average income in, in the city. Sorry, I've, I've got that wrong, but as you can tell, I'm probably not a financial guy. So, um, so yeah, so they're, they're, they're good that way. Um, one of the other things we found in, in uh, Edmonton is that uh, we've got a big percentage of students in our buildings, and, uh, which, is, which is great. They're, uh, uh, they, you know, create some energy. They're great for the city because they, they go out in the streets and they, uh, uh, they create a lot of uh, vibrancy in the streets. They, they go out more than a, a typical adult would. And uh, the other good thing is they don't need big fridges because it's pizza box and beer, right? So, um, so, so I think um, you know the the housing crisis is a problem that we're is going to get worse and worse as we go on. Uh, and there's just problem is there's not enough supply, and not enough supply that's going to come on. And the high interest rates have, have slowed that supply even more. So uh, the good thing with conversions is they're a lot quicker to get occupancy. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our conversions we did in 16, oh, sorry. Sorry, you're just at your time now, um, so I'll oh, have to okay, stop okay, you there, yep, but okay. uh, yeah, okay, I really yep, appreciate no the presentation, okay, thank you. Uh, great, and I'll go to our last speaker, uh, Brad, it's over, over to you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Uh, my name is Brad LaFortune. I'm here from Public Interest Alberta today. Um, I'm here to speak against the proposal to incent office conversions with Edmontonians tax dollars today. Um, I'll be brief. I don't think I'll take my full, whole five minutes, but uh, it's good. It's happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, everyone. It's kind of a spooky proposal. So I think it's pretty fitting that it's uh, Halloween today. Um, you know, I, and I, I just want to make a joke. I hope everyone's feeling uh, jovial today, but I was thinking about going as a developer this year and instead of asking for candy, I was going to ask for a hundred bucks for every square inch of my pillowcase, but I'm a little bit too old for that. So maybe I'll get my daughter to dress up as a developer here, but let's be honest. This uh, proposal is a bit of a trick. It's not a treat, at least not for Edmontonians and their tax dollars. Um, I just want to start by thanking working families, Edmonton. They've done tremendous work on this issue, educating and engaging, engaging average Edmontonians on housing affordability in this uh, office conversion proposal. Um, my conversations uh, with Edmontonians have been very clear on this issue so far. Um, they're concerned about the use of tax dollars to go directly to developers with little to no evidence that this proposal will benefit Edmontonians when it comes to affordability, accessibility, um, the proper kinds of built form when it comes to housing downtown and the quality of life in the downtown core. Um, I also want to mention there's also the challenge of scope and misapplication of policy levers to address the housing crisis here in Edmonton. We've heard a lot of speakers here today uh, talk about the housing crisis. Uh, we look at the current vacancy rate, for example, um, which isn't quite reflective of what we see when Calgary passed a similar proposal. Um, and, you know, the current vacancy rate, and if we think about sort of market sort of responses to the current, sorry about that, uh, to the current reality of Edmonton, the, the lower rents and the renegotiations of lease agreements are benefiting nonprofits and small businesses who are looking for affordable spaces uh, to rent downtown as well. So, you know, maybe we should let the market do what the market does best. Um, I also just want to mention that I don't think lower corporate profits when it comes to uh, management companies and developers is the responsibility of working, working families in Edmonton. Um, certainly not the working families that we're talking to. So counter to developers' opinions here today, uh, tax dollars being used for, quite frankly, their failure to plan for any changes in our economy is not the responsibility of hardworking Edmontonians. And you know, as, Cart as uh, Councillor Cartmel has mentioned uh, recently, um, when we're talking about our budget conversations coming up here at the city of Edmonton, Edmontonians are struggling with affordability and with a difficult conversation about our priorities when it comes to our budget, I can tell you pretty emphatically that the average working Edmontonian that I'm hearing from are not on board with direct subsidies to developers that might pan out in the next five to 10 to 15 years when it comes to conversions. And what's more, when it comes to the dividends that will be paid out, 
according to administration's own report, which I know we've all poured over the last uh, week or so, we're going to be looking at 94 to 125 years before this handout would be able to pay dividends. So, I mean, that's a long time. It requires a pretty big crystal ball. I know it's Halloween, but um, I don't think that we can really make those kinds of uh, uh, policy outcome predictions in that kind of a horizon. Um, you know, obviously dealing with safety issues downtown is an important goal. We want to increase the amount of people using and living in the area. It's crucial that we develop our downtown in a responsible way, absolutely. But providing corporate welfare to profitable corporations is not the proper mechanism to use. The city owns office space. It could be consolidated uh, into the Edmonton Tower, for example. That's another policy we could look at. And we should be using our public money on bringing more people downtown in a way that would uh, allow for uh, those kinds of decisions uh, from property management companies to developers and builders to be natural according to you know market pressures. Um, and I just want to just want to pause here on the consultation. You know, it's interesting to me. I'm just going over you know Appendix Four, and when when you look at the the organizations who have been consulted, you've got CBRE, UDI, BOMA. Um, we've also heard from NAOP today, the Chamber of Commerce. These are all, you know, legitimate stakeholders with a direct or indirect interest in this conversation. But I would just encourage uh, councillors and administration to engage other organizations and people with lived experience who are really facing the housing crisis today. And for us to look to those organizations and individuals for a conversation about how they're feeling this crunch right now um, so that we can have, you know, other considerations uh, when it comes to addressing affordability and the housing crisis. One thing that I would really like for us to look at is developing underutilized land like parking lots, which I know is coming up in the new year for consideration. And so my recommendation and my message to council today and to the Urban Planning Committee is, sure, receive this report for information, but quite frankly, now is not the time to be giving out handouts to developers. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Well, we've heard from all of our speakers, so I'll just ask my colleagues to sign up for questions of our panel. Councillor Cartmel, I think you were up. Oh. Over to you. Thank you. So, um, uh, appreciate everybody's comments today. Um, maybe I'll go to you, Mr. Campbell, to start with. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to recall what you said two hours ago, oddly enough. Uh, so I, get, I think what I understood you to say was that, you know, there is perhaps more analysis that might be offered. And I wonder if there's not something that speaks to the combination of uh, rent plus transportation costs that someone might experience. I'm not sure, sure if that was exactly your point, but somebody living in the core uh, that makes use of a building that's already here, uh, the bike paths, the transit routes, the streets, the uh, all of the utilities, uh, as opposed to building a brand new unit out in some of the neighborhoods I represent, quite frankly, uh, that there's a cost uh, analysis that might go with that that hasn't been offered yet is that fair to say yeah yeah absolutely um i mean growth isn't free we this is not the first time this has come up in council and this is sort of an ongoing conversation for a lot of years and where we put growth has a different effect it's obviously not the same cost for us to run city services to different parts of town and yeah somebody in a tower downtown you know if you were going to run the numbers you'd say okay what's the upfront cost well we're not again we're not building new libraries we're not building new fire stations and on an ongoing basis, these these folks are more likely to walk. They're more likely to bike. You know, we, and you know that that translates into lower snow clearing costs. That translates into a lot of other costs. And the decision necessarily isn't necessarily, you know, yes or no downtown. I mean, we're we're growing. We're growing rapidly. There's a, a lot of people moving here, and that's the analysis that seems to be missing. Where where should those folks live, to lower the cost to the city? Right? What's that number? Right? And so when you run an IRR, you know, in year five, when you've got a, you know, a 200 unit tower downtown, or you've got a 200 unit tower or uh, complex in the suburbs, you know, those are not the same cost to operate. And, you know, are we considering that when we consider this? Like, you know, we say, well, you know, a grant will subsidize some of this, but we're, I mean, we're subsidizing a lot of different development and growth and where it goes. So, you know, hard to say exactly what that number is without doing the, doing the math. And I don't think, like, I, there's a financial thing there, but I'm not, I don't think I hear you saying that we should be migrating uh, investments in some of the things that we're going to have to do in places outside the downtown and migrate them to downtown. It, like we're, 
kind of dance, not even dancing around, the, the, the hard part of this conversation is finding the funding source that permits uh, grants or subsidies or, or advantages or however we want to phrase that. Uh, and I'm not hearing a suggestion that we migrate dollars from other investments to this. It's more a matter of uh, what do we support or what do we enhance. Maybe I'm getting that wrong. We, we have effectively, there's two things that I, I'm hearing. One is um, effectively a tax deferral for new construction. And the previous panel talked about there not being enough of a delta between the baseline uh, value of a property before it gets a building versus the baseline value of a property that has a building. There, there might not be enough lift. So maybe that's a new construction thing is the tax deferral program. And then perhaps there's a redirection of CRL investments into office activations. Are there any other financial models that we should be looking at that, that migrate dollars into uh, the realization of office conversions or more residents downtown? Yeah, I mean, well, the, we're talking about direct grants on the table, property direct tax dollars. deferrals. Yeah. Um, you could reduce permit fees if you wanted to. Um, you know, there's some sewer line charges and trunk charges that you could reduce. You know, there's, you know, getting into, you know, rent vouchers is really more provincial jurisdiction, but you know, there's a bunch of different tools that you can look at that would try to to change the math, right? And, you know, so right now the market will go where the market pushes it and it's pushing it out of downtown and that comes at a cost to this city. And so if we can find different ways to push it into downtown, over the long run, we save money. Are those other measures that you just sort of rattled off, are they as significant uh, in, in terms of... Uh, catalyzing development in the downtown core as as effectively the direct subsidies or the or the dollars either the dollars directed or the dollars saved on development downtown like i'm not sure the permit fees are a huge amount as an example yeah i mean every yeah. everything helps right everything you know, helps. every developer has a performa and they've got certain anticipated revenue and certain anticipated costs and anything you can do to reduce the cost or increase the revenue is going to help that and every time you put a dollar on either side, you know, it puts a project closer and closer to viability or across the line of viability and gets built. And so, you know, that's very project specific. So it's hard to say, you know, maybe there's a project out there that if you cut the permit fees to nothing, that was what it took to get it across the line. But mm -hmm. yeah, like a, a smaller subsidy is going to affect fewer projects and a larger subsidy is going to affect more projects. And it's, right. it's, you know, very project specific. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Tang? Great, thank you. Um, maybe I'll start with Mike. Um, as a resident of downtown, um, you know, given the conversation earlier around, okay, so let's look at the projects that's left in the CRL. A lot of those are public realm projects. Um, and maybe this will emerge as the next biggest priority. As a resident, that will also mean losing the prospect of all these, you know, public realm initiative that could improve your quality of life and your neighbors so that we can have another tower that's converted. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Sure, certainly I'm looking forward to seeing all the projects on the list uh, being built. My favorite one is the 100th Street Bridge, but I guess I'm alone in that. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, it, the, the view is what's going to make everything feasible, including future private development, future public projects, et cetera, is going to be a higher population downtown. That's what's going to drive uh, interesting retailers. Like there's no, aside from uh, uh, the Helm, which is a great store, I just can't personally afford to shop there. I would love to see like some other clothing store here. And what we need is uh, more people to make that viable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and then, Punita, just very quickly on that Nashville, can you just like reiterate some of those numbers you mentioned? It was Memphis, oh, Memphis. and I don't Memphis. have any of the specific numbers oh, okay. in front of me, but I can email. Oh, okay, either. I thought you rattled off a few numbers, and I wasn't quick enough to catch those. But I know, um, I know it's hundreds of millions over the course of the first decade, but I don't know how many. I don't know if it was two hundred million or. But I, I can find. And I can they dig didn't that have any municipal investment upfront. They did. They did. They okay. created the, the the downtown development corporation with municipal funds, and I believe they had not federal not not necessarily specifically to office conversion, but like sort of a it was broader a, it was program. a blight fighting initiative was their main priority at the time. So it was buying up essentially a modern version of that, or mm, okay. now what we're talking about is a modern version of what they did. So it was buying up old properties that no one else was dealing with. Okay, and then Ken, um, 
you said you had three, you've done three projects, you have three in the making, and these are in other cities. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, two were in Edmonton. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I toured it, and, you know, great story there, and I thought it was very impressive that you had mentioned you had no government subsidy for all those projects. If you were to do those projects now, whatever, like if, if you were to do two new projects now, would you be able to do it? Yeah, def definitely not. Uh, and it, it, it's because of interest rates, they, they have a huge impact on your returns and then uh, the increased construction costs. Uh, and the, tour, the project we toured capital, we uh, were able to secure that uh, the lands and building at a, a, a way below market cost. We had vacant land that we could utilize. So uh, yeah, I guess we, we try every strategy we can to make conversions work. And we have been successful without, uh, without incentives. Uh, our construction and project, our project mm -hmm. and construction right now uh, is is getting eight and a half million in in subsidy. It's a heritage project, but uh, and to tell you the honest truth, that that's not we're in, we're in the middle of construction now, so we can't change it. But the interest rates have changed in that in that yeah. period, so the return <laughs> is not going to be yeah. good at all. Um, so thank uh, you, yeah, thank you. And I think your projects are also fairly high occupancy as well. Lots of students to reflect. You know what Dr. Trimby said earlier. Um, yeah, for, actually, that's uh, a. Yeah, sorry. The, uh, I'm gonna. I, I'm. Oh, I, I oh. have one more speaker <laughs> that I want to talk to. Um, Bradley, um, you know, I appreciate your presentation and probably agree with a lot of what you said. Um, but one thing I wanted to just hear more about is, you know, you talk about it's not just about engaging industry, but also people with lived experience, those who are really struggling with housing. I mean, uh, we just went through a fairly significant public hearing on citywide zoning reform. We heard a lot of that. And it wasn't just focused on non-market affordable housing, but a more, uh, I guess, efficient market, uh, right? Housing market, um, and supply is re it, it. It was very much part of that conversation. Wondering, you know, how do you, how do you like, how do you respond to, you know, feedback that we need more housing, period. And this offers one avenue. Right. Um I mean, absolutely, we need more housing stock. Uh, that's that's a, that's that's an obvious, you know, reality in Edmonton, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada wide, right? We need two million homes over the next seven mm -hmm. years in this decade, right? In the two million homes plan. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, I don't know if that. I mean, that answers your 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 your, your question, Councillor Tang. But if I may respond to the the general sort of concern that we're hearing about engagement. Um, I, I would suggest. You sorry, know, I'm actually mm -hmm. out of time. Maybe I'll come back and I'll oh, let you sorry, finish that if, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Councillor Tang. Mayor Sohi. Thank you. Uh, to start with Dr. Annette uh, Trimby, thank you for joining us and everyone joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, on student housing, uh, uh, if I hear you correctly, you are saying that the number of growth, the amount of growth that we're seeing in the student population. Uh, additional rental supply in downtown will be absorbed. Yes, just McEwen alone yeah. with our projections to 30,000 students and the fact that one third of them rent. Um, and again, will they live downtown? Will they live in the suburbs? I don't know. It all depends on, on the, the choices they have. Mm -hmm. But that fills that 10,000 gap that uh, Kaylin mentioned. Yes. And I've heard someone else from the U of A talk about ideally we need 40,000 people living downtown. Right. So, so the supply is there. And I, I, you know, our students are not all of one mind in terms of what type yes. of housing they need. But there's enough growth in the, in the population at McCune, at Northwest, uh, yes. you know, and also having our downtown connected through LRT to other post-secondary institutions. Exactly. There are op options that uh, students would have if more supply is available in downtown. And I have a mo actually made a motion a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago during the zoning regulation stuff mm -hmm. uh, on coordinate, having some more coordination on with the administration and stakeholders on student student housing. Now, thank you for, uh, you also mentioned about partnership. Like why, why is it that post-secondaries are not investing as much now as they used to in creating student housing on campus? I will say that not all student housing is created equal. Hmm. So we have an 875 um, residence unit on McEwen's campus. 
And in those uh, units, there are actually separate bedrooms and a kitchen, and our students aren't forced to buy a meal plan. So for us to invest in the residents on campus, we do have access to um, relatively inexpensive uh, financing, uh, but we also um, have to make revenue, and then it's on the province's books. It gets very, very complicated. Oh, okay. So there's financial reasons, but I think about it more in terms of um, what's ideal for students, and I think it's better for students to be a part of community rather than live just with students. Got it. On, on that, like you mentioned mixed housing, you know, students mm. living along you know, people with low income or, you know, we have affordable housing need. We also have supportive housing need. We need a lot of supportive housing with the wraparound services. Is that the kind of model you're talking about in a way that everyone living together doesn't matter which, which background they're from, right? Well, I will note this is a different market and I'm going to refer to my time at a different university. And you mentioned a, a downtown renewal corporation. At the previous university I was at, we created a community renewal corporation and we brought in people with development expertise and we brought in community and we actually built three 200 residential units within five minutes of the university mm -hmm. with inexpensive federal financing. So, and, and from a community perspective, when you walked in, you didn't know if you were visiting somebody who was mm -hmm. getting a rent supplement or somebody who was paying market rates and there, there were considerations for design to bring community together. That's a different place, that's yeah. a different time. Uh, what would work here? Here I understand a lot of the private developers that want to talk to us, you know, they, they just want to know what we need, mm. right? So, so how can we help them de-risk? Because this is really about vision and de-risking. The, yeah. the whole conversation is about what are our different roles in, in de-risking, what we all know to be the right thing, because yeah. everybody would agree we need more housing. Okay. Thank you. And uh, over to Panita. Um, are our investments in downtown working? Because I hear constantly the downtown is dead, right? I think that's a self-defeating narrative. We I would agree with you on that. I would also say we're not alone in still feeling like our downtown is dead. You know, when I talk to my colleagues across the country, we could walk around in a downtown and feel like, oh, this feels great, but everyone local still feels like they've got a long way to go because we're all comparing ourselves to where we were 2018, 2019. Yeah. So, so the reality is that we do still have a very long way to go. Absolutely. But to answer your question, yes, I, you know, I think you know I've been working really closely with administration on all things downtown vibrancy, everything that you've invested in downtown, um, for the most part, I've been a part of. And I'm really proud of, and you should all be really proud of, a lot of the work that's happened. The Downtown Vibrancy Fund has made such a difference. Like I shudder to think where we would be in terms of vibrancy and activity yeah. and some investment without, without some of those investments that have been made. Um, but I think it was said earlier today, it's just that when I look to my colleagues in other cities, the moves being made are just so much bigger, like magnitudes bigger, mm -hmm. because there's so much at stake. Okay, I'm already so, done, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Really appreciated the, the, the mm -hmm. discussion points. I think I got to dig into some of my uh, questions with the other panel. Um, but maybe, you know, Panita, I appreciate your point around, we are in a scenario where we do have private capital that's, that is on deck. Um, as opposed to not having any of that and trying to attract it to begin with. So has there been any conversations, and I should have asked that you asked the last panel as well, just in terms of what um, amount of private investment we would be leveraging potentially? That's a very good question that I don't have the answer to, but one thing I did want to say when I was speaking and I missed it is just that it is remarkable that pretty much everyone who's spoken today and everyone that I know of who is still trying to make something work. Mm -hmm. These are family offices. These are local investors. These are not big corporations. These are not foreign you know, real estate investment trusts. Those guys are all gone. Mm -hmm. um, no one foreign is trying to spend money in Edmonton downtown right now. I just need to make that very clear. Mm -hmm. So all of these people that are here are local developers who have personal emotional reasons that they're still trying to make this work. And I'm, I'm sure the number is, it's, in, it's probably over a billion, I don't know, but I'm not the right person to ask that question. Yeah, well I think, I think something for us to, to follow up on, because I think, you know, again, we're talking about, there, there's different ways to look at what we're leveraging and what our return on investment is, and I think that's an important number for us to have. Um, maybe just to Mr. Uh, LaFortune online, 
you know, I, I take, take the points that you're making. I think the opportunity I see is that um, providing an incentive also provides us with an opportunity to set some conditions and parameters, so potentially leveraging affordable housing um, out of this investment. So do you feel, like, do you see that there can be public benefit through, through that mechanism potentially? Um, sh sure, I'll be brief. I would say that we definitely need a very stringent definition of affordable housing that is applied to any partners who are developing uh, housing, whether it's downtown or otherwise when it comes to dealing with our uh, affordable housing wait list and the crisis that we're seeing uh, across the city. Absolutely. I don't think that personally shoehorning that um, aspect of the policy into this proposal is the right fit. Um, but I do think that we definitely need a very stringent definition of affordable housing for sure. And, and why is that? Like, I think, I think what I struggle with is, you know, I think administration is flagging that, you know, providing grant funding for units in the downtown, we do get fewer units per dollar. But for me, there's that really important geographic um, equity piece that, that every neighborhood has, has a proportion of affordable housing so that those who are living on low income have a choice of which neighborhoods they're living in. And I just don't know that that affordable housing development can happen in the downtown otherwise like because these are more major projects they require a huge amount of equity and i don't know that a lot of our nonprofits would be would be positioned to, to take that on well yeah i don't know that might be a question to ask our nonprofits i'm not sure if that's if they're here today to speak to that but i would be really interested to see if that were a possibility Okay, okay, well that's that's great. I think those are all the questions that I'll have for now. Again, really appreciate everyone coming out. I'll go next to Councillor Wright for questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just, Mr. Taves, if I could ask you, in, in the presentation by administration, it, it showed us a, a chart, CMHC's um, uh, vacancy rate and average rent. And I'm just wondering, it shows here average rents in the city I mean, around the $1,300 mark. You, you mentioned that you've got a property or a couple properties that rent to students. What would the average rent for a two bedroom in those, in those well, buildings be? That, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I wish, I, I don't actually know the, uh, the number for that. Uh, what I can tell you is that the CMHC stats, they uh, go through all types of properties. So it, it could be a, a building that's 60 years old or it could be a brand new building. So. The stats are somewhat misleading. Um, the the rents could be uh, lower in uh, certain areas of the city, whereas they, they're higher in other areas of the city. Um, what I do know is that uh, our rents are uh, significantly less than, than new builds downtown. And uh, we have a pretty big portion of students in our buildings. And the, uh, the one building we have is 95% occupied. The other building is 100% occupied. So uh, we could build another 10, 10 buildings in, in the downtown, and I think we'd see absorption uh, be taken up in the, in the next few years. Uh, okay, okay people, thank you. Uh, my next question then um, is for Ms. Trimby. Um, so your student housing um, is quite a bit less than that, that $1,300 average, right? Yes, but... For, I, I, I think bedroom suite. I'm, I'm looking online. It looks to be about maybe between the seven and eight hundred dollars a month. Yes. Uh, what students pay in residence is less. What they get is less, though. And, and I mean that works well for first and second year students. And some of our students um, are married with families, so you know that sort of residence model fits with people right out of high school. It doesn't necessarily fit with people coming back, right? Right. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how affordable. Some of these these new conversions would be for for students. Yeah. So I, I again uh, for the developers, you know, obviously um, I'm hoping that you're considering quite a range of affordabilities and what this other market. And again, I, I heard somebody mention rent supplements. I was at the throne speech yesterday. I heard um, a reference to twelve 
5,000 new units attached to rent supplements attached to existing buildings and 25,000 new homes. I don't know where they are, but it does sound like the, the province wants to invest. I know in my conversations with federal officials, they want to invest. So you, you are right, uh, Councillor Wright, <laughs> that you know, students are obviously looking for uh, really low, uh, low rents to the degree possible, right? Yeah, and I saw some of those announcements earlier before the throne speech last week saying, yeah, they were, and they were in more of the rural areas as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering how much something like this conversion would, would actually impact and, and help our students, especially when, you know, you say that there's, it could fill that, that 10,000, um, the demand would be there to fill that 10,000 gap. So, um, okay, thank you very much. Maybe I'll just um, give the rest of my time to Mr. LaFortune. You you were talking about um, your general general concern about engagement. What are your concerns? Well, I just I I just don't know uh, where where are people who are looking for affordable housing you know today. I know the zoning bylaw renewal kind of really took flight, and you had over two hundred people speak last week or whatever it was, but. Uh, what I see here today is a, a lot of people who have development interests and, you know, maybe they're local now and not foreign. I don't think that's material, but if we're talking about accountability to Edmontonians, I can tell you the people that we're hearing from don't want to see tax dollars doled out to developers without a definition of affordability, uh, what these units are going to be used for, how big they're going to be, if there's going to be mixed, you know, mixed form, one, two, three bedrooms, what's their actual need, what problem are we trying to solve? And so I think if you broaden the scope of the consultation, you'd hear from a lot of other folks, people who are actually in need of affordable housing, who would say that, this proposal is just throwing good money after bad, quite frankly. And affordable housing isn't necessarily affordable market housing. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, if you look at, you know, I, I work a lot with, you know, folks at the National Right to Housing Network, and the definition of affordable housing needs to be really stringently set at the federal level. And if it's not, the city should have a really clear definition of what that is. And it's not a certain percentage below the median income or the average rent, but it's if people are spending more than 30% of their take home, that's not affordable, adequate housing. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, Mr. LaFortune, I'll, I'll, I'll just maybe continue with you. I wanted to just double check because I, I think, well, I don't, I will say I agree with you in that um, if the proposal before us today was to increase property taxes to fund this, I don't think I, I could support that in part because I don't know where the money's going to come from. <laughs> we're already at where we're at. But there is a difference. We're talking about the CRL. And, and yes, we can argue that's still technically taxes, but it's taxes that get to be used for a very defined set of, of areas. Um, uh, and unfortunately, from what I understand, affordable housing isn't even one of those areas in the CRL. Uh, we've had that conversation before. And so we're left with a very narrow scope of what is the best use of those ongoing CRL dollars. And today, in today's conversation, we've heard obviously from the developer, yeah, so set that aside, but we've heard from the Downtown Business Association representing small and, and medium-sized businesses. We've heard from folks that live in the core who say, of the limited things you can spend that money on, this would be the top priority for them. So I guess I would, wouldn't mind getting your thoughts on that, recognizing that what's not being asked for is a property tax increase to, to fund this because we don't have that money. That's not before us. It's this limited pocket. Sure. Yeah. If I can respond to that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going deep into my, my memory of first having conversations with you all about using the CRL to leverage, you know, those tools to develop, I believe it was an underground pedestrian connection to the LRT station. I'm not sure if it was the quarter CRL or, or, or the other uh, downtown. But at the time, and I remember talking to mayor and council about this, it was clear to me, at least in the, you know, in my understanding of the CRLs, they're negotiated with the province and they can be amended for other purposes. But it was pretty clear that if we wanted to leverage, you know, that current CRL and use it for, uh, for that purpose to develop, you know, the, the, the accessibility to a residential development, um, within the terms of the existing CRL, that was pretty limited scope. There were some things you could do above ground to, you know, uh, develop the, the, the area, et cetera. But anyway, long story short, without getting too down in the weeds, I was essentially told that, you know, the CRL had limited scope and what you could do with it. And my answer to that is let's go renegotiate CRLs then. 
so we can build affordable housing and amenities downtown that we need. Or what if the province says no? I, I, so I, I guess I'm just, and not, not, it's not that it's not worth an ask. I guess I just, yeah. I, I'm trying to get, get a sense of, let's assume for the moment they say no, yep. and we're tasked with what do we, what's before us today that's what I'm trying to get a sense of because again I hear the yeah. I hear the concerns from from the folks that you're that you're speaking for and, and I've got the emails yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so I know clearly the folks aren't looking at the tax dollars but if if this is what most are saying is the best use for this area and we can't amend it I, I'm just trying to figure out why sure. why I wouldn't do this versus the other things that are currently listed if Folks are generally united in saying this is the better use of money, which potentially creates further investment opportunities through the CRL if, if it actually pans out. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I'll just say that I'm very used to the province saying no to me, as I know you are as well. Um, but I, 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 I don't think that that stops us from asking in good faith. Fair. Fair. The other I, thing I'd say, Councillor Nack, just really quickly, if I may, is yeah. that um, I, I would explore all other options within the CRL because I know there is some flexibility within the within the existing agreement. I know it's quite stringent, um, but even if the answer is no, we can't amend that agreement. I, I just don't see a 94 to 125 year horizon for paying back on this events investment to be. It's just not credible, right? I mean, there's so many hypotheticals and things that could change um, for this to be. Um, uh, a credible uh, use of the CRL for for most Edmontonians, but I hear you. Those are pretty pretty clear agreements that uh, they're pretty stringent as they stand today. But uh, you know, I, I believe in us. You could probably go yeah. to the, the province. And you here. raise a good question about you know the payback on on any of those remaining items. I think it was a lot easier for the items that were early on in the CRL's life cycle to to have more direct payback. Do these other things have that same level of payback? Not not even talking about the office tower conversion, but the streetscape improvements. Do they do they generate that as well versus the public good versus all that? So it's it's a fair question. I, I just wanted to dig into that a little bit more. So appreciate your time on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nat. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you. Um, this week, right? A hypothetical. Uh, let's say um, someone wanted to build five new office towers in Edmonton. Uh, right now, it came online in say a year from now. Would that be helpful <laughs> for the downtown? That would be the opposite of helpful for downtown. <laughs> right, and, and the reason is because we've got a, uh, a glut of office space and the more office space we add, the lower um, the, lower the lease rates are for, for office space, yeah? Yeah, and um, we just aren't seeing reliable return to office activity for, especially for the private sector, actually, the public sector's really doing their part, so thank you for that. Um, but we just aren't seeing the people that we need. And so even if you had okay leasing, which would be a stretch, that's still not creating the level of vibrancy and activity that we need in the big picture to save downtown. And that's residential is re really the only path to that. Right, so let's say in a year we had five office conversions uh, into residential. What would happen to residential prices? I, I mean, I'm personally not worried about that. And clearly, I don't think the, the developer community is either. They're, you know, they set rents based on what market rate right. is, and we continue to be very affordable. So, um, so I think we'll continue to be affordable. Downtown will be more affordable. And office uh, yes, property so values the will... More, the more product you have on a market, the less you can charge for that product, generally speaking, unless it's like Beanie Babies in the 90s. Yeah. So, you're, are you asking about what would happen to leasing rates for office in that scenario? No, I'm just I'm just making a comparison here. Like we all very clearly see that the more office space you have, the lower the cost of office space is. Yeah, so exactly. When we are talking about housing, the more housing you supply, the more affordable housing gets across the board. Yes, but right. we do also have an influx of population. So, yeah, uh, yeah. and, and, so and you could argue that the more vibrant speaking. downtown becomes, the more people want to live here. And yeah. there's, a lot, there's a lot of factors there, but in general, yes. Yeah. But generally speaking, the more product you have, uh, the more accessible it is, uh, 
the better. I, I guess I'm just trying to wrap my head around this, that if we have more residential, how is, let me put it this way. All housing that gets built, all new housing, directly contributes down the line to affordable housing uh, because you have more housing on the market. Correct. It may, it may go up in price because you've got more population, but the inverse, if we constricted the amount of residential we built, then we could expect that because it's harder to find, rents would go up as we see in other municipalities. Correct, yep. Yeah, okay. So then to uh, Mr. Taze, I just a uh, completely different uh, line of questioning. And, and if you're comfortable answering this, great. If you're not, that's okay too. But when a developer comes in, they invest enormous amounts of money into that build, which means there are people who are working, there are tradespeople, there are supply lines. It's an enormous injection into the local economy which translates into food onto the kitchen table for folks. So what I'm looking for is what, if we went with this incentive program, what sort of investment would we be looking at into our local economy? Because there's two ways to look at the return. Either you get paid back or you get a lot of people working and making money for their family. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. Uh, and I, I don't know the numbers, but. Uh, when uh, somebody brought up the numbers in Calgary on what their program, the public investment was a little over 150 million, and the private investment was uh, 570 million, r roughly. So it just tells you what, how that uh, public money is is levered, and as you say, it adds to jobs, food on the table, all those good things. So uh, almost a four to one, for something that wasn't going to happen without the incentive. Correct. Yeah, okay. Thank you, I'm out of time. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I think my brain might be fuzzy. We've had so many conversations recently. Uh, <laughs> were, were you the gentleman that was also talking about your concerns around the, the requirements still for the, the commercial on the main floor? Did you come to urban planning? No. That was Adam. I don't know Damn if he's it. still here. Uh, no, no, Adam isn't here, but um, one thing I can tell you, uh, our conversion called capital, we, uh, there was a requirement to have uh, retail on the main floor. It just wasn't in a location that retail worked. We have way too much retail downtown. The, the retailers are suffering as it, as it is. So we were able, the administration was great. They allowed us to convert that. But that's that. on a variance basis. Right, that's sure. a variance base. So this yeah. is the thing that I'm grappling with, because like we're talking about money, but we also have policy levers we're not pulling, and I feel like we're kind of, you know, on a treadmill where we're going to go nowhere if we, even if we do invest in this incentive program, if we still have policies that build more commercial space. So I just wanted to get some thoughts on, on that. Ooh. Yeah, it's too bad Adam's not here. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I, I remember that, and I, yeah, I apologize. Yeah, it sounds like there are opportunities, though. Like, it sounds like there's a willingness to be flexible from administration, and, and the strategic group example is great. They're turning it into live work units, which is fantastic and really in demand, so excited about that one. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is that the policy levers don't affect the bank and financing problem that developers okay. have. So that that's, like, the big one that I don't know how you get over that hump without money like that's that's the the big one no one can get money to do these things okay, okay. and then i just want to like be very clear like i know that the reports did talk about you know affordable housing in terms of that spectrum but when i hear your ask this is for market housing this isn't for affordable housing that everything in the report said that affordable housing would be way more cost per door. So basically I'm left with the question of, if we build it downtown, we can let's say get 50 units, but we can get 75 units outside of downtown. We already have almost 6% of the 16% that we're targeting in each community. And then there's other communities, thank you to Councillor Tang for her motion during the um, zoning bylaw renewal, 
you know, we know there's neighborhoods that have 0%. So I just, am do you have any thoughts? You know, I just wanted to hear from the public on that discussion topic as I feel it might come up when we have questions to administration. I feel like Mike might have something to say on that, but I'll, I'll chime in. Um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's multiple problems you're trying to solve, obviously, right? Like housing affordability is one of them. Getting more housing built in general is, is a priority. Um, but downtown is its own problem to solve. So we kind of have to, I think, to a certain extent, separate it from the big housing but conversation. But we need, but we're talking marketing, we're talking market housing, and then, then there's a separate conversation. We have, you know, even in this report, we have the, the housing strategy, right? So, yeah. like, just making sure that, or sorry, that was yesterday, I'm getting all my days mixed up, but, um, yeah, so just want to make sure that we're clear on, even though the report, they're cross-referenced, one talks about affordable housing. When, when you're at your, you, the ask in front of us today is for that market space, not the affordable space. That's really, I'm just trying to get clarity. Yeah, I think we would all agree that that's the case. You know, there's not really a good definition of affordable. So for example, as, as Ken mentioned, uh, he would be, and everybody would be using the MLI Select CMHC program, which has a affordability requirement yeah. within it. Now, the way they calculate that, it ultimately creates a far, far different definition of affordable than you'll see, for example, in the AHIP program. So, you know, we're talking about- And I think administration recommended the AHIP program. And that, that's, that's much more affordable than what CMHC requires, but CMHC financing does require what they determine to be affordable. That, yeah, well, that makes sense. Okay, and um, I, I heard that Adam rejoined, but I am out of time, so maybe I'll just follow up or see if he has an answer on a next round, sorry. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cartmel. <clears throat> thank you. Sorry, uh, just two concepts that I quickly want to run by you. Maybe Mr. Campbell will start, but um, others can jump in. One is uh, around permitting cost. My understanding is that um, our permit costs are proportional to the cost of the project. Uh, and so it feels like a bit of a double whammy. This has been raised actually by some um, uh, constituents that I represent about smaller projects, smaller scale projects on their homes. But there's a, a permit cost that's proportional to the cost of the project and then your gift afterwards is that your property value goes up so you pay more tax. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know what the answer to this is, but what do you think about uh, something that takes that permit cost down to something that's not necessarily proportional to the investment? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, you know, anything helps, right? When you've got a performa that doesn't work and you can remove a cost, it helps. Yeah. Would it, would it help significantly? I think that's better a better question. For, I don't for think you. it would help significantly, no. No, okay. Uh, then the other one is um, tangential to this conversation. What's your view on sunset clauses for upzonings? We, uh, we do a lot of public hearings where we upzone property uh, in anticipation of a development that doesn't necessarily happen. So there's a sunset clause on that property so it's not effectively uh, you know, held dormant for unknown periods of time, what do you think the, the industry's reaction would be to that? Um, you know, it would add risk to a project, right? Knowing that, you know, oftentimes you're, you know, in development, you're, you know, you're subject to the, where you are in the market cycle and that's interest rates and that's population growth and things like that. You know, stepping back, um, Edmonton has provided very liberal zoning compared to a lot of jurisdictions and that is a key driver why we have more affordable housing than other, other major jurisdictions. So, you know, I don't love trying to use zoning as a sort of stick. stick. Yeah. Um, you know, other jurisdictions do it, but I don't think we want to be those other jurisdictions. I'm thinking more of um, maybe more specifically, you know, in, in sort of the downtown realm. I think, you know, uh, uh, Panita was speaking of one that she's heard where it's not proceeding even though it's uh, a property's received an up zoning. So if that property were to return to its former zone, does that, you know, after a certain period of time or its former, yeah, I guess, zone. Um, and again, just in the downtown realm, because we're talking about trying to activate this realm and seeing, you know, properties, whether they're parking lots or, or uh, other properties for whatever reason are dormant. Do you think that would be a trigger to initiate development more quickly? Um, I don't necessarily think so. No. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's 
rent and costs and if you lost your zoning but then you know to do that we would have to create a regime with which zoning becomes scarce and everybody has to come back and rezone their properties and the whole thing and I, I think we as a city have taken a very different approach than a lot of other folks or a lot of other jurisdictions when it comes to that general concept and I don't know that coming back and creating zoning scarcity so that we can try to use that to force folks to develop is going to end up it's going to end up creating less affordable housing in Edmonton in general. And I don't think we want to that. Yeah. I think yeah. what we've seen too, though, is just yeah. times have changed so much. Like, so we're yeah. staring at all these development permits and, you know, direct control zones or whatever that were created five-ish years ago and are now sitting dormant. It's because the math on that property doesn't work anymore. I don't yeah. think it's because the developer doesn't want to do it or they think they've got all the time in the world. They've tried. They've gone to you know 30 different banks or whatever the number is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I I just I actually think you're going to see a lot fewer applications, frankly, because I don't think anyone's even going to be trying uh, to get rezoned at this stage because they know they can't get the money. Yeah. Well, and we spoke to um, the concepts of scarcity and spot zoning when we we're talking about zoning by renewals, and that that would affect be a return to that. So okay, thank you. Appreciate those comments. Thank you, Councillor Carmel Marisohi. I was not planning on asking for second round, but uh, some of the answers that were given to Councillor Rutherford on the goal of having market housing raised some concerns in my mind, because the goal is to attract people to live downtown. And whether they're poor people, rich people, whether they need affordable housing, whether they need supportive housing, at the end of the day, we want, more, we want more people. So I just want to get more clarity on that. Like, is, is are we really, is the purpose of conver conversions only market housing, or are there opportunities if public sector is going to invest public dollars, whether through CR or another, opportunity to achieve other objectives? Such yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Yeah. I like market housing and affordable housing are are strange things to define as we've talked about a lot today. Um, I do know I don't know the numbers and I don't want to get the numbers wrong, but I do know mostly anecdotally that the capital apartments that strategic group did and now the peak which is coming online, which is the conversion that benefited from the 2021 incentive, they're about to start leasing. They are some of the most affordable apartments downtown and the highest quality. So most other affordable housing downtown are really bad old buildings that no one really wants to live in. Whereas these ones, because the construction cost was so much lower than the new builds, that's why so many students live there. So the last time I heard or talked to someone that was leasing, Strategic Group had one bedroom units for like eleven or $1,200 or something like that, which is unheard of in a downtown in a major city. So calling it market housing isn't inaccurate, but by using these incentives and you know making these projects go while rents are relatively low um, and increasing supply, especially on office conversions, it is going to increase our stock of housing that is more attainable, is the word that I prefer to use. Because I think when we're calling it affordable housing, I think we have to be specific about how we're defining that and, and requirements, but um, we need people. And so knowing that those buildings are 95% and 100% full is really encouraging because that's what we need more than anything. And obviously there are Edmontonians who can afford those apartments and want to live downtown. Can, can I just jump in? I, I really like that attainable. The, there's a continuum affordable versus market and what is market for an office conversion is cheaper rent than my, what might be mar market for an upscale brand new building, right? And I, I should have mentioned that, you know, our students tend to graduate and stick Right, and we also, as we grow the number of students, we grow the number of faculty and staff. So I, I know that when I said just McEwen alone, you know, we feed into the supply, like we're, we're just part of a larger ecosystem. I was just trying to put that in context. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification, yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't see anyone else on the board for questions of our panel, so I'll have you step back. Thank you again uh, for being here. We'll now turn to our administration to ask questions. Um, we'll just give them a moment to get up to the front. Thank you.
Okay, um, Councillor Rutherford, you're up first. Yeah, I think I'll just continue on this thread we left off with the panel because I know, yeah, I know that there was, um, you know, we're talking about kind of several different things. We're talking about the use of the downtown community revitalization levy. We're talking about office conversion, um, incentivization, and then we threw mixed market housing in there as well. So there's a lot of things that are kind of conflating a little bit. So I'm try I want to try to parse, parse them out. Uh, and my understanding from reading the report is based on what administration, rec whether it, which is less even than CMHC, the, the definition of affordable housing, the office conversion incentive would not likely, unless it was even deeper than $100 per square meter, would not really affect that. Is that what I, is my understanding correct from what I read in the report? Yes, that's correct. Or we'd have to do some sort of uh, criteria weighting in our application process to prioritize downtown, but there'd still have to be financial incentive from anybody that would want to do that in terms of making the numbers square. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And we have, uh, if I remember correctly in the report too, it talks about, uh, you know, I think just under 6%, I'm not looking up the number right now, is cl by our definition, because we talk about attainable or, you know, housing, market housing that can be affordable is not the same as classified affordable housing, is around just under 6%, correct? 6% for which, sorry? Like the percentage of housing in the downtown oh. that is like uh, identified as affordable. Yes, and yeah, that's that's subsidized and made available to people earning with low and very low incomes is six yeah. percent. And I know that this that we've talked a lot about affordable housing, but one of the things that I've always brought up, and I know, and we didn't get to it the other day, the report on the. The housing, but I've talked about, you know, how we talk about housing choice a lot with zoning bylaw. We talked about that a lot. And housing choice can better be achieved through affordable affordability and for affordable housing through direct rent subsidies. Thoughts on that? I know that's not necessarily a role that the city plays, but like for bricks, for every dollar of bricks and mortar that we build, or we can do direct subsidies, like what is the best bang for our dollar? I think, um, I think. A lot of affordable housing strategies would say that you need both. You need measures that impact on the demand side and you need measures on the supply side. Um, that you, usually one in and of itself isn't enough and there's trade-offs yeah. involved, right? Yeah, okay. And then I guess to the to the f folks around this, so, that's, so that kind of answers my questions on the non-market affordable housing and mixed market side of things. In terms of the community revitalization levy what would we have to stop doing in order to uh, use that pool of funding for this program? Depends on the size and scope of the program. Sorry. Well, they're saying it, that. They're, well, let's yeah. like let's go by what what their the panelists asked us. To ask for a hundred million from the CRL? Yeah. Is it is it even possible? We'd have to take that away. It's it's right at that cost board. We'd have to take that away and check. Okay, but even fifty million, let's say, which again the report says that that's not really going to incent very much, right? If we don't do it a hundred dollars per square meter or foot or whatever it is. So at fifty million, if we stopped most of the projects that are underway in the CRL to some extent, without trying to prioritize them on the spot here, we could clear probably fifty million to do this. Okay, but then like let's say something like this is another thing I'm grappling with. Let's say we stop doing something in that we're currently having the CRL, um, but it still needs renewal work. Is that gonna come back and haunt us, as it is Halloween, haunt us in the next four year budget cycle? It, it might. Okay, Yeah. okay, that's that's all my questions for right now. Thanks, Councilor Rutherford. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, on the, uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, like if nothing changes, like if the, if the office value, assessment value continues to decline? Yeah. 
maybe finance wants to chime in, but if the office value continues to decline, then the amount of non-res tax that the city collects will be borne more by people outside of the downtown. Do we know, like, if, uh, if we don't do anything where the market conditions are now, with the high interest cost and everything else, uh, have we done any kind of analysis, like it's going to be going to half, you said 35%, it's going to be half or less than half. We, we haven't done that kind of projection. No, I, I think assessment is working through the process now, but I would ask them to chime in if they're available. Yeah, hi there, Mayor Sowey. This is Stephen Lord, Director of Taxation for Assessment Taxation Branch. We're still working on finalizing our property assessments for this year. Um, we do know, generally speaking, that the office uh, values downtown are trending downwards, um, probably more so than the other non-residential property values. Mm. So we can expect that there would be some sort of shift there. We just don't know the magnitude, and, and we also won't know the, the final um, amount of that until tax time next fall or next spring. I see. Um, you heard from speakers, and I, it, I'm just really trying to figure out. This is, I think, there, there's a there's a compelling case being made here about attracting more people to downtown and conversions and new builds. Whatever we can do will help us do that. But I also heard that markets at this time, without any so any without intervention from public sector would not respond. So our goal is to attract more people downtown. I understand the uh, affordable housing investment fund may help, may not help, but what are the other tools available? To attract more people downtown? Yeah. Well, there's the downtown vibrancy strategy. Um, that's part of the, the answer. The other things, are the investments that the CRL is already making in the community, things like Warehouse Park. Those are incenting developments around the area, not directly, indirectly, but the okay. Warehouse Park is a draw, and the other types of things that the CRL done, has done are a draw to build amenities that would make downtown more desirable. Also, the strong emphasis on the safety and security was a big concern that we heard during the engagement, and so the things that the city has done there to improve the situation um, also helps to draw residents downtown. So you're seeing visitors coming downtown, right? Uh, and you're seeing the 10 projects that were supported through the construction grant. They're yes. coming coming close to completion, right? Or some are coming co co close to completion, but all of them are underway, am I correct? They are all underway, yes. Okay, so that is, that is helping, um, which is good, absolutely. Uh, uh, and that is, that was part of the goal of CRL as well, right? Um, but beyond that, is there room? I know you talked about $50 million could be freed up, but there's a risk to that. Is there, when can, how can we have that conversation about reprioritizing CRL projects? Or even if it's, even if, is it possible to use CRL to create further incentives for construction grants? So the C or con conversion grants or new, new construction? So there is a development incentive program listed as a project allowed within the CRL, so we can have that conversation. We are having that conversation. Um, the sex the that's, that's through tax deferrals? That's the one that we, that we had, that started in 2021 or 2020? No, that's, it goes back to when the CRL was started. It was one of the projects that was allowed in the CRL plan when it was approved by the province. So we do have that on the books. We are allowed to do that. Okay. It is, it is flexible. We have not done it. We have not budgeted for it in any of our projections. Um, an appropriate time to discuss that might be when we come back with the, li the latest CRL updates in March. So we wouldn't have to go to the province to seek some sort of exemption to create a, that kind of program? No, that project is listed as an allowable okay. project already, yes. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, Sorry, I'll stop Mr. here. Mr. Mayor. And, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, Cam Ashmore from Legal Services here. Um, we may want to go in private to discuss the answers to your question from a legal standpoint. There are certain aspects of CRLs that may prove to be a little bit more of a challenge. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tang? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I will start with um, the tax assessment. Um, 
so you mentioned that there's we might not know the full impact of of the impact uh, the full impact until next year um, when the property tax comes out. But I was curious, um, not so much the tax implications for that particular building, but let's say the strategic building, I think it's on 108, and it came online, what, last year, this year? And I'm curious about the impact for, this, for sort of the surrounding buildings. Um, I think one of the speakers made the assertion that, you know, it has implications in the vicinity or sort of downtown overall. Um, so I just want to get your sense on that. So I don't know the exact um, value increases or, or decreases to the, the specific properties surrounding that, but generally speaking, yes, it's correct that uh, as new properties come on, that's gonna affect the rental market, um, obviously from a supply and demand perspective and, and can influence assessment values in the neighborhood. And assessment often also, there's a lot of other factors that goes into that race, but this will be one factor. That's one of many. Yeah. Um, I think the 100th Street pedestrian bridge came up a lot, but I just want to verify and clarify, that's not happening. That's correct. Okay, right. That's what I thought, so it's not happening. Um, and then coming back to the Calgary example, um, and just some of the questions I had, ha I had er earlier, how much was their total? I know it was, uh, it was 75 per square feet, but what was the total amount? The total of their program initially advertised at 100 million, but it went to 153 before they put the pause. And the pause is because they're fully subscribed, right? The pause is because they have more applications than money, yes. Right, and then do you know how much of that is, um, or do you know if they leverage that for other orders of government funding? I, I don't think they had any other okay. orders of government funding in that program. Because last year the feds announced that 300 million out of the 1.3 billion housing program dedicated to conversion. How do we access that? Right. Yeah. Or have you have you looked into that or? Are you talking about rapid housing initiative? No, I don't know. I just know that there was a, there was a headline and you know that you know na national governments U.S. Canada are also looking at this and. MLI, as you heard from the other speakers, MLI select doesn't does fund conversions. There's just um, there's some constraints around that. So that might be one of the programs that was referenced, uh, but I'm not sure, Brett, you might know, but I don't think there's There was a program referenced in the U.S. where they're doing that. No, I'm talking about here. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I don't know the okay, specifics that's okay. of the program. Okay, that, that, I'm, yeah. Anyways, intergovernmental came up a lot too, so I just wanted to uh, check with that. Um, uh, so on the notion of okay, you know, times are changing and we need to constantly reevaluate our priorities and kind of reevaluating the priorities, say, in a CRL. Um, talk to me through that process a little bit. How onerous, you know, is that realistic? And barring, you know, some of the other constraints that was mentioned earlier. Well, we provide an update uh, on the CRLs annually to council. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, they're all listed with their costs and their projections and our projections on where the CRLs are going. Would be a good time to talk about the priorities, but the priorities are not set by us. They're set by sure. council and, and, and IIS will want to weigh in on where certain projects are at. And I know that some of those projects are timed to happen with other projects that aren't funded from the CRL. And so we'd want time to go back and look at those connection points as well to make sure we're not recommending a stop on something where other departments in the city are coordinating activity. Mm -hmm. and, and so the last update was March, so the next update on the CRL will be next March. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, I think, first of all, the program that uh, Councillor Tang might be referring to was the one that saw money go to Mississauga and I think London. Accelerator. Housing Accelerator Fund, yeah. Yeah, so that's Crystal. Yeah. Um, so the Housing Accelerator Fund has a pretty um, clear program criteria around what types of initiatives are allowed on action plans or not, and they actually explicitly don't allow um, per door incentives or one-time incentives like that because they're seeking like longer-term structural policy changes. So a, so a per square foot would fall in the same per door kind That's of? correct. Yeah. Because okay. we, we thought about that when we were putting our action plan together because we knew about this motion, but it wasn't permitted as a potential action plan item. Okay, fair enough. So the CRL, uh, 
I described earlier what my understanding is. We borrowed a bunch of money, we bought a bunch of stuff, and we get a tax lift out of that, and we pay the loan back with the tax lift. Is that more or less correct? And we get forgiven the, uh, the education tax portion on that. Yeah, we get to keep it. I wouldn't, yeah. It's um, more or less correct. Yeah. Maybe Tom can give a little more. I would detail. say that's more or less correct. More or yeah. less correct? Yeah. Okay. So, so then, the, if building values are falling in the downtown core, then the delta between the baseline and what they're paying today is diminishing. So, the baseline was set for the downtown CRL in 2014, right. which was basically the peak year of office valuations. So if you look at all those buildings that existed in 2014, they're, they're all below the CRL baseline and they're not contributing to the CRL right now. Um, th those go up and down a few percent, they're still below the baseline as it relates to the CRL. Those new buildings that have been built since 2014, those are basically contributing their full tax bill towards the CRL and the okay. yes. So what's the sensitivity around that then? So even if those, like, so those new buildings will Let's presume that everybody is losing value in the downtown, even the new buildings. Is, is the delta between the, the baseline of the new builds still substantial enough to keep the CRL healthy? Like, I'm, are we gonna, is there potential to see values decline and the CRL go into a bit of a death spiral, at least short term? So, we presented three scenarios in the last March update yeah. on the downtown CRL. One of those, the low scenario, was already below zero. Um, the medium scenario and the high scenario were above zero. Things can change, projections can change. Yes, we could go into a situation. The low scenario is possible. It's within the realm of possibility, so. Okay. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if someone from assessment can speak to this in more detail, but I think the, the stakeholders we spoke to anyway, the, the primary concern was around those B and C class office buildings and the right. valuations of those. There was less immediate concern around those, those newer double A class or however you call them buildings. Yeah, so there's, a, so there's a theoretical lift in the property value of those B and C buildings if they get converted. So if we use CRL dollars uh, to catalyze those conversions, could, uh, I'm presuming you haven't done this, so could there be a calculation done to see that if certain thresholds are met that we actually accelerate the ability to repay the CRL? So we might, we might trade certain projects in the CRL right now for uh, incenting office conversions, but come back to those projects in a few years because we'll have the benefit of those office conversions and the lift that they bring. Councillor Carmel Anton Sabo, assessment of taxation. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, just kind of, so just quickly uh, be kind of clear the difference between the CRL side of things and the property tax levy side of things. When it's below the levy, that's when we're talking about the shifting. When it's above, the, when it's above, so above below the baseline. When it's above the baseline, then it, you're taking those hits to the CRL, and that's part of the concern that you're raising. When we're looking at a funding a program, whatever dollar per square foot in the cost, and we laid out kind of what that would look like in terms of a payback period. If you put that instead to the CRL, and ask the CRL to do the exact same thing. You're, you're looking at a similar kind of challenge with paying back and, and getting the CRL to, to get its money back in time to actually pay off that investment because they're all it's also going to have a very similar kind of challenge in that it's uh, starting below and even if you get it above baseline when you do that that conversion uh, and I think the CRLs are based on assessment baselines so it needs to go up even more to start contributing towards that assessment ballot to, the, to uplift uh, you're not necessarily going to be able to pay that back in the remaining period within the CRL, just as you can't do it, as, just as we project we're not gonna be able to do it through the tax levy either. Okay, I'm out of time. Well, I'll maybe pick up right there. Um, just so I'm understanding, so do contributions to the CRL come from all increase? Like if you have a baseline, that's a baseline year of assessment, so an existing building, if that existing building increases in assessment value over the life of the CRL, that gets captured or it's only brand new development? So, sorry Tom, I'm not, I'm not it, it is any increase any above growth. that baseline, yes. Okay, so even with existing buildings. Okay, okay, great. Um, I think 
Yeah, I mean, quite a few questions to go through, a bit scattershot. Um, wanted to circle back to the, the question, just comparing MLI Select to our AHIP program. Do we have a sense of what the, yeah, just the thresholds there for affordability are? Uh, yeah, we do. And just, I mean, they are different programs, like MLI Select's is point scoring, and, it, and you don't necessarily need affordability to qualify. You can hit other outcomes to qualify. But just with respect to the affordability, um, MLI Select requires a, minimum, a 10 year commitment, whereas our AHIP program requires a 20 year commitment. And they, are, they define affordable as 30% of median renter income. And we define affordable as a minimum of 20% of average market rent. So we just calculate it, because that's not helpful for comparison. We calculated a sample for you. So on a one bedroom, um, and the example is you're not allowed to charge, in MLI Select you can't charge more than $1,665 a month for a one bedroom unit. And in our AHIP program, it's $853 per month would be the maximum rent for one bedroom. And so the reason is because we know there's 30,000 households that require um, affordable housing and can only pay a maximum of $1,100 per month. So our threshold is designed to meet the needs in our affordable housing assessment. And so in terms of the MLI select though, do we know the median the median income, and that is the six, that's 66,000 per year. 60, it's median renter income. Okay, and so sorry, when you gave that figure, the mm -hmm. 1650, that is, um, sorry, I had understood you saying that was like an absolute cap, but that, that is the derived 30% of the median yes. renter income. Yeah. Okay, okay, great, no, that's very helpful. I mean, maybe looking at it a bit differently, I think, um, have we ever considered a program where Again, these, these projects have current pro formas. They're based on existing rent uh, rates with you know potentially some growth over a number of years. Have we ever looked at just locking in those rates, um, recognizing that the market may, may increase, but if they have a pro forma that works over a 20 year period and those rates just stay the same, like is that a way to provide some market affordability without impacting, impacting the project viability? I think you can devise a, a housing incentive program in any which way you please. Um, mm -hmm. That is one of the options to, to lock in those that affordability or that market affordability part. Um, but there are other ways to do that as well. Uh, but understanding where that kind of question is coming from in terms of trying to attain that, that affordability, uh, it, it definitely is an option, but I think it would, uh, we would have to work with our development partners to see what other risks that brings about. Sure. Um, and just to clarify to, you know, I understand that we can't use the CRL directly to fund affordable housing, but we can use it to fund an incentive program. And so it would not be offside if that incentive program incentivized affordable housing to some extent. Is that for legal to answer perhaps? Or? I'm sure Cam wants to weigh in, but um, <laughs> I, I believe, yeah, there's no restriction on it. Because it would way. be a program, program in, the, in the way the plan is listed, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, counsel, counselor, again, this gets into the, uh, the aspect of go. things that we might need to take in private. Okay, okay. Um, do we know how, what funding source Calgary used? Yeah, I believe it came from reserves, essentially, that the city had. Okay, wow. Nice to have 150 million lying around, but uh, but that's really interesting. So it wasn't a tax levy increase; that was existing funding that they had. Okay, um, and then just with the CRL again. So you know, I think I think reprioritization is important, but some of these infrastructure investments are investments that we would have to make outside of the lifespan of the CRL. So for example, I'm thinking of Jasper Ave. The the curbs are crumbling. So if it's not funded through the CRL, that that would have to come back. To tax levy at some point if you want to do the curbs yes yeah okay that's my time i'll go next to councillor salvador yeah thank you so much um maybe just to start i too am thinking about uh, what other tools we have to enable more edmontonians to live downtown and to catalyze investment in the core i know the downtown vibrancy strategy was mentioned i know there's uh, numerous actions in the strategy are office conversions included in um the downtown vibrancy strategy uh, no. Why, why not? I guess that's one of my questions. So I think my answer would be budget, but Tom is here. He can talk to it. Uh, 
so it is included in the vibrancy strategy, but the, the inclusion is the exploration of an incentive. So the conversation that we're having today is actually fulfilling that, uh, that part of the strategy. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Um, and then just a question about, I guess, trends in commercial rents. Do we know if commercial rents in um, Class C buildings have been in a significant decline commensurate with the loss of asset values that we're hearing about today? Generally speaking, that's a fair statement. Um, the whole flight to quality is a, is a thing that's been observed. And um, for the most part, Class C office buildings haven't fared as well as, as other sort of newer, better product. Okay, okay. Um, and then just to follow up on one of the questions I asked of some of the speakers. So did we consult with uh, stakeholders about the city taking an equity stake? I mean, I know we heard from speakers that's not appealing um, at all, uh, but just I'm curious if that did come up in conversation. Um, in conversation, yes, and that's the same answer we got. They were not interested in, in such a program. Okay. Um, and then when we're, can, you, can someone remind me just the scale that we're talking about, like the number of buildings that are even potentially um, available for conversion or suitable for conversion? So we did a review uh, internally of the buildings downtown that we thought made sense. And we came up with a number between two and 10. And it depends on uh, how much the incentive is and, and essentially how hard or difficult the conversion would be. So there's a couple of obvious candidates. There's a few more that are more challenging and we sort of graded them out. But I would tell you that the development community has a much better handle on that than we do. Okay, but that gives me an idea. So two to 10 buildings. Um, and I'm just reflecting on one of the answers we received from speaker. Uh, I was I was asking about the um, IRR that was outlined in attachment two, and uh, you know it's it's not good. Um, but it was suggested that we need to look past the IRR to some of the intangibles, uh, and the intangibles being more folks downtown, added vibrancy. I guess I'm looking for some perspective on how you know two two buildings and potentially you know up to ten buildings. Realistically, I mean. Is that going to have a significant impact on on added vibrancy downtown, more folks downtown? Is this going to deliver the best return on investment if we're talking about such such a significant sum of capital on the table? That's a tough question to answer. Um, if you converted all ten and and the city wasn't paying for it, I would tell you that that would have a significant marked increase in vibrancy. Um, that's a lot of residents coming downtown that aren't here now, and it's taking out a lot of empty office space. Um, the value that you put towards that is is up for discussion and, and debate. It's not clear what the right number is, if there is a right number, and that's why we're here discussing it today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of not answering the question, but yeah, I'm not sure there's an obvious answer. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and it, I mean, it sort of links to my next question, which you might not have a good answer for, but I, I really would appreciate perspective on it, because it, it really, kind of comes down to to this big question for me, and it's to what extent are current high office vacancies a market problem whose burden falls on the private sector, and to what extent do they represent um, you know, a market failure and policy problem to which government needs to respond with things like we're, we're discussing today, like financial supports and incentives. Um, and again, like any thoughts on that piece? Because that is, that is the question for me. I would say that there was a large external shock um, that got in the way of what was happening downtown. And if council wanted to intervene, it seems like um, the policy might be a way to do it, but um, that's not our decision. That's sort of your decision, which is dodging the question again. I apologize. That's all right. Um, and I'm, I'm out of time. Thanks. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Jans next. Thank you. Just for assessment and taxation, I want to clarify that if we take office towers out of the non-residential tax pool, that effectively still the rest of the pool would have to make up that non-residential tax. Am I correct there? Yeah, it just would shrink the the overall total pie of the, the non-residential um, assessment. So it would get spread out to the other properties. Okay, so it effectively, while it may, um, those in those particular owners who then shift to residential, they would be paying residential tax, but the owners in Mayfield, Common, White Avenue, Mill Woods, et cetera, would 
their non-residential tax bill would then be higher because they're offsetting the cost of the lost downtown. Is that correct? Yeah, and and the total shift in that is is going to be obviously proportionate to to how many projects would be under conversion and how much um, total assessment is removed. But the the money does have to go somewhere. So um, the total also, budget requirements. Just make a distinction between assessment value shifts and and what we would call growth or changes in in use. So if there's changes in, in value just because of market value changes, property values are changing, that's where those shifts are taking place. If we have a situation where a property converts and it actually becomes what we would consider to be growth, we would reduce how much the non-residential base is contributing towards our total taxes. So right now it's about 55% of our total revenues and property tax come from residential, 45% of our total revenues come from non-residential. If you now remove that building, we're gonna further push the residential contributions up and the residential uh, and the uh, the non-residential contributions will come down, so it doesn't have that same redistribution impact because we don't expect to maintain the ratio and still have the non-residential pay for that office coming offline. We now put that that revenue that was coming there into this new bucket, and residential expect them to pay for it. So, in theory, interventions in one area that remove supply could have actually a cost increase in the other non-residential areas around the city. So not when it comes to, to changing classification. When you have a classification change, then you're not gonna shift distribution. You're just going to uh, have that building now be classified as residential and the, the revenue is gonna be generated is gonna be on the residential side instead. So right. we're not gonna expect I... the revenue loss that comes from non-residential to be made up by the remaining assessment prop properties in non-residential. We simply take the contribution of non-residential and reduce it commensurately with how much was 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 reduced on that side and now add an expectation for residential to contribute more right okay um so uh and just to clarify uh, if you're paying non-residential tax no matter where you are in edmonton whether you're downtown or not you still contribute to the non-residential tax base right yes so just if a business relocates out of downtown to say 124th street same thing okay yeah. uh just to clarify can i go to affordable housing then so we i think we have 200 million and I think we have 60,000 households in core housing need. Um, I'm wondering uh, what, like, if if we were just to cut a check to uh, uh, the affordable housing branch for 100 mil and said maximize your doors, um, what could what could be done? Um, okay, so that's a good question. I'll just start by saying that. Um, last year, the housing needs assessment that was published did identify that by 2026, um, we would be we would be 59,000 households in core housing needs. So that's 59,000 households that require affordable housing. Um, so, are you saying 100 million? Yeah, if <laughs> okay, you I'm doing it. some fast math here, but a pro we, you know, the average that we um, achieve, our average cost of a unit under the AHIP program is 61,000. Um, so if you wanted to do some fast math, which I'm literally doing right now. <laughs> All right. So on, because. Yeah, go ahead. Because I guess as you're looking around, you're probably looking at uh, other land the city owns starting from scratch, not necessarily boutique style conversions. Yeah, well, we achieve that and in all areas of the city as well, right? And we've heard today that the costs of development vary from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, but I mean, the fast math that you asked for would say that 100 million could generate approximately 1,639 units of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Have we thought about allowing some of the, the landlords or the builders to sort of, well, never mind, I'll have to come back for a second round, but really appreciate the clarification. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Knack, who has disappeared from our list, but uh, you were up next. Sure, th uh, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Savage, I just wanted to quickly double check what I heard on, on Councillor Jans' questions, because I think that the, the discussion we're having is that if these office towers were to drop in value and continue to remain non-residential, that has to be made up by other businesses. The question that I think that I, he was asking, so maybe I want to make sure I've understood it, is that if they were to come out of non-residential into residential, we would probably shift the ratio right now of 55%, 45% to what 56%, 44% to to help minimize any potential shift of 
uh, property taxes to the non-residential sp spaces. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So we just make a distinction between market value and what we call growth. In this case, that is considered negative growth on the non-residential side and positive growth on the residential side. So that has no impact on distribution, just on revenue in the buckets. Okay. So, so it, if everything else were created equal and nothing else were to change in the market, which I know is a little silly of an analogy, and, and you were just to remove that out of the non-res and put it in the res, you wouldn't actually see an increase to the, to the other businesses in the non-res, all other things being equal and no other market changes, correct? Correct. correct. Okay, so, so that, that's a potential piece, but again, you still, still have to weigh the other pieces. Excellent, thank you. That helps me understand that. Um, I wanted to just ask a little bit more about the CRL piece, and I appreciate that there's probably a, a little bit more of a conversation. I'm not sure who to best ask on that. So this notion of whether it's 50 million, 100 million, whatever million we're looking at, um, for the remaining items that are currently funded through the CRL, which I'm trying to remember from last March, are we still operating based off the mid scenario or were we operating off a low scenario? Uh, I don't think we've ever been operating uh, at the high or, or assuming the high, but where are we, which operation, which assumptions are we using right now? Yeah, so we continue to provide all three scenarios in our March report to really reflect that, that there is uncertainty, there is a range of, of plausible outcomes. When it comes to the, the detailed budgeting, we do use that medium scenario. Okay. So there, you know, and, and not that we should do this, but I just, I want to ask this out loud to make sure I've understood it. If we wanted to operate under the high scenario, that potentially then has capacity for the CRL that is not currently identified to other priorities. We might not want to do that. You might recommend against that, but I just, that, that is, that is also a scenario that we could use to help inform where we're investing money, right? You, you could, I think that your point was well made that we wouldn't advise that. Yeah. And, and what kind of, what's, what's the, 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 the difference right now between the mid and the high, like, so if you were going to start using that, what, what kind of funding does that provide? What order of magnitude? So my recollection, and I can confirm it, uh, the high scenario was over the life of the CRL, 121 more million dollars. Okay. Compared Again. to the medium. Yeah, might not want to do that. <laughs> There's a lot of risk associated with that. Um, but that is a potential that we would be able to consider. Maybe you'd want to use a portion of that if you were feeling that this could help generate investment. Um, okay, that's helpful. And of the of the items that have yet to be delivered that are that are still in the process of being funded and, and have been approved, uh, there's a right a, a very justified question about what's the payback on these other investments. Do we have a sense of and I think this is the challenge is I think a lot of the upfront investments in the CRL were things that had more tangible paybacks, whereas I, I'm not sure as we've gone on, there's as much of a guarantee that everything we're investing in has a, a tangible return on investment or a payback period. Is that generally fair to say? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think some of the, um, that return on investment lens is not something we would approach a park project with. There, there's it, other benefits that we know come from it that, that are really we are a priority. Hoping that park project has then generated additional new development, which in turn provides a, a return, if you will. But that wasn't necessarily the lens we approached. That yeah, with. and it's very difficult to, to go and say whether a project happened because of the park or not, right? So Correct. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm out of time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Nat. Councillor Paquette? Well, thank you very much. And uh, following up on that, so there are lots of, actually, let me put it this way. So let's say we get one average office conversion occurring. And we're getting that investment in uh, for that one office. What is the investment that a developer would be making ballpark figures? Ballpark 
ballpark is three times the investment that we would be making if we did $100 per square foot. But that's very, it's very specific to the conversion and very specific to the individual project. Yeah, of course, so yeah. we're talking very high level here. Okay, so let's just go with that. Um, three times the investment we'd make if we do $100 per square foot. So basically a three to one return. Yes. In investment in the downtown. Yeah, okay. So every additional tower that sees a conversion um, brings in that three to one return. It's basically what, what we're looking at. And that means, so let's say we got five towers, right? Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about in terms of investment in the downtown, investment in uh, the community, the uh, amount of money that gets brought in to our local economy, the number of jobs that we're seeing, good paying labor jobs, and the impact that has on the local economy and local tax uplift. Do we even have those numbers? So it's a couple of years old. Um, for the 2021 construction grant, we used yeah. um, a calculation of rough calculation of 739 jobs per 100 million of residential construction. So you can do the math, I guess, if <laughs> based on what uh, what the three to one ratio and what the city would invest is. But at the end, yeah, 100 million dollars of residential investment, 739 jobs. So just a quick math on that, Councillor. Uh, following the, the high level estimate of three to one and expecting the program to be fully subscribed at 100 million, you're probably looking at uh, 300 million of private investment, uh, which leads to about 2,100 jobs roughly on that 2021 report. Okay, because I'm just thinking when, we talk, when we're talking about being made whole or the investment paying itself back, there are a number of ways to look at that and uh, I'm just wondering if, like, which metric do we want to use? Councillor, it's a good question. I think the, the policy discussion ahead of you today is, is, is moving from what we currently do and support the downtown. And to be clear, um, we do have a number of plans and investment opportunities uh, that the city does invest in in downtown through the CRL, but it's moving it from indirect. Uh, sort of investments, so you're inducing demand indirectly through uh, the various green and walkable or the park investments uh, to a very direct incentive. Uh, so that's that's the policy choice ahead of you today is if that leap from indirect to direct is the right one. Yeah, I think we need to really look at this in a broader, broader scope because that last uh, round we did where we incented the residential builds, um, would we, Call that successful? Yeah, that would be, we would consider that a successful program, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just wondering if, if uh, committee um, directs uh, next steps on this, will we be, will we be getting uh, those kinds of analyses so that we can not only see it for ourselves and so we're all clear on what the picture is, but we can also show the public? Yes, we'll include any such analysis that supports any program design that we bring forward. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll reserve my opinion on CRL for another day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, so 2,100 jobs, that sounds, that sounds great. What's our labor market like? Do we have the qualified tradespeople and, and laborers to do that? Councillor, I think we're uh, getting off into uh, the hypotheticals here. Um, okay. And I don't know if it will be beneficial uh, to further extrapolate numbers from very high assumptions. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm just wondering. I mean, if you're going to do some further analysis, could we could we really seriously take a look at the labor market and see if it can manage this type of build? I think if you look at right now the the construction that was, was spurred by the 2021 construction grant, um, which is, I want to say, how many projects? 
10 projects, about 2,300 units in total. Uh, and so we're looking uh, either the same or less level of uh, activity than that. So I, I, I believe we could say that it supports it. That, that we can get the qualified workers in. I, like, I'm, I'm not doubting your numbers. What I'm concerned with is, are we going to have the qualified people to do the work? It's really more of a question for the developers, but based on the number of units that are under construction downtown right now, if those workers were to be finishing up on those projects and be made available to the upcoming projects, the timeline probably matches. So most likely, yes. Okay, that's my, that was my only question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, so uh, what I'll do, Chair Stevenson, that uh, I will move the uh, the first part of the motion, right, and then I have, I'll have a subsequent on the advocacy. So I'll move that administration as part of its Q1 2024 community, re community revitalization levy update uh, provide options for a residential incentive program funded by the CRL and makes a recommendation on how to prioritize uh, such a program in the options to the capital city downtown CRL. Uh, coming back here to Tony Wolf, to the executive committee. Great. Did you want to introduce that? At uh, all? Yes, just uh, the conversation that we had so far, figuring out a creative, innovative way of moving forward on this without uh, relying on uh, tax levy to create uh, an incentive program. Uh, and. Uh, I'm glad that idea came from uh, from folks who made presentations, and I think it's worth f further exploring, a and then also looking at whether projects can be reprioritized based on uh, the best value those investors will make in the given reality of what we're facing in the uh, in the downtown. So that's kind of the intent. But I do have some questions. If I can ask those questions, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the the memo that was provided to us by Kim Patron uh, on the all the investments we're making in downtown. I'm looking at the downtown CRL funded uh, total budget of $942.7 million. Within that, uh, there are a number of projects worth close to $200 million that are in the design and planning stage. So those are the projects we will be looking at kind of reprioritizing, right, if this motion is passes and direction is given to you. We'll take a look at um, the total package of what's here, Mayor Sohi. And as was mentioned earlier, there's we're going to want to make uh, take a look at these specifically for any connected projects, so that if these are suggested to be paused or reprioritized in any way, we're not creating unintended consequences for okay. other related projects. So this is a, a bigger review, um, but this g gives you the the memo provides. Um, uh, the list of the suite of what's currently in the downtown um, but you look CRL. At, you look at the entire we'll look at it all and we'll look at also connected projects because again we don't want to disrupt other things outside of the CRL without those decisions being fully understood when you're making those decisions. Okay. And do we require provincial approval to reprioritize the uh, the projects and or uh, we wouldn't, right? We wouldn't. Only if we were going to add new projects okay. or change um, the parameters. For example, if you wanted to extend the um, time span, those would require provincial approval back to um, I think my to change. Time. That was just your two-minute speaking, so we're just going to get three minutes for you to okay, continue got it. with questions. Uh, yeah. So we don't need approval to set up a program. We don't need approval to reprioritize, which is good, right? Correct. So, okay, got it. Um, do we know the buildings that uh, you identified or looked at does those two to ten buildings that could are could be candidates for conversion? Uh, do we know if they're locally owned, if they're uh, owned by, you know, pension funds or if they're owned by, you know, investment uh, firms like uh, or shareholders? In, in are they? Do we know the ownership? We do. I don't have it with us. Um, I would point out though that only five of those buildings are within the boundaries of the CRL. So out of the ten, only five are within this. And the program will only apply to those five because they're CRL. Okay, got Correct. it. Okay. Uh, I know if that information is public to be shared, I would be interested in that building uh, information. If not, then 
that that be it, right? And so, uh, I know you don't have it now, but if it's possible to uh, share that, if it's publicly available, and owners don't have any issues with that. Uh, also, recognizing that every building is unique, every building's value is not dropped equally. Have we, or would we have the option of doing kind of building to building analysis in a way which building would be, will be more better candidate, for example, have a better return on the, on the investment, or can it be done easily and completed in a short amount of time? Would that kind of, at what stage that kind of analysis would take place? That's something that we could do as part of the program design. Um, depending on um, how you design the program, that could be a component of the analysis and eligibility. So um, that's something we could take away, uh, Mayor Sohi, and take a closer look at. Okay, good. Yeah, those are the questions I had, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, maybe just on a similar vein, you know, uh, in the conversations that we heard today and in the conversations I've had, I've heard a uh, you know, fairly significant range uh, from folks in terms of what, they, what they're looking for. I've heard, I mean, frankly, I've heard zero dollars a square foot to $40 a square foot to 50 to 100. Um, so I'm just thinking about, you know, AHIP, we don't provide a per square foot requirement. We just ask people to submit and we look at what the best value and return on dollars is. Um, so is that an approach we might be able to take with a incentive program like this if it were to, to move forward? It is, that's something that we could take a look at again in the program design, um, which is a requirement. We'd have to actually do some design work to determine how and if this could fit into the CRL. So that's because we need to know magnitude and the dollars that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that design work is really important to make sure we can take that next stage step and get you that information to make those decisions. Great, and then I, I think maybe it's implied in the in the questions and conversation we've had but again we we would potentially be looking at point scoring so um, looking at other other uh, return on value factors or approaches that help meet some of our other strategic objectives again it's something we could look in the design what I would ask back to council is is if there are things that are of particular importance or priority that you would like to see reflective in that program design whether it's affordable housing or number of units or something to that. Uh, those specifics are really helpful for getting us closer um, to the desirables in that program design. Great, well yeah, I mean I would certainly put affordable housing and I think, I think there's an opportunity to be really creative here. So again, I, I you know, there, there's our AHIP standards, which, which is one end of the spectrum. Um, but I think again, looking creatively at market um, affordability, locking in rates for, for 10 years, for 20 years, I think that that has, still has a really positive impact. Um, so those are ideas I'd be really interested in exploring. Um, maybe, maybe just kind of shifting gears a little bit. Oh, and then sorry, I'm just thinking to our tax referral program, um, the incentive that happened before, I thought that was about a one to $24 leverage rate. That's correct. That's okay. Yeah, okay. And, and what I think I was hearing earlier is that this would be closer to a one to three leverage. Okay. That's what we're hearing. The difference between the two, um, Councillor Stevenson, is the, um, the construction incentive grant that came out in 2021, those really were shovel-ready projects. And really the um, intent was to take those projects and have them happen sooner. So they were gonna happen, we just had no predictability as to when. So put the incentive in place and it was successful because they moved f forward faster than we predicted. So the pipeline, um, we made sure it happened sooner and so that's the results we're seeing today. Okay, gotcha. Then just really quickly, I, I I heard earlier, just trying to, to position the risk of devaluation. Um, so again, by my calculation, I thought it was very, very helpful in the presentation that a 10% drop in valuation across the board in downtown um, would equal a 0.8 increase on other non-residential properties. So a 50% devaluation would be you know, a 4% increase in other non-res properties. Is there a way to kind of translate this into like 
what type of devaluation or lack of growth in assessment value do we have in the low case? Like is the low case a 50% drop? Like is a 50% drop across the board in the downtown realistic? There's the low case and we also did a stress test. Oh, okay, great. That's correct. I'll take a minute here. No. Okay, thanks. I um, I can circle back if if we need a, a few more minutes. I'll go to Councillor Carp. I'm I'm lost. Is this third round? Is she uh, just to speak. But I don't know. Councillor Carp now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Actually, I'm so sorry. We're going to take a break instead. Uh, we're at 3.30, and we'll be back at 3.45. Thank you.
Happy Halloween. Mayor Sohi. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Hello. Online, Councillor Wright. Hello. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Principe. Hello. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Okay, we were on to questions of the motion um, or other questions as desired. Councillor Cartmel, you seem to be locked out, but if you're good to go. I think I'll be okay. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, let's see. So, I guess to Mr. Zabo, I, it, uh, maybe I won't be so specific. This mo if this motion passes, it'll come back with some sort of an analysis that says these are the trade-offs, these are the things that would have to be stopped or delayed if we're going to put so much money to it. Like there'd be some prioritization analysis done of what's already in the CRL, what's contemplated in the CRL. Is that, yeah? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and I, I'm also curious about the, um, affordable housing piece to this. I mean, there's been a fair bit of conversation, but I wonder about if, if there's a um, requirement that any sort of program includes a hip participation or, 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 or an a hip component to this that we're almost defeating the purpose. Like a, it, it seems to me that there's a revenue versus return question that's at the root of all of this. And if we start getting too far down the road of, of capping the revenue, capping the rent, that we don't speak to the return and we get, we kind of get ourselves back to where we are today. Uh, would you have the capacity to analyze that or at least through industry, analyze that th with industry, not through, with? Yeah, we could include an analysis of what the affordability requirements would do to the program and, and where that might influence it and how it might influence it. And I guess I'm also interested in, uh, I, I didn't ask another second round of questions, but just going back to the question I had that Mr. Zabo answered, I, would this include some analysis that says uh, right now we have a number of buildings that are sort of below the line and below the baseline, as we were talking about earlier in the CRL, of how much of an incentive would be required or what the prospects would be if, the val if there's a value lift uh, about how much then those buildings would contribute or could contribute, what the ultimate delta would be between the baseline and some presumed uh, new value. Yeah, I think any analysis would look at both the cost side to the CRL and it would have to look at the revenue side to the CRL, if that answers the question. I think so. Um, related question, uh, we had that uh, deferred tax incentive program. That program is complete. We're no longer doing that. The 2021 program? Yeah, it expired. We are yeah, no longer accepting applications and you had to be under construction by March 2022. I yeah, I think we extended the, yeah. the deadline to be under construction. Is there any contemplation of bringing that back without a motion? Oh, oh there may be a pending motion. Okay, I'm, okay, never mind. And I guess this is probably obvious, but if we have buildings that do get built but that do have a delay in their property tax that they, that they contribute, and if they're in within the CRL boundaries then that delays how uh, the time at which they start contributing to the CRL payback yes it effectively takes their gain out of the mix the math would work out that way the, the construct of how that would work we'd have to go back and look at but yes if you're forgiving the tax that you would uplift that you would generate by doing the thing you're sort of defeating the purpose of the CRL using the tax uplift to pay for it you're foregoing their contribution to the CRL so there's there, yeah. there might be some analysis there too about is there a you know what's the better benefit I guess okay so lots of numbers lots of math um, maybe it is to Ms. Kajenner just in the last uh, question when the AHIP program was sort of crafted did it contemplate suites like this like was it was it contemplating sort of the de uh, the, the quote-unquote pseudo downtown condo construct or was it sort of crafted around this idea of, of the unit within the four-story wood frame walk-up. 
Is there, or is it fair to characterize it all? I, I think that the program was designed to be agnostic, but there are limits and practical considerations that make it more um, attractive and, and workable, I think, in the less expensive construction cost models, right? So in areas of the city that have um, less expensive land and in, where you can use less expensive forms of construction. Yeah, it just seems more pertinent to that, that, that walk up suburban, semi-suburban mm -hmm. sort of a context. Yeah, we did have the 585 program, which was a descendant of C582, which looked to incentivize affordable housing units in DCs, which primarily were downtown, and we found that often we'd be over-subsidizing to get the level of rent to yeah, be affordable to the program fruit. requirements. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, Councillor Knack. Yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I, I thought Councillor Rutherford was... Uh, just, oh, she's, just she's, to speak. Thank yep. you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, only question I have, and so I think it's good to get the analysis here is, um, you know, I and appreciate we don't want to presuppose an outcome, but I, I guess I'll ask this, that if we do come back and have this conversation in the first quarter and there's a, a decision to advance, how quickly can that be mobilized from that report? Because I think there is... Uh, there has been a conversation, a bit of a, that sense of urgency around getting this done. Again, that's pending council's decision, pending the advice. But if you came back in March and said, here it is, and council said, yes, could you start implementing very quickly after? Councillor Knack, that'll somewhat depend on um, the design of the incentive program. So we'll make sure when we come back with that analysis um, in the first quarter in response to this motion that we include that time frame. So again, it's really clear that we're moving as quickly as possible and what that time horizon looks like. Okay, I, I guess I, I wanna just dig a, a little bit further then just to get a sense of, and, and again, I'm, I'm maybe un incorrectly presupposing an outcome, but but if, if this was advanced, I, I think there's, the worry is that if you, this couldn't start till, you know, if, if it came back in March and then it couldn't start for another three or four months, do you lose out on an entire, another construction season at a time where we're already facing some urgency and and so I guess I, I'm trying to get a sense of can't you, you know I appreciate you said this will depend on certain factors but would you have the ability to present us something to say hey if you're looking to go and you want to get it done in a month's time so that folks can take advantage of this of this construction season here's how you do it here's how we go or or is it does this essentially rule out any opportunity for, you know, advancing something in, in 2024 in a meaningful way? It's, it's hard for me to answer that, Councillor Nag, just because it will depend on the program design. I hear you, mm -hmm. though, in terms of not wanting to miss another construction season and the desire to go fast. So we'll make sure that that's included in our options so that, um, you know, if there is an ability for us to go quickly and meet all of the outcomes and provide the best option and not miss a construction season, that that's clear and you can make that decision. Yeah, and I, I you know, I've, I've heard some of the conversation both in the in the discussion today and and, and maybe this is something that, that gets fine-tuned over the next couple of months um, is what would, you know, if we're only talking five within the CRL, what would, they be looking for i've heard some say like if if they knew that there was for sure a commitment even if it's and there's an expectation it doesn't get paid out for a couple of years anyways um does essentially a motion by council saying yes this is good this is approved allow them to get the the necessary sign offs so that they could can move that so i i, I just would be curious about having that information as part of that report back so i appreciate you've you've had some dialogue with those folks already, but, but that would help make sure there's uh, just some more clarity for myself. Um, I think that'll be it then, I think. for uh, So this is, again, just clarifying, this is, it's not really first quarter, it's March. I mean, it's March's first quarter, but I just want to get clarity. Sometimes we, we've been putting quarters, but there's, this is definitely no earlier than March, correct? That's correct. It's to align with our um, update on the capital city. Well, actually, on all of our um, 
CRLs that comes forward in March to executive committee. So this pairs it with that valuable information as well as the new analysis of the, the data, um, that low, medium and high scenario. So it couples it together with work that's already underway. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jens. Thank you. Um, just to confirm to administration, like if this motion passes, does that mean I'm worried about the word prioritize? Like I, my, does that mean that it would be ranked above other natural recommendations? Like I'm guessing that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think what you're saying is, are we automatically sticking it at the top? Is Bingo. that the question? Yes. Yeah. So not automatically, no, we bring back the analysis and with some factors and then, you know, at council's discretion, they can prioritize um, in alignment with the information that we provided so that you can make a good and informed decision. Like, to be clear, we're here today in this conversation. This is driven by council motion, right? This is not administration's recommendation. The motion came from Mayor Sohi, yes. Uh, sorry, the, the motion that brought resident, the, um, the uh, residential incentive program was that so he or councillor knack no so the, the reason we're here today at all is is there's two motions there's the councillor knack was one of them and i think councillor stevenson was the other one one okay. on office conversions and one on uh, mixed market residential funded by the CRO. okay so this isn't being driven by like our affordable housing branch no and it's not being recommended by them we're, we're not making a recommendation today no and there's not a recommendation from the taxation branch that they're so concerned that they want us to see to see us undertake this program. No, administration is making no recommendation today. Okay, and administration stands by the report that if we were to undertake, you know, the investments, we could be looking at a 125 year payback, whether that investment comes from the CRL or from the tax levy, right? That's correct. If you use the IRR calculations, I would agree with what the developing community said when they were talking about the IRR. It is one data point in a vast sea of information that you need to make the decision. Yes. For sure. But when they talk about downtown vibrancy, I mean, that doesn't mean that people have to live in the office conversion. They could live in a, another apartment built somewhere else, right? Yes, they could. So as I see, we're trying to solve kind of four problems here, like the tax base, the issue of the landlord vacancy, the issue of downtown vibrancy, the issue of affordable housing. Is that, am I, are those those data points you're talking about? Those are all factors in the reports that have been brought today, um, which we're trying to solve is, is up to council and committee. Yeah, um, the, like my concern with the CRL would be that we have to pay for say the, the infrastructure somehow. So if we take CRL money and put it towards the, the office conversions, those are privately owned assets, but somebody still has to pay for the public infrastructure, right? That's correct. And we just won't have the CRL to do that, right? So we that just leaves tax space, right? Well, it depends on what comes back in March in terms of what's left in the CRL and how big the program is. So to say that we wouldn't be able to do it is premature. Right, but let's say we we're going to make like a an improvement that would catalyze new development for everybody or new new vibrancy for everybody. Um, if if we, the CRL is limited, and we spend it on these landlords, then we can't spend it on those other pieces, right? Yes, there's a finite amount of money, so you're correct. If we spend it on a large program, which we have not contemplated yet um, as part of this, then that reduces the amount of money in the CRL to fund other things, including some of that infrastructure work. Has, it, has an analysis been done if we looked at some city owned buildings in, uh, as well? Like if we were to do say the, you know, uh, Chancery Hall or something? Have we analyzed whether like, like if, we were to, if, the, if the goal is to get people downtown, if we were to look at putting people into city owned buildings rather than these privately owned buildings. So Chancery Hall, um, as you mentioned, is a building within the CRL. Uh, it could be done as a conversion, but currently that's, nobody has suggested that that would be a course of action we should take. Because if the goal is people downtown in a rapid way, shouldn't we put all options on the table? Yeah. 
Yeah, then yeah. I think the motion needs I, I I would I think the motion needs some amendments here to put more options on the table because I'm worried that this is really good for the way it's written. It's really good for the the bailout for the the buildings, but not necessarily for the public interest in general. So I I'm I would ask the mover to think about amendments maybe. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Tang? Um, just a quick question about the process. Would you, like in developing the analysis and kind of reprioritizing um, the options, you would do engagement? Uh, to develop the program, we would probably have to do some engagement, yes. Yeah. And engagement hopefully beyond the, in the industry groups who spoke today. Yeah, we would. We, so we haven't drawn it up yet, but we would draw up a list of people that we thought we need to engage with and engage with them on the design of the program. Also on the implications for what CRL prioritization might do to projects that we've somewhat committed to already, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I for one, for example, would be really interested to hear from, you know, downtown residents how they, fe how they feel about that as well. Um, you know, there is a major trade-off here in terms of density downtown and um, public realm amenities, right? Um, and then I just want to make sure I understood what you said earlier, Elisa, about provincial approval if there is no new addition. But if you put this at the top, like let's assume, wouldn't that be a new addition? I'm actually going to ask Cameron to weigh in on this because okay. he's got some some legal... Um, okay, well, if, if, if we need to go into private, I'll, I'll just withdraw that question. Um, but I, I think I think you, I just want to clarify something that you said. But all good. Um, that's that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Um, I just had a few last questions. So right now we're looking exclusively at the CRL as a funding source, and one of the challenges there that I think two of the the candidate buildings, so the Phillips McKinnon building and the Empire building, fall without outside the CRL boundaries. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So would we, maybe that's just a consideration when that report comes back. Um, so yeah, there would be no other funding source other than tax levy. Or would we have some analysis on that potentially? Um, so as the motion is drafted here, we're looking at community, the CRL to fund. Okay. If you're funding something outside of the CRL, it cannot come from the CRL. So tax levy would be the most likely source, yes. Okay. And would it be possible to just have, you know, what, what, what the amount would be for those buildings, potentially? We can talk to those developers and try to get a sense of what that would cost, yes. Okay, but again, the, the, there's not, CRL is not a viable funding source for those. Um, just to, to our uh, taxation and assessment colleagues, so, you know, I heard that we don't really have a clear picture of, of what's happening uh, you know, a fully clear picture of what's happening in the market and that those would sort of be finalized in the new year. Will we have that information in terms of the actual assessed values of downtown office or non, non-residential when we have this report back? I'm yeah, by then we'll have the assessments. In, in January, the assessment notices will go out, so we'll know um, shortly within the next month or so really what the assessments are. Perfect, perfect. So that can be included as part of this report? Excellent. And that can just help us gauge where, where we're at, what the impacts are, how, how much we need to address. Okay, just maybe to the mover, just want to clarify your intent around, um, by your motion, it looks like we'd be looking at both um, conversion and new build. Is that, is that your intent? Uh, I am open to both because I think if there's a way to explore extension of the uh, very successful downtown construction grant that was started in 2021, if there are ways to, uh, you know, extend that or recreate it and mm -hmm. along with the, uh, the CRL options, I think uh, the goal is to have more people live downtown, right? Yes, so why, yeah. why limit your options? Well, and I also is wanting to consider Jens, you know, if uh, in, in my mind, if they're down uh, city city owned buildings, publicly owned buildings that can be converted to residential, why would we exclude that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and maybe just to administration. So to that point, I know that um, in terms of the tax deferral, 
Would you see that as being separate from this motion? Would we need a, a, an additional, like a subsequent motion to look specifically at the tax deferral? Which I, from my understanding, primarily works for new build, not so well for conversion. Well, I would say particularly if you wanted to extend beyond the boundaries of the CRL, yeah. then I would do it as a separate motion. Okay, okay, well, I'll, I'll cue that up, I think. Um, and then would you offer in this analysis any distinction between conversion and new build? Yeah, we could. We would look at, so as we attempted to do with this report and in this motion, open-ended residential incentive program allows us to bring back both options. Okay. Great, those are all my questions. Mayor Sohi. Just two quick questions. One is when you do, when you undertake the analysis once, if this motion is passed, uh, you will do uh, updated numbers around possible deficit on the CRL or surplus on the CRL, right? Yeah, it would come at the same time. So okay. same, Yeah. two reports at the same yeah. time. And another one, and this is it, regarding the, uh, uh, the downtown economic construction grants that will create uh, 2,341 units. Uh, do we know if Calgary, I know with their conversion program, they will reach the same number of units with $150 million investment. Are they doing more? Are they creating other incentive grants to create more residential in the downtown? Is that the only program they have? Uh, I'm not aware of any, but their program is under review. I would also say that Calgary's program was only conversions. So yeah. like what we did with the economic Incentive so, grant was so, new builds. So, so we're yeah. already creating the same number of units under a different program that we have, very successful program. If we are able to figure more, we will probably be creating more units than uh, what we're currently creating. I think I just want to, again, I tried at the start of the, the program, I, uh, questions, I just want to bust this myth and perception that Calgary is doing more to create residential downtown compared to us, I think the numbers are the same, probably we're doing more on, in other investments. Not for you to comment, but I think it's, it's important repeating, because uh, sometimes perceptions need to do a, uh, uh, you know, reality becomes sometimes, uh, yeah. okay. uh, that's it. Thank you. Well, I don't see anyone else on the board for questions, so we're at the point where we would look uh, for folks to sign up to speak. Uh, Councillor Rutherford's been waiting very patiently, so happy to go to you first, and we'll, we'll look for others to, uh, to click on. Yeah, so <laughs> I think I've been pretty transparent. I, I can't support this today. Um, because I, I feel like it is going to create a lot of work for administration and it's a lot of we you know we've had many talks about how we need to be more diligent in terms of creating work especially in the, the constraints that we have uh, we, you know the report clearly highlighted that unless we're willing to give that 75 to 100 square foot amount that it's not really going to incent um, so we don't have that even at most we you know in the questions i asked even at most we have maybe half of that so i also want to talk about what we could lose and i get that this is just a report but these these reports they set up expectations and they set up uncertainty for community hmm. right and so like it's not just a report sometimes and so yes there's times when you know and i i heed my my council colleagues that are often you know saying like the better, the more information we have to make a decision, the better. And I, I agree. And then there's also the question of at what point do you have enough information to create certainty one way or the other with community? And that's where I am today. Uh, because I, I, we just don't have funds to give the incentive program what it's worth for actually creating incentives. I'm not interested in you know, incentivizing affordable housing, non-market downtown at a cost per door that's greater than what we can get for affordable housing outside of the core. And um, I'm not interested in stopping any of the current projects that are under the community revitalization levy that many Edmontonians and residents that have contributed to this fund have 
uh, come to expect because they've, they've been discussed for, for a while now. Um, public dollars should go to public infrastructure. And there is a role to play in partnership with private industry. But this kind of incentive program is not the role that I think we can play in this fiscal environment that we're in. You know, the report clearly highlighted as well that, you know, if rents go up, that all of a sudden it becomes fi financially viable for them. So again, we have to ask ourselves, and I, I remember, you know, we've had so many conversations about many things, and the question is, what business should the city ought be in the business of doing? And I, I can't look at these kind of incentivization programs as the business that we ought to be in the business of doing. So I, I didn't entertain, I didn't want to entertain it when it first came up. As <laughs> I don't think I supported either Councillor Stevenson or Councillor Nack's original motions. I definitely don't support this today. I think it's creating more uncertainty with community. Um, I think it's setting up expectations that we don't have the ability to actually achieve with the funding that is even available within this pool. Uh, and I think it's gonna create more challenges in the next four year budget cycle if we do stop projects here that will eventually still need to be done. So for those reasons, I'm just not willing to entertain this conversation any further and have administration do, to do that work uh, to just again say no when this comes back in, in the first quarter. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Okay, Councillor Jans. I'm not on committee, I just wanna to speak to it though. Oh yeah, you, you are next. No other okay. committee members. Yeah, I want to begin by just, um, you know, thanking uh, both the mayor and Councillor Stevenson, who have been steadfast and tireless advocates for our downtown, and I know have been wrongly, uh, in many cases, blamed for the state of our downtown for problems that far pre-existed, uh, both of them, and that they inherited um, between the 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 real retail crash, the Amazon cannibalizing uh, what's left of uh, most of our local business and 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 retail, and then also. Uh, Looking at uh, looking at the post pandemic problems, the opioid crisis, everything else, I, I commend the, the the mayor and councillor Stevenson for for their work in in trying to revitalize downtown. Um, uh, however, on this on this motion, I I think that we're heading in the wrong direction. I think it's critical that we focus that if our goal is doorway bonusing, that we do it in the fastest, cheapest um, way possible. And this is this is not it. This is. This is building your house on the sandy land, not on the rock. Um, if uh, our goal is downtown vibrancy, um, if our goal is um, more units, when I hear from our affordable housing branch that this is not their recommendation and that if they had $100 million at 61,000 a door, they could open close to 1,700 units, units that we would own, that we would operate, that we could, um, you know, rent out at deep affordability at zero or at at below market and do even more when i think about the opportunities that we could do with home ed for a hundred million dollars when i think about so many other tools we have at our disposal whether it's um looking at the vacant parking lots whether it's looking at chancery hall the uh this is not it and when i look at the crl it's important to remember that yeah it's it's not tax levy but it it's still one it's still one tax dollar and dollars spent um in the CRL are have an opportunity cost. If those dollars go towards uh, retrofitting a super expensive boutique filet mignon um, uh, project, that's those are dollars that are not available to go towards drainage, sidewalks, other public infrastructure that could enable and catalyze and, and support even more investment. Um, I think this is a really, really good deal if you are a landlord, if you own these buildings, if this is helping bail you out. It is not a good deal for the taxpayer. And uh, I think there's a reason that our assessment and taxation folks are not recommending this. And, and going back a little further, it's worth noting that assessment and taxation did recommend against the downtown construction grants in the first place. They were worried that there was no guarantee that these projects would have happened anyway without the public investment. Um, they and, and there was no, uh, you know, there's a reason that we're cautioned over and over again to stop interfering in the market. 
We are there to provide the train tracks, to provide the roads, to provide the sewers, and then let the market decide what's viable or not. And with the free market sometimes comes uh, consequences and that may be vacancy. And if the landlords want to lower their rents and um, do some, you know, do some creative things. Yes, it may hurt their valuations or hurt their equity or hurt their, you know, but they, things have been really, really good for a number of years. Um, and uh, yes, we're in a, a bad snap now, but, um, you know, with patience and times, things could get really good again. And after all, finally, I want to say low rents downtown and commercial spaces are part of our competitive advantage. I know I've heard from a number of folks who have chosen to rent downtown or move their business downtown or look at moving downtown because, um, the rents are more affordable for them. So uh, what do you say? It's a buyer's market. It's a, a renter's market. And uh, um, that can be good. So I even if you say, well, well, yes, Jans, but what about the collapse of our tax base? Well, admins run the math and it's still cheaper than us bailing out um, the residential buildings and then waiting for 125 year payback. So I think we need to be really focused on affordable housing, on densification, and to do so in the fastest, cheapest, best way. And this is not it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Tang. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I you know I'm cognizant there there are a few other subsequent motions coming, so I'll just speak once and hopefully not uh, and be brief. So thank you everyone for coming out and sharing your expertise. I learned a lot and I really appreciate the fruitful discussion we had. Uh, I am going to support this motion. I think this promo this motion provides us with a reasonable and practical middle ground. Um, th this was a very, uh, you know, difficult one. I feel like I knew where I stood one day and then there's always more information and perspectives. Um, and I think there's a lot of valid points made um, by all speakers. Um, you know, it's, I know I don't want to pursue bailouts for private businesses and building owners who have seen the, in the values of their buildings decline rapidly. There's also the opportunity cost we heard of this motion if we are to re-examine the CRL priority and shifting funds away from public realm projects that have their, their own merits and benefits. Um, however, we are in major times of uncertainty facing a number of crises, including one of housing um, and pandemic recovery. Uh, you know, on the housing front, we've heard loud and clear through several forums that greater housing stock is needed. And I think in times like this, I think it's, I think it's fair to constantly reevaluate our options and priorities and weigh the trade-offs. Um, we've also heard time and time again, whether it's pre-pandemic or now, that we want to see more vi vibrancy in our downtown. And I can recognize how having more people living in our core can help to support this along with public safety. And so, you know, watching what's unfolding in other cities and countries around the world, it's undeniable that there is this movement around office conversion that is growing. Um, when it comes to what is the most appropriate role for the local government, I don't rule out incentives. Um, we've done incentives like the economic incentive grants that supported a number of construction downtown. What is the right incentive though? And I think that's the conversation that I hope this motion would generate. Um, and again, I do believe that this is a practical middle ground. Um, you know, just to maybe allude to some of the other motions, the subsequent that might come, you know, we, we can't do this alone. Just like many issues, we can't, the city cannot alone solve some of the crisis that we're seeing with silver bullet solutions. Uh, we need support from all levels of government, from our provincial and federal partners, and for those who spoke to that piece earlier today about leveraging industry and the business community, um, we, we hope to hold you to that and work with us to in, in, in that advocacy together. And I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang, Councillor Cartmel. Great, thank you. So, um, just, just uh, maybe uh, feeding off some of the comments that have already been made, you know, there's, uh, commentary offered that this is not the place for this incentivization. And I want to I want to go back to the underpinnings of the CRL. And th this was a decision made 10 years ago that said, we need to find a way to activate our downtown. The arena project was going to activate our downtown. The way in which to fund that was to borrow now, then against future tax uplift. So effectively take revenue that we expect to realize later and invest it now over a payback period. Not taking current dollars and granting it, not taking current dollars and gifting it, 
taking tomorrow's dollars and investing it today. That is the fundamental theory behind the CRL. And additive to that is the fact that the uh, provincial education component to property tax stays with the city. It does not go to the province. That's the advantage of the CRL period, writ large. And you might not agree that that was the, uh, you know, a, a philosophically valid thing to do, or you might not agree that that is the place for, uh, you know, the public or public dollars to get involved in the private sector. But that ship sailed. That choice was made 10 years ago. And we have seen the benefits in our downtown writ large. Uh, and, it, and they go beyond the financial. It's not just the $2 billion of buildings that came after the arena and after that incentive. It is all of the activation we have seen in the in-between time. It is all of that celebration that happens when there's an interesting things that happen in that public square. It is all of the uh, spin-off value to all of the commercial establishments that at least on game nights get to benefit from that activity. So to build on that notion, or at least exploring on building on that notion, I don't think that is out of place in the CRL. Again, we're not taking, we're not talking about raising taxes next year to pay for this. We're talking about taking the potential lift, and we've already seen significant lift in the CRL calculations, and taking what we know we're going to get and investing it today to try to, to effectively enhance the realm, to, to uh, see what we want to see in terms of activation, in terms of dormant buildings becoming active buildings, in terms of uh, potentially seeing a right sizing of our office space. So uh, maybe we wouldn't have decided to do, to start a CRL today on this basis, but we've got one and we have the opportunity to maybe leverage it. The other thing I find interesting is the conversation around free market consequences and, you know, let the market reign and where the chips fall, the chips fall. I remember a conversation roughly a month ago where the opposite argument was being made, that we ought not let the free market reign, that we ought limit development at, in certain parts of the city, that we ought not let commercial development happen because we don't want to see development there, we want to see it here. We want to see the existing uh, family of fixed assets leveraged to their maximum. We want to see infill. We want to see activity. We've even, we've even talked about loosening up some of the stuff at Blackford to see if we might not be able to get a bit more activity, a little bit faster, and a little bit more affordable. I've often said that when we talk about disallowing, it's like pushing on a rope. You push on a rope, you don't know where that rope is going to go. But you pull on the rope and you know exactly where that rope is going to go. So if we want to pull people to downtown, if we want to pull people to infill, if we want to pull activity and activation in the core, which is the place by which we are judged when people come to talk about investing in our community, then we need to start pulling on a rope. This is not a rope that's going to cost taxpayers tomorrow. This is a rope that takes the benefit of the investment today and results in revenue tomorrow, accelerated revenue, depending on the, what we get back. Final thought on assessments. We've talked about how it's 1% of a shift to other non-residential properties. 1% on this, 1% on that. But let's talk about non-residential properties who are also gonna see, if nothing changes, a 7.09% property tax increase and another property tax increase if their values go up and suburban values are going up, and now another 1% because we're going to be shifting the responsibility for the non-residential tax burden to the commercials. It's not a just under 1% hit that they're going to feel. It's going to be an accumulation of a number of hits that they're going to feel, and we've got to be careful about that. A lot of those people are small business owners, and they can't afford it any more than some of the people that own homes that are close to the tips, too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, I want to just add to some of what I've heard today, and, and, and I appreciate a conversation if this is approved. There is uh, a trade off conversation that we can have. But I also want to remind people about one of the answers we heard today, and, and I'm not suggesting we should do this, but there is the potential that if Council wanted, based off the current position, of the CRL and the different projections, 
we could actually tap into the high projection. Now that might not be the right approach. That might, there might be a lot of reasons why we won't want to do that. But there was 121 million identified in that, that if things went well, that money could be used for other projects as well. So I, I would hate to close off a conversation now um, without understanding what the latest is in March. What if March comes around and we're in a better position and we have additional money? What if March comes around and we're in a worse position? Well, then that maybe helps answer the question. But to sort of presuppose that feels really odd, especially based off the feedback we've heard from those that you know are operating in the core. I mean, again, I, and I think it's worth when this comes back, I'd be very interested, as others have said, um, hearing from the Downtown Edmonton Community League and not just from the business community. But I, I think we should have that conversation because I, I, as much as there have been some great investments and think there are, there are times where things are going well, there are also things that we're still struggling with. The fact is that there was that report, I think just a few weeks ago that showed there, the retail space in the downtown core is at a vacancy rate of 33%. Why? Well, because fewer people come in downtown on an, on an everyday basis now, and we still don't have a lot of people living downtown. And even though when I'm regularly downtown, I don't feel unsafe. I don't feel like I, I think things are getting better and better. Um, I think I still hear a lot from folks who say, oh, I'm not going downtown. And one of the best ways to address that is by getting more people living there. Is office tower conversion the right way to do it? I don't know. Uh, maybe there's a better way to get more people living downtown, but we, we do absolutely need to work on that. Things are not perfect by any stretch at this point. And there are other cities that are looking at different ways to try to help address what are very real issues in downtown cores across North America. So I, I, I'm struggling with the notion that we would say no to this now without having that additional analysis without having the understanding of what the residents in the downtown feel. Uh, you know, I, I, I would be interested in the ward councillor's perspective, who will be speaking very soon. Um, but I think if, if there is at least a desire to look into this further, to at least get the information, to get a, an updated financial projection of how the CRL is doing, I don't see how that creates any harm or any uncertainty. Um, there, it, it's fair to have that conversation around trade-offs. We should, um, but there might also be a situation where we could be in reasonable shape. Over the history of the CRL, there have been times where we have been uh, projected to be very, very high, and we were performing even above the highest scenario uh, that had been presented over the years. And yes, we're in a different time. And so chances are we'll never quite be that that optimistic and that rosy and 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 we'll reach that same level. Uh, but I I just feel like I'm a little worried about what we're trying to do right now to get more people into the downtown core, which helps with safety, which helps with vibrancy, which helps with support businesses. The same thing we just did in approving the zoning bylaw especially for mature neighborhoods, to try to get more people living in those spaces to allow those places to be more vibrant. And, and so that's why I would hope at a minimum we could support this exploration of information um, so that we have all of the data and have a better updated financial projection to see if that's the case. The last thing I'd offer is hearing that we were originally talking upwards of 10, if only five of them are within the CRL boundaries, that also changes the economics of this conversation from an $100 million conversation, which was asked to you know, 50 million if you went at $100 per square foot. And there's no requirement that we do that. So even that presents a different consideration for us that I think we should explore when this comes back. So uh, I, I would hope this can be supported so there can be a, a further conversation on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Paquette? Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So it's a really fascinating conversation. And um, I guess it, it just raises a lot of questions for me. And that's why I, I would hope that a committee asks for this information so we can get those questions answered, not 
just for this one instance, but to inform um, approaches overall going forward. Um, we did have that, uh, you know, the incentive program uh, earlier, and we saw a lot of people subscribe to that until it was uh, fully subscribed. But the question that I, has always remained with me, and I think a lot of people have had the question, is did it actually incent builds? Or were those investments going to happen anyway? And you can't prove a negative. So the next best step is to do a bit of a jurisdictional scan and take a look at other cities. Who has done an incentive program that's similar? Who has not? And what has been the rate of investment uh, in their downtowns from uh, private industry? Those are good questions. And I don't have the answer to those. Uh, we don't. Council does not have the answer to those. And I'm not sure if administration does. We should get those answers in order to inform uh, how we do things. I mean, otherwise, all of the other uh, questions we're asking are sort of like trying to debate how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. Um, you know, less tax collected from downtown means more taxes on the suburbs. You know, um, downtown vibrancy concentrated service delivery for less dollars, you know, all of those different questions are good questions, but become moot if we can't answer the main question, which is, do these incentives actually work? That would be the main question. And if we don't know that, then we can't make a decision. So that's why I want the information. Um, the, the next, uh, Next thing that we might want to think about here, though, is that um, there are different ways. If it looks like it's a good idea, and again, we don't know if it does or not, there are different ways to calculate how a city gets made whole from its investments. And um, is an incentive an investment? Again, that's one of those questions that has to be answered. But one thing that does occur to me is if there aren't people in the downtown to enjoy the public amenities, then that presents a problem in itself. Again, as, as uh, Councillor Knack referenced, um, we, uh, we have a, a, a massive vacancy problem. More people downtown, shopping, spending money, maybe living there, probably helps with those vacancy issues, but it's complicated. Those, that's not the only calculus. There are multiple things to look at. So when we start, I guess, uh, to, to borrow the phrase from Councillor Carmel, when we start pulling on that rope, we've got to ensure that we're not pulling so much rope that we kind of hang ourselves in, uh, in this lack of information in order to inform ourselves. Um, and we don't want to commit to an action either way, on either side of the debate, without, um, without that necessary and very important look into the investment. Because frankly, if, if it is a good idea, we invest at max $100 million and we get back a three to one return in local economy, that's worthwhile. If we don't, we should know that too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate today's conversation and uh, everyone's commitment to enhancing our downtown. Um, but I did uh, just briefly want to uh, speak actually against this motion. Um, you know, having weighed the arguments in favor uh, against our constrained fiscal position uh, of the CRLs outside of the downtown CRL, I'm really concerned about our ability to deliver other transformational projects in our downtown uh, if we start to head down this path. Administration provided the advice that there are only a handful of buildings which could be eligible for conversion. Uh, and frankly, I, I'm not sure that that is um, what I would consider a transformational proposal. Uh, it's possible that it helps incrementally, absolutely. Um, but I still do not see clear evidence that this is where we should be focusing our limited resources and energy. Um, you know, I think about uh, it's just been a few weeks since we last spoke about uh, the 240 unpermitted parking lots in downtown and we heard resoundingly at that time that the residential demand is not there to absorb significant new amounts of rental product. Um, 
but simultaneously uh, we're hearing that there is substantial demand for residential through office conversions. Um, so that, I guess, contradictory uh, stance is um, a little confusing to me and uh, it, it concerns me. I've also heard loud and clear that there is seemingly little interest in um, you know, any proposal where the city would be taking an equity position, uh, it doesn't sound like that's really an acceptable uh, path forward. Uh, so that's that's also a bit of a flag for me. Um, and then another another concern for me is what this will mean for the prioritization of other CRL projects that are expected to contribute to public infrastructure in the core. Uh, and then finally, I do come back to the question that I've just been continually asking myself. Uh, and again, that is to what extent is this a market problem whose burden falls on the private sector? And to what extent um, does this represent a market failure and policy problem for, for government to step in and respond to? Um, and, you know, I think I've, I've arrived at a an interesting place. I, I don't think that a handful of residential buildings in downtown will resolve the, the decline of commercial values or even deliver that significant an effect. Um, and I really question Again, whether that's a responsibility of the taxpayer to subsidize this effort, uh, is there a role for public investment to cat or um, yeah for public investment to catalyze uh, investment in our downtown? Yes, but what is being requested here is simply beyond our financial reach, and um, I would question whether it's within our responsibility as a municipality. Uh, and I would just underscore, I know this has been mentioned a few times, but this council has taken significant steps and invested incredible sums into our downtown recovery. Uh, and from what I've seen, this council is deeply committed to continuing that work. Um, but actions do have to have to make sense and they have to be rooted in sound fiscal management. Um, so I just, uh, again, have, have a number of outstanding concerns with this path forward. So um, not on committee, but uh, I, I would not be able to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Um, I, I will take a moment to, to speak to this as well. Really appreciate all the discussion and all the points raised by my colleagues, by our speakers. Um, you know, I have not heard any argument on the importance um, and merit of having more residential downtown. I think it's, it's absolutely clear that that um, benefits all of us. Um, in, in many different ways in terms of achieving our objectives, uh, strategic objectives. I've been really reflecting on the point about how we measure return on public investment. Um, and it's true that we often invest in things as a city that have intangible returns. Um, but for me, the key is that uh, while they are intangible, uh, they are amenities that are publicly ac accessible. Um, and so when I think about looking at making investments in private property, I think it is important that we take that, that look at the direct returns on public investment or uh, the clear intangible benefits to the public good. For example, um, providing affordable housing in, in our downtown in the broadest way, whether that's market attainable or, or non-market housing. So these are, these are the things that I'm going to be looking at when, when the report comes back. Again, I do support this motion. I think it's important to have the information. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on different, different points in the CRL. So I reflect on the fact that the CRL was designed to provide incentives. That was part of the way it was set up. That was part of what it was intended to do. I think having a report where we can look at the trade-offs will be incredibly important. Um, you know, many of the projects that are remaining in the CRL are core infrastructure. They're not um, sort of nice to haves, they're, they're must haves in terms of um, street renewal, street repair. Um, so I think that we'll, we'll need to take a very close look at, at how that plays out. Um, recognizing a lot of the commentary about some of our limited financial means, I do think it's also important that we look at other levers. Um, so I do have some subsequent motions, um, you know, looking at, again, those small other changes that we can make, that we are able to make, that come at no cost to us, um, to see if we can help move that needle further. But I will leave that to subsequent and go now to Mayor Sohi to close. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to, oh, by the way, Councilor Jans, thank you so much for your kindness uh, and your comments. Uh, uh, this council has been deeply committed to downtown. You know, from time to time, may, we may disagree on certain approaches, but I just want to say that even council members may not be able to support this. Their commitment to downtown is unwavering. 
we need to recognize that. And uh, so a lot of good points have been made. So what I want to do uh, in my time is actually highlight what those investments have been. $630 million, $613 million into Rogers Place and associated infrastructure. $36 million for downtown storm water drainage servicing for 105 Street Trunk. $29 million to green and walkable downtown. $39 million for Jasper Place New Vision from 97 to 100 Street. $16 million in Centennial Plaza Rehabilitation. Another $4.8 million in stormwater drainage service for 104 Street. $31 million for 103rd A Avenue Pedway. $82 million for Warehouse Park. $17.8 million for station lands publicly accessible amenity spaces. $17 million for, uh, uh, no, for uh, walkable and green spaces again for the downtown. $53 million for further planning of, uh, you know, Beaver Hill, Michael Fair Park, Harbin Gate, green and walkable communities. Uh, City Hall Plaza, another $25 million. Stanley and Milner Library, $84 million. Downtown Bike Network for $1 million. 100th Street Funicular, $25 million. Edmonton Convention Center, Newell, $48 million. District Energy Downtown, $35 million. Um, in the Columbia Avenue, 105, 109, 216th Street, $18 million. And then, uh, you know, Iron Work Building, $26 million. Imagine Jasper, $34 million. Downtown Vibrancy Strategy, $32 million. Edmonton Economic Incentive Construction Grant, $22.9 million. Winspear Center, $13 million. All in total, comes to $1.4 billion of investment. Out of that, $351 million were partner funding. So big chunk of money has come from this council and previous council's decisions to show our commitment to downtown. I think it's very important that we continue to highlight that. And that does not even include the work that we have been doing with the Downtown Business Association, DRC, and others to uh, improve safety in the downtown. You know, you have watching the news, uh, we gonna, our administration's proposing additional 2.3% uh, uh, tax levy increase on top of 5% uh, that we approved last year. And two third of that additional 2.3% is going to our policing and safety, including downtown and the city. So our commitment is there. So we need to do more. And I recognize that. That is why exploring this is an Im important aspect. More we can do to encourage people to live downtown is the, uh, is the best thing. Will I support this when it comes to uh, uh, discussion? I don't know yet, because I, I don't have all the information. I think having that information and understanding the impact of prioritization uh, uh, and what, well, how will that impact some of the projects is important, or the deficit and surplus in the, in the, uh, uh, in the CRL. But it's also important, I think, our partners need to step up. All these investments that we are making have generated hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue for other, other orders of government. And we don't see that it, uh, investment back. I'm very glad that our provincial government is stepping up now more than uh, they ever did, and our federal government has been supporting us in many, many ways, but I think we need to have those conversations because these are shared responsibilities and we need to work together and figure out a better way. I hope that uh, the subsequent will allow to have the, some of those discussions. Closing, really want to thank everyone who participated in this discussion. Thank you so much for your leadership and, uh, uh, and we will continue to explore ways to uh, work together with you and the rest of the community. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Sohi, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Uh, Mayor Sohi, I believe you have a subsequent motion. Okay, uh, it is that Urban Planning Committee recommend to City Council 
their mayor on behalf of city council advocate to other orders of government for funding downtown towards public infrastructure projects and the residential and center programs such as new purpose built rentals office conversions and other related developments quickly to introduce i think this isn't an idea i think anand, anand made this idea about looking at opportunity of uh, you know are there we can we have conversations with the province where they can come in fund some of the, some of the public infrastructure that may free up some of the resources in this url right and uh, allow us to uh, to use that for uh, for for this work so that conversation this motion if passes allow uh, me to have those conversations with uh, with the provincial government it also offers opportunities for us to actually engage with the federal government on on their goal of creating more housing as well as possibly maybe prob probably having conversation with the canada infrastructure bank about some of the programs they have available for some of the uh, uh, conversion um, uh, efforts because their funding is a, i think tied to uh, retrofits uh, that will help reduce emissions in some of the uh, the old building so there might be some alignment uh, in 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 that i think they will allow us to have those conversations thank you mayor sohi council rutherford yeah i guess is there anybody that could i could ask from intergov a question probably not hey we don't have anyone for intergov online okay then i don't have any questions if there's nobody from intergov Okay, not seeing anyone else on there and recognizing our time, I will, okay. I, I recognize our time, but this is important. We've spent all day talking about this. I, again, uh, feel the need to speak to this one because I'm going to be a no on this one as well. We have an intergov advocacy strategy that we have worked with an external consultant to come up with our strategic priorities and I don't want to usurp that process. I know that downtown is an advocacy piece, but I have, I take problem with the specific call outs for the purpose built rentals, office conversions and related developments. Um, I don't recall that being in our strategic um, advocacy piece. Um, yeah, for intergovernmental relations. So for that reason, that's why I'm not supporting today. Yeah, no, thanks very much. Uh, I'll just speak briefly as well. I, you know, I take that point. We want to be consistent in what we're asking for from other orders of government. I think that what I've heard is that these are calls that are coming from many, many different municipalities across the province and across the country. Um, so I think that if there's a broader movement, there, there's an opportunity um, for us to, to amplify that. Um, I think, I think this is a This is a huge part of our downtown advocacy. Um, this is a more specific tool than maybe we've spoken about previously with downtown advocacy, but I think it very much falls under that umbrella, which is uh, why I don't necessarily see that same um, that same conflict or um, diversion from from our core um, advocacy objectives. Thank you. Mayor Sohi to close. Oh no, then nothing more to say. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Um, I have two additional subsequent motions that I'd like to put forward. Uh, one is that administration provide a report outlining options and impacts for a program that freezes property taxes for a defined time frame for new residential construction or office conversions in downtown Edmonton. Very briefly to introduce, um, you know, I think we really saw the success of the program when we offered this uh, previously. I recognize things have changed, that this isn't necessarily all that um, industry wants or needs to see. Um, but I do think the logic of it is, is very, very clear. We're not taking away um, from from anything. Um, we're sort of 
deferring our benefit from the tax uplift that comes with this type of investment. Um, I, I know that this says office conversions. Um, my understanding is that this is likely more appropriate for new residential construction. Um, and again, I think that, that works really well in terms of um, creating that investment, creating the tax uplift, delaying our ability to tap into that for a few years. But, in the, but at the end of that time, having, having the homes and having the uh, tax returns that we would see on that. Happy to take questions. I think we've covered a lot of the ground. Councillor Rutherford? Great. Not seeing anyone else, uh, we'll go to you. Yeah, again, I, I appreciate all we're doing, and I want to be clear that, you know, I think Mayor Sohi for saying it. Just because I'm saying no to these things doesn't mean I don't care deeply about the downtown. Um, but even in what we heard from, the, from, from folks today that came and spoke, they said they needed they, the policy levers and the tax levers don't help them get to those goals. So I'm not really understanding the full purpose of this and a freeze of certain property. Like we have talked so much about how if we start to play with tax tools and we start to shift shift funds or freeze funds here, we still have to collect X amount of money per year to pay our to pay our to turn our lights on and staff our city. And so that money has to come from somewhere. So again, I'm not, I'm feeling like a really negative person <laughs> today with all my no's and I apologize, but for those reasons and, and the same reasons I've mentioned in, in some of my other stuff, I, I will also be a no on this one. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, I have nothing further to add, so I will call the vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. And the very last one, um, the administration provide, oh, I apologize. The administration, through a memo, provide permitting options to incentivize office tower conversions, including providing applicant support, examining opportunities for no development permit required, and prioritizing building permit review. Very briefly to introduce this one, again, trying to look at all of the levers that we have to remove barriers and encourage the type of residential investment that we want to be seeing in our downtown. Um, this is, uh, from what I understand, a, a fairly cost neutral approach that we could take um, and is just a small way that again, I know isn't getting us all the way, but uh, helps to take those steps to, to support investment in our downtown. Happy to take questions as always. Seeing none, anyone to speak, let's vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried, thank you. Um, with that, we are at five to five, so we unfortunately will not have time for the other two items on our agenda, so apologies to the delegations that were here all day th with us throughout these conversations. Uh, Clerk Martin, I believe these will just automatically roll over to the next Urban Planning Committee meeting, or do you require any motions? No, they can be laid over to the next meeting. Okay. Uh, any notices of motion or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, I guess we're getting out five minutes early. Thank you all to everyone uh, for being here today.